preface and foreword of garibaldi and the making of italy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kirk ziegler ogden utah voiceovers by kirk.com garibaldi and the making of italy by george macaulay trevlin preface a previous volume entitled garibaldi and the thousand described the landing at marsala and the capture of palermo by that handful of men in may eighteen sixty the present volume traces the course of larger military diplomatic and political events by which the original achievement of the thousand led in six months to the formation of the italian kingdom i have once more endeavored in footnotes and appendices connected with a full bibliography to indicate to the curious my authority for any statement made in the text but in this as in previous volumes considerations of time and space have made it impossible to explain the nature limit and degree of value to be attached in each case to each of the authorities cited in a given note and if any student ever has enough enthusiasm to visit various public and private libraries and so verify all the references which i have given for any one important event for example the battle of milazzo or garibaldi's entry into naples he will find that the authorities which i have cited contradict each other on minor points volumes would be required to explain in every case why i have preferred one authority on one small point and another on another in a few important cases i have given my reasons for preferring one authority over another such as appendix g but more often i have merely given a list of the authorities the collation of which has led me to the conclusions recorded in the text as regards the estimates of the number of troops engaged or losses suffered in a campaign or battle they are based on reports or calculations made by officers in command of the troops enumerated never on the impressions of the opposite side which are always worthless as evidence except indeed in the case of the capture of prisoners for it is impossible to count the enemy's forces when you have captured them though not before i have used the neapolitan military sources particularly the documents printed in franchi for the volturno campaign more than has hitherto been customary with historians in the light of the reports by von mechel ruiz and the swiss officers material modification is necessary in the accounts usually given of the operations round madaloni and castel marone on october first otherwise the commonly received story of the campaign of eighteen sixty appears to me to stand the test of careful scrutiny it has been a particular pleasure to me to unfold for the first time the most intimate workings of british diplomacy at the decisive crisis of the italian question i have been able to do this partly owing to the kindness of the foreign office in opening to me the papers in the record office and the consular papers in italy and still more owing to the kindness of lady agatha and mr rollo russell in placing the private papers of their father lord john at my disposal the letters from which selections are printed in appendix a show us the very pulse of the machine which is not always visible in official dispatches and it is particularly gratifying to have been able to establish beyond all question at the mouth of two or three witnesses the most sensational details of the story told hitherto on la Caeta's authority alone of his strange commission from cavour to speak to lord john russell on the subject of garibaldi's passage of the straits again as in the case of the former volumes any success of mine in collecting material has been very largely due to the kindness and activity of scores of people in england and in italy on whom i had in the first instance no claim except as a would-be historian of garibaldi though many of them are now my friends in italy my original debt to mr nelson gay and his resurgimental library has again increased like so many other english students in rome i have benefited in many different ways by the indefatigable kindness of dr ashby of the british school 
and as illustrations in this volume show i finally lured him far afield in the tracks of garibaldi sir rennell rod has found time among his many more important activities to take an interest in my work and to find me new material the fact is that british students at rome are just now in clover not only on account of their compatriots resident out there but also on account of the kindness of the italians how much i have experienced this from how many people and in how many ways it is impossible for me to recount but i must here record a special word of thanks to some of those who have made my work in rome so pleasant and so profitable to me count ugo balzani signor carlo segre count and countess pasolini sindaco nathan signor mengini and the authorities of the biblioteca vit emanuela senator catalini the authorities of the ufico storico of the stato maggiore and various officers of the regular army the same kindness has been extended to me outside rome at milan by signor g calavarisi and signor gualtiero castellini and the authorities in charge of the archives at castello at bologna by the authorities of the museum and by the casa zanicelli at genoa by pier giulio bresci by colonel scalvo and the whole municipal at cremona by professor manacorda at mantua by cav alessandro lucio at naples by the societa storia patria and by our council mr churchill at montelconi calabria by marchesi gagliardi and signor scalfari and at stiletti by my kind host the late achille fazari and his whole family at Salo and london by countess martinengo cesaresco of sicily and the kind help i received there i wrote at length in the preface to the last volume both in england and italy i have had the advantage of conversation with many of the actors in the drama of eighteen sixty some like tour canzio mazzori and fazari have quite recently passed away others are with us still their names appear in the bibliography under the heading notes of conversations but i wish here to thank them collectively for their patience under interrogation above all i must thank my friends mr dalmage and mr patterson for their continuous efforts to enrich my knowledge by their memory i have during the last two years been constantly in receipt of letters from italy america and england from persons who saw or did things in italy in eighteen sixty some of this correspondence i have utilized noting it in the bibliography among the manuscript belonging to private persons i heartily thank all those who volunteered to send me information in this way in england those who have most assisted me by placing documents or illustrations at my disposal are next after lady agatha and mr rollo russell mr charles la Ciata, hon w w vernon miss paird lady lockwood mrs ostler and mr mallison mr ingram of the illustrated london news and the late dr nelson of belfast i am indebted for valuable advice and assistance to mr thayer of harvard whose life of cavour will be a landmark in resorgimento history three persons have been at the pains to read this book in manuscript or in proof mr hilton young my wife and count balzani one who did much to make me in love with a task which i am now bringing to a conclusion has recently passed away the late lord carlyle who had indeed a natural light to that title which i have heard him arrogate to himself the title of italianissimo june 1911 introduction the choice of this title for a volume of which the principal thing is garibaldi's part in the events of june to november eighteen sixty requires not apology but comment it is true that the making of italy had begun two generations before when general bonaparte crossed the alps with his hungry french republicans and was completed in eighteen seventy when victor emmanuel entered rome after the news of sedan but 1860 was the decisive year in that long process, the year when Italy was made. 
after considering whether he should call the book garibaldi and the fall of the neapolitan kingdom i have rejected any such title not only because it would fail to cover some of the most important events described the battle of castelfidaro and the liberation of the greater part of the papal provinces but also because the motive that inspired garibaldi from the first to the last moment of his great campaign in the south was less the desire to destroy the kingdom of naples than the desire to make the kingdom of italy the reader's mind should not be diverted from the national and constructive character of the italian revolution by the interesting but subsidiary fact that the bourbon system of government in south italy collapsed in eighteen sixty for the fourth and last time the revolution of that year differs from those of the napoleonic epoch and from those of eighteen twenty and eighteen forty eight in that it created a free state stretching from the alps to sicily which has since maintained its place in the family of nations as securely as france spain or the german empire although at the end of eighteen sixty the austrian was still in possession of his venetian territories and the pope of the small province that contained the city of rome the union effected between the other parts of italy rendered the absorption of rome and venice merely a question of time this volume starting from the accomplished fact of the capture of palermo by garibaldi and the thousand described in a previous volume narrates the events of the following half-year which brought this new state into being the story has variety and scope enough it is a complicated tale of war regular and irregular of diplomacy open and secret of politics high and low it carries us into places and peasants huts from one end of italy to the other and into half of the capitals of europe and it has all the interest of long protracted suspense for even after the taking of palermo in june it was by no means certain that when the winter snows descended again on aspromonte four-fifths of italy would be united and free the turn of complicated events brought this result about but in june it was no more a foregone conclusion than the break-up of austria-hungary or the reconstruction of poland events which were confidently expected in garibaldi's camp and of which at least the former entered as a probable contingency into the schemes of cavour in the following pages the reader will see by how narrow a margin italy in her great year escaped another disaster like that of eighteen forty eight with what skill and fortune she avoided foreign interference while she achieved her union against the will of all the great european powers except england what gross political and military mistakes stullified the powerful resistance which the pope and the king of naples might have set up how garibaldi's luck and genius and the psychological atmosphere of a triumphant revolution again and again produced military results contradictory to the known science of war how the bullet that might in any one of a hundred scuffles have reversed in a moment the fortunes of the campaign never passed nearer than through his poncho or his felt hat how the first check to his career northwards when capua held out against him in september occurred at the very moment when the wiser friends of italy were beginning to pray that he might get no nearer to the walls of rome how in the contest waged for six months between cavour and his chamber at turin and garibaldi from his shifting bivouacs on the southern apennines the divergent views of the two patriots as to the utmost pace at which the redemption could be pushed on were finally compromised exactly at the right point so as to secure the essential union of italy without the intermediate attack on rome and venice which must have imperiled all the mass of the nation supported both cavour and garibaldi and it was this that saved the situation but many of the principal actors were naturally forced to group themselves behind one or the other of the two chiefs if either party had completely got the upper hand if cavour had succeeded in annexing sicily in june and if he had been relieved from the competition of the revolutionary bands the great powers would not have permitted him to attack either naples or the papal territory if on the other hand the garibaldini had succeeded in attacking rome 
napoleon the third would have been forced to undo all that they had accomplished for italy the principle of audacity and the principle of guidance both essential for successful revolutions had each in eighteen sixty an almost perfect representative but the death of cavour in eighteen sixty one and the subsequent deterioration of garibaldi deprived both parties of the splendid leadership of the great year so that the last stages of the italian risorgimento were shorn of their meat of glory venice and rome were ultimately acquired but in a backhanded manner between eighteen sixty one and eighteen seventy the ship of italy's fortunes drifted and whirled amid shallow eddies but was swept at last safe into port because in eighteen sixty when bold and skilful hands were still on board the great flood tide had lifted her over the breakers at the bar end of preface and introduction chapter one of garibaldi and the making of italy by george macaulay trevelyan this librivox recording is in the public domain the consequences of the capture of palermo in naples paris turin and london have you seen the telegram palermo's been taken we believe mrs browning garibaldi in the first days of june eighteen sixty the news spread throughout europe that the capital of sicily guarded by twenty thousand regular troops by forts and artillery and by the neapolitan fleet in the harbor had been taken after three days fighting by garibaldi and a thousand north italian volunteers in plain clothes aided by a mob of half-armed sicilians how soon men asked and how far would the revolution advance when last palermo had expelled its garrison in january eighteen forty eight half europe had followed suit to the excited hopes of patriots and exiles to the indignant fears of kings and their chancellors palermo seemed but a first point fired in a train of gunpowder laid through messina and reggio to naples through naples and rome to venice through venice and Pest to vienna through vienna perhaps to warsaw and back to the tuileries it was in the interest of every monarch who was not like victor emmanuel out for revolution to check by force or by diplomacy the progress of the red-shirted portent the filibuster having failed to be shot in the authorized manner seemed an incarnation of the improbable and for a while aroused hopes and fears of which some were wildly extravagant a caesar he ere long to gaul to italy and hannibal and to all states not free shall climacteric be it was a case for a holy alliance of sovereigns to restore order in sicily or if that were no longer possible at least for a concert of europe to prevent the further spread of mischief the first person to evoke the protection of the powers by an appeal to the common interests of all established governments was the unfortunate king francis the second of naples whose house was already on fire at one end and was packed from roof to floor with combustible matter the neapolitan appeal for protection might take one of two forms either it might be addressed primarily to the powers of reaction russia and austria and would in that case be accompanied by vigorous conduct of the war in sicily and by continued repression on the mainland or else as actually occurred it might be addressed primarily to the more liberal powers to england and france in which case efforts must be made to patch up a truce with garibaldi and a constitution must be granted on the mainland as the latter course was the actual path by which king francis descended so rapidly to his doom it is easy to say now that the bolder policy would have had a better chance of success but the house of bourbon had twice before weathered the revolutionary storms of the bay of naples by granting a charter to be set aside when the danger had passed by and no one in the neapolitan camarilla had the nerve of a stafford or bismarck openly to continue in the reactionary course with garibaldi in palermo the only man among all francis the second's counsellors was his bavarian queen maria sophia and she though ready as she afterwards proved 
to fight for her crown behind the cannon of gaeta honestly desired a constitution and a complete change of system besides this russia and austria though more willing were less able to afford protection than either france or england russia who had dominated the european situation in eighteen forty nine when she had invaded rebellious hungary on behalf of austria had since then had a fall on the ramparts of sebastopol in whatever light the crimean war may be viewed from the standpoint of british or near eastern interests there is no doubt that from the point of view of the continental liberalism and the freedom of action of independent states it had done much to secure the liberties of europe the phrase inscribed in macaulay's suggestion on the moment to our soldiers at scutari the great power of darkness had been disabled and discredited in pan-european affairs and the new czar had even begun the work of liberation at home austria too who had the most immediate reason to support the old governments in italy and to check garibaldi's advance was in like manner recovering from her crimea the lombard war of eighteen fifty nine she dreaded that if she again moved to interfere in italy the hungarian rebels would rise behind her this time without fear of the russian armies for the ingratitude shown by austria to russia during the crimean war had dissolved the political friendship of the two powers napoleon the third and cavour were both in constant communication with kossuth and cavour had a hungarian rising ready primed to fire in case of an austrian war partly for these reasons and partly because the sicilian and neapolitan situation was more easily commanded from the sea it was necessary for francis the second to appeal not so much to the eastern as to the western and naval powers in spite of the constant bickering between france and england the deepest line of diplomatic division lay between east and west the idea of an alliance with the principles of russia despotism even for the purpose of scoring a point against a near neighbor was abhorrent to napoleon the third on one side of the channel and to palmerston and john lord russell on the other in fact when russia early in july proposed to join with france in policing the mediterranean against garibaldi's transports the offer coming from that quarter was promptly rejected if napoleon interfered on behalf of naples it would be in concert with great britain and if possible with piedmont and only on behalf of a reformed constitutional kingdom the decision of the young king of naples to adopt a liberal policy to abandon the friendship with austria and russia so long traditional in his family to appeal to napoleon the third for help and to conciliate france england and his own subjects by the grant of a constitution was taken in principle at councils held on may thirtieth and june the first eighteen sixty they were the first fruits of garibaldi's success on june first the king also sanctioned general lance's proposal to retreat with twenty thousand royal troops from the palace to the suburbs of palermo and on june fourth he sanctioned his further proposal to capitulate with garibaldi and to ship the whole royal army back from palermo to naples the chief promoter in the council of these important decisions was general filangeri the veteran prince of satriano who had served with equal fidelity the napoleonic kings of naples and the restored house of bourbon who had reconquered sicily for the crown in eighteen forty nine and ruled it with wise moderation until recalled by his reactionary enemies at court he had often and in vain advised bomba and his son after him to break with austria and the reaction and to come to an understanding with france abroad and with the constitutionalists at home his advice rejected year after year so long as it would have saved the throne was now adopted a month too late and it was with his own full concurrence coupled with the fatal policy of military surrender at palermo at a moment when a renewed attack on garibaldi and the rebel town headed by general nunziante or by the king in person would not improbably have turned the tide of war it might have been expected that filangeri 
having at length completely overborne his reactionary enemies at the council board would have helped to carry out the hard task which he had himself set to his royal master of changing horses in the bed of a roaring torrent which had already swept them all off their feet but he preferred to retire to his country house near sorrento whence at his ease he could watch the troubled city of naples across the full breadth of the bay when the king sent general nunziante to beg him to return to the head of affairs and to revive the body politic by a constitutional regimen he replied with brutal frankness would you have me repeat the miracle of lazarus i am not christ but a miserable mortal his interlocutor nunziante hitherto a staunch reactionary who had been loaded with honors and emoluments by the late king and was esteemed and trusted by francis the second as the ablest man in the neapolitan service after filangieri himself had recently consented to take up the command against garibaldi and had drawn up plans for the reconquest of palermo but he was so deeply impressed by these words of filangieri that he at once determined not to go to sicily and then and there began to calculate how best to desert the falling house of bourbon and to carry over the army intact to the service of the house of piedmont and united italy before the end of june the king himself crossed the bay of naples to try his own powers of persuasion on the recluse of sorrento when the royal yacht was unexpectedly seen approaching the landing-place below the villa filangieri fled to his bedroom and jumped into bed not having time to take off his clothes he drew the blankets over him up to his chin and received his royal visitor so was ever monarch before or since received in such a fashion by the first subject in his kingdom francis the second held an hour's private conversation by the bedside of the malingerer and then returned to naples filangieri perhaps a little ashamed of himself never disclosed even to his nearest and dearest what had passed in that strange interview but no one doubted that he had again been pressed to form a constitutional ministry and that pleading his feigned illness he again refused early in august filangieri went into voluntary exile at marseilles after the revolution was accomplished he returned to italy until his death in eighteen sixty seven resided as a loyal subject of victor emmanuel refusing office and honors from the new government but never regretting the old the ideal of his life had been an independent south italy with a progressive and civilized government of its own such as that which in his youth he had helped murat to conduct after waterloo the restored bourbons and their subjects had left that path and had since failed in numerous attempts to return to it again in spite of the efforts of men like poerio and filangieri poerio convinced after eighteen forty eight that south italy was by itself incapable of maintaining a tolerable government had quickly come to believe in the union of all italy as a positive good and even filangieri was at last forced to admit after the event that union was the least bad of all practicable solutions discouraged but not deterred by filangieri's refusal to lend a hand in carrying out his own policy francis the second continued in the prescribed course in the first days of june he had frankly thrown himself on the protection of france di martino had been sent as the bearer of an autograph letter of the king of naples to the emperor accompanied by antonini the regular neapolitan minister of paris he went out to fontainebleau on june twelfth to interview napoleon the envoys met with the chilling reception from the french courtiers even tuvenel the foreign minister though no friend to italian aspirations was brutally rude to the representatives of the falling cause and before the conference began was overheard by them saying in a loud voice in the antechamber now i must go and hear what lies the two neapolitan orators will tell the emperor napoleon himself though courteous and humane held out no hope that he would actively interfere he explained the difference between the claims of the king of naples on his protection and those of the pope 
the french flag he said is actually waving on the pope's territory and then there is the question of religion the italians understand that if they attacked rome i should have to act but in the case of naples he declared that as the victor of solferino and the liberator of lombardy he was bound not to stultify his own past by using his troops on behalf of an opposite principle in south italy les italiens sont fins he said the italians are shrewd they clearly perceive that since i have shed the blood of my people for the cause of nationality i can never fire a cannon against it and this conviction the key to the recent revolution when tuscany was annexed against my wishes and interests will have the same effect in your case the king of naples concessions the offer of the constitution failed to impress him it's too late he said a month ago these concessions might have prevented everything to-day they are too late it was now june the twelfth on april fifteenth victor emmanuel had written to his dear cousin of naples suggesting a mutual alliance on the principle of italian nationality and freedom and ending with the words if you allow some months to pass without attending to my friendly suggestion your majesty will perhaps experience the bitterness of the terrible words too late eight weeks had sufficed to fulfill the prophecy and the terrible words were now on the lips of napoleon himself but there was still said the emperor to the neapolitan envoys one chance for their master let him humbly ask for the piedmontese alliance which he had himself rejected earlier in the year when victor emmanuel had made the advances piedmont alone said napoleon can stop the course of the revolution you must apply not to me but to victor emmanuel we french do not wish he added for the annexation of south italy to the kingdom of piedmont because we think it contrary to our interests and it is for this reason that we advise you to adopt the only expedient which can prevent or at least retard that annexation for the rest he would be delighted if the neapolitan royalists proved able to defeat garibaldi and the revolution with the force of their own arms but he could not help them himself partly for the reasons which he had already given and partly because he was determined to do nothing contrary to the wishes of england his advice therefore to the neapolitan envoys at fontainebleau was nothing more than a reasoned repetition of the programme which his representative Brenier had several days before urged upon the court at naples namely first a scheme of sicilian home rule under a prince of the royal house of naples secondly a constitution for the mainland thirdly an alliance with piedmont this triple program was perforce adopted by the neapolitan court but the first item depended on its fulfillment on garibaldi and the sicilians and the third on cavour and the piedmontese the constitution indeed could be published by the king without consent of any other party but whether it would at this twelfth hour conciliate the population of the neapolitan provinces still remained to be seen the question was soon put to the proof a council of ministers sat on june twenty first after antonini's report of the interview at fontainebleau had been read to them decided by eleven votes to three to adopt the triple program laid down by the french emperor a short while back the same men would have voted by an equally large majority against any concession but in these weeks lifelong opinions were changing with a rapidity peculiar to the crisis of a great revolution since the taking of palermo most of the reactionary party headed by the king's uncle the count of aquila had become ardent constitutionalists while the constitutional party of former years headed by the duke of syracuse another uncle of the king the philippi egalide of the neapolitan revolution had turned against the dynasty and were working to bring in victor emmanuel a year ago wrote elliot the british minister there was hardly an annexationist to be found in this part of italy and now pretty nearly the whole country is so for the moment 
but even after the council of june twenty first the feeble king still hesitated although he would not go to sicily and lead on his troops against garibaldi he was almost equally unwilling to publish the constitution and to declare for the piedmontese alliance all the pieties and instincts of his dumb nature were adverse to the change and he was upheld in his passive resistance by the clamours of his stepmother maria theresa the austrian woman whom he had been accustomed since boyhood to obey but on the other side was his wife maria sophia whose influence upon him was constantly growing throughout his brief reign corresponding to a perceptible increase of manliness on his part for some days after the council of june twenty first a final struggle was waged between the two marias ending in the victory of the younger her demand for constitutional reform was urgently supported by the king's uncle the count of aquila and by the french minister brenet who were now in close partnership di martino meanwhile had been sent to rome to obtain the pope's leave for the change of policy which was grudgingly given on condition that any alliance with piedmont was not to be made at the expense of the papal territories or the privileges of the church the pope's consent turned the scale in the king's mind and on june twenty fifth the sovereign act was published recalling to vigour the constitution of eighteen forty eight granting home rule to sicily under a prince of the royal house and announcing that an alliance would be made with piedmont the complete triple programme advised by napoleon the tricolour flag symbolic of italian nationality was hauled up on all the public buildings and on the ships of the fleet the political prisoners were let loose throughout the kingdom the exiles returned amid processions and rejoicings pending the elections to parliament a ministry of moderate liberals took over the authority of the state as far as the government was concerned everything was done in the most approved manner according to the pattern of one of those joyous constitution givings of the spring of eighteen forty eight when monarchs and peoples had wept in each other's arms but on this occasion it was only the monarch who opened his arms and embraced the empty air when on june twenty sixth the king and queen drove out in an open carriage to receive the ovations of liberated naples hats were respectfully raised but hardly a cheer was heard in the whole length of the toledo the constitution was stillborn in some upland villages especially in the district between naples and the roman border it was regarded as a jacobinical betrayal of religion while the great mass of the king's subjects in the capital and in the provinces south of the capital regarded it merely as a first step in the direction of italian unity a means of freeing themselves from the police and the censorship so as to be better able to welcome him when he came he was at palermo he would soon be at the straits and it was in that direction and not to the palace of naples that all men's thoughts were turned the newly granted liberties were used to destroy the government that had conceded them newspapers sprang up by the score books pamphlets and proclamations appeared everywhere and nearly the whole output of the liberated press was anti-dynastic its only disputes turned on the rival merits of cavour and mazzini of the federation and annexation and whether or not to await garibaldi's coming before beginning the revolution the new ministry formed by spinelli with di martino in charge of foreign affairs consisted chiefly of mediocre but honest men desirous of working the constitution and saving the dynasty but with one exception they had neither influence nor popularity at a time when the mere possession of office lent but little authority to the opinions of its holder yet even the ministers without intending to do so further undermined the stability of the throne for they busied themselves as indeed it was their duty to do if the constitution was to be a reality in turning out reactionaries and putting in old constitutionalists as prefects magistrates and police regardless of the fact that the old constitutionalists were now for garibaldi almost to a man 
the expulsion of genuine royalists from the public service alienated the enthusiasm of the king's friends without reconciling his enemies to whom it gave the civil power in every province from calabria to abruzzi the bishops more reactionary than their clergy were the only persons in authority who could not be summarily dismissed but they were watched by spies who reported their sayings and movements to the minister of the interior some of the prelates fled from their diocese in real or affected fear for their personal safety in every town the new authorities formed and armed the national guard chosen out of the middle class which became in effect a military force prepared to support the coming revolution the army alone was loyal to the king but as it still consisted of about one hundred thousand well-armed and well-drilled men it might still defeat garibaldi and if it could once drive the red shirts in rout no one doubted that the constitution the national guard the ministry the press and the tricolor flags would all be huddled away in twenty-four hours after all there had been a constitutional ministry in eighteen forty eight and shortly afterwards the principal ministers were serving their time in irons it was this supreme consideration which made real loyalty impossible for any man however much he cared for the dynasty if he also cared for the constitution no one except the reactionaries really wished to hear of a victory over the man who was in name the national enemy and in reality the national deliverer it was for this reason that the new ministers were so unwilling to take the offensive against him in sicily for no cabinet can be expected to conduct a war with vigor when a decisive victory would mean twenty years penal servitude for each of its members general pianel the new war minister was a faithful and honest man but he erred in accepting a post of which he could not by the nature of the case heartily fulfil the duties don liborio romano the new prefect of police was the sole exception to the rule that the ministers had neither popularity nor influence and he was also the exception to the rule that they were passively loyal to the king don liborio as he was called in these days was a native of lower apulia skilled in the insinuating manners and arts of political intrigue which the inhabitants of the region between toronto and brindisi are said to have inherited from their greek ancestors he had been an active liberal as early as eighteen twenty and had often suffered as such at the hands of the police but he belonged essentially to the world of levantine intrigue rather than to the world of european revolution for this reason he was able from june to september eighteen sixty to preserve the confidence of the inhabitants of the capital by a kind of masonic mutual understanding or sympathy of character which a more straightforward man would have failed to establish with the neapolitans after his retirement he always asserted that he had taken office not in order to save the dynasty which he believed to be already lost but in order to preserve his fellow countrymen from anarchy and civil war this account of his motives if a considerable allowance be also made for his vanity and ambition is accepted by the most competent and unbiased authorities who knew the naples of that day well and they are also of opinion that at the moment of entering office he did actually achieve his purpose and save the city and perhaps the whole kingdom from a terrible disaster the circumstances were as follows on june twenty seventh two days after the proclamation of the sovereign act when all the authorities of the old regime had lost their power but before the new ministry was well in the saddle and before the national guard or the new police had been formed disorders broke out in naples the police of the old government were hunted down and their archives burnt unless the mob was checked anarchy would soon prevail in its most hideous form but there was at the moment no armed force deriving its authority from the constitution and if the regular army aflame with reactionary passions had been called out to shoot the mob civil war would have begun at once 
in the circumstances laborio romano was entreated to become prefect of police on the ground that no one else could save naples he accepted the post on june twenty seventh and on the next day the prefecture of police till then execrated by every one became the resort of the leading liberals but the liberals alone could not control the vicious and non-political criminal class of naples the camorra hitherto in tacit league with the old royal government had now turned against all government don laborio to avoid the imminent social catastrophe struck a bargain with this secret association of criminals in the name of the new government or at any rate its prefect of police the chiefs of the camorra were given places in the new police force along with other more respectable members of society the consequence was that there were no more disturbances in naples during the next three months of turmoil panic and revolution except on occasions when the reactionary soldiers broke loose from their barracks in this ignominious manner naples was saved the price paid by the italian government in later years was high but possibly not too high for the escape of society from promiscuous bloodshed and rapine having thus tided over the immediate danger don liborio formed the national guard from among his own adherents in the respectable middle class the national guard the police and the camorra were now at his disposal not only in naples but throughout the provinces he was master of the situation and held the stakes until either the king or garibaldi had conquered throughout july and august he was the real ruler of the country for all domestic purposes except the command of the army francis the second hated and distrusted don laborio but dared not dismiss him while the house of bourbon was thus engaged at home in clothing its enemies with authority and its friends with confusion the piedmontese alliance to obtain which all these sacrifices were being made was eagerly solicited at turin twice during the last twelve months piedmont had asked for an alliance and had been rebuffed by the councillors of francis the second it was now their turn to sue for the settlement which they had so recently refused the house of bourbon was on its knees clad in the constitution and the tricolor for a garb of penance but the record of its perjuries prevented all confidence and the record of its cruelties all forgiveness the neapolitan prisoners whose woes mr gladstone had made famous the victims of bomba's dungeons were now many of them residing in turin several as deputies in the north italian parliament which was then in full session others like braico had gone to sicily with the thousand when the news of the fall of palermo arrived neapolitan exiles in turin met at the house of mancini one of their number and at the instance of carlo poerio declared for the disposition of the bourbons when some three weeks later there arose the question of the alliance of piedmont with naples the uncompromising attitude of these men strengthened cavour's hands to resist the proposal poerio the conservative minister of the late king during the parliamentary regime of eighteen forty eight had been rewarded for his undisputed loyalty to the crown and constitution by a sentence of twenty-four years in irons obtained by notoriously false witness at the instance of bomba himself he had served eight years of that sentence and had come out of prison in eighteen fifty nine converted to the program of italian unity he and his friends now put themselves at the head of the popular agitation in north italy which made it impossible for cavour even if he had so wished to accept the alliance and to protect the neapolitan state from further invasion by garibaldi on june twenty ninth poerio from the tribune of the north italian chamber uttered sentiments which coming from the mouth of one so moderate so reticent and so just carried the full weight of their literal meaning the neapolitan government he said has the tradition of perjury handed down from father to son that is why it now offers to swear to the constitution 
because it is clear that in order to be perjured it is necessary first to swear i trust that the ministers of victor emmanuel will not stretch out their hands to a government which certainly is the most declared of the enemies of italian independence the roar of applause that followed him as he returned to his seat showed that the north italian deputies had already made up their minds about the proposed alliance the neapolitan exiles while they held this language in public expressed themselves with no less vigor and decision in their private correspondence writing to panizzi the librarian of the british museum and one of the chief unofficial agents of the italian cause in our country poerio and his fellow martyr settembrini urged that the hour had struck to weld italy into one state and that if a truce were now patched up when the trumpets should be sounding the final charge enthusiasm would cool with time and the principle of dualism with all its terrible consequences would forever divide the italian peninsula cavour was from the first aware that it was impossible to accept the alliance on the very day of poerio's speech in the chamber he telegraphed to villa marina the piedmontese minister at naples to take care to render impossible an agreement between the king of naples and the national party we must not allow italy to believe that by compliance or weakness we are ready to fraternize with the king of naples to accept the neapolitan alliance would as he knew mean schism and possibly war in north italy and yet he dared not at once close the door on a proposal initiated by france regarded by austria russia and prussia as only too liberal and at present supported officially by england herself as soon as hudson had finished persuading lord john russell to accept frankly the idea of annexation and united italy a task upon which he was busily engaged in a private and unofficial correspondence cavour might take a bolder course but even if we were helped by england he wrote to ricasoli on july eighth we could not fight both on the mincio and the alps against both austria and france so he could not reject scornfully a proposed settlement presented under french auspices and by french advice he determined therefore to entertain the neapolitan envoys mana and winspear and to treat about the alliance on such terms as were certain to be refused by king francis making demands tantamount to the cession of sicily and further partition of the pope's territory for the benefit of piedmont but the fear that the italian people would suppose even these negotiations to be serious constantly haunted him if we consent to the alliance we are lost if we reject it what will europe say in my life i was never more embarrassed to retain the confidence of the patriotic party cavour more and more openly hastened the equipment and departure of the expeditions of volunteers to join garibaldi and that portion of the press which he inspired was observed to be scornfully hostile to the neapolitan alliance at the same time he tried to cut the knot of his difficulties by engineering the immediate revolution in naples the piedmontese diplomatic representative villa marina was the centre of this movement and the piedmontese legation its house of call even in april under the old regime of repression villa marina's house with its immunities against police search had been used for the meetings of conspirators and the forwarding of their letters to north italy and now in july he was instructed to act with piedmontese agents of high character like emilio visconti venosta and with the best of the neapolitan exiles like spaventa and nisco who openly came into naples some as naturalized piedmontese subjects others trusting to the civil rights enjoyed under the new constitution some came with money supplied by cavour and farini to start newspapers all came to talk to their old friends in the army and elsewhere and to stir up an annexationist movement within a few days of his arrival in naples venosta wrote home to report that the army was bourbonist in sympathy 
and that the people only understood the idea of revolution as connected with garibaldi for whom they were waiting as for a second saint januarius but it was not until the end of august that cavour could be persuaded by his agents that a revolution without garibaldi was impossible it was indeed neither a dignified nor an honest policy to pretend to treat for alliance with the government of a country while arming bands of volunteers to invade its provinces and sending emissaries to excite a revolution in its capital but that was the system pursued by cavour during july and august because he believed the alternative to be the austrian bayonets in milan and the french in turin danton once thundered out for all the world to hear que maintenant soit flitre que la france soit libre cavour's intellectually aristocratic temper had no such unsafe confidences for the people at large but he said quietly to his friends one day if we had done for ourselves the things which we are doing for italy we should be great rascals the magnificent integrity of cavour's private character and the entire disinterestedness of his public conduct lends peculiar force to this saying it must indeed be confessed that he bequeathed to the statesmanship of the new italy the old traditions of duplicity which have sometimes become low cunning in the hands of successors with neither his virtues his abilities nor his dire necessities for their excuse but before we condemn cavour we must decide whether without a large degree of duplicity he could supported by england alone have made italy against the will of a hostile europe against the destroyers of poland the man of december the pope and the perjured dynasty of naples this question i am unable to answer and i believe that no answer however confidently given can be anything better than a reasoned guess there were not wanting at the time well-informed observers who believed that cavour could have avoided all this chicanery that even in june he could have carried out the bold and straightforward policy on which he finally embarked in september i wish wrote elliot to lord john russell on june twenty fifth victor emmanuel would throw off the mask like a man and go to war it would certainly be a very easy matter for him to roll down this rickety dynasty and he would be received with enthusiasm by the nation it was natural for the british minister at naples to write in this confident manner for what elliot had close under his own eyes was the rottenness of the government to which he was accredited but it was not any fear of resistance at naples that withheld cavour it was the fear of counter-attack from vienna and paris there were many riddles in the complicated problem which cavour had to solve but the chief one was to guess the true colour of the chameleon of the tuileries the liberal protector of the pope the friendly foe of italian unity if cavour let loose the nation straining at the leash if he made legal war on naples and invaded the papal marches and umbria would napoleon merely protest or would he actively interfere or if austria attacked piedmont when she was engaged in liberating the south on what terms if any would napoleon lend his protection on this the supreme problem of that summer cavour obtained a decided opinion from the emperor's cousin jerome this prince a whole-hearted friend of italian unity deserves more credit than he has got for his successful efforts in eighteen fifty nine and eighteen sixty on behalf of that policy which forever cut him off from all hope of an italian kingdom in tuscany or elsewhere on june thirtieth he wrote to cavour that the time had come when he could attack south italy without fear of the emperor's veto the letter is one of the most important in the history of italy for it foreshadows the course which cavour adopted two months later italy wrote prince jerome is in a supreme crisis she must emerge from it united under the sceptre of my father-in-law victor emmanuel with rome as her capital or else she will slide back under the oppression of priests and austrians at turin as well as at naples and everywhere else 
the die is cast daring alone can save you today be strong don't trust to yourself no illusions no vanity you have need of france and you can get her by means of the emperor il vous fait la france par l'empereur be then completely open with him no more finesse that served your turn for tuscany it will not serve your turn with sicily naples and rome explain to him your views of the future not only your end but your means and your conduct cavour did not at once adopt the course here prescribed for him by the prince but he did so before two months were out when he opened his innermost consuls to napoleon and mobilized the italian army to invade the territories of the pope and of the king of naples the question is whether he could safely have ventured upon this policy in the first days of july on receipt of the prince's letter or whether in fact it was necessary as he judged to wait until the unofficial revolution under garibaldi had spread from palermo to the gates of naples perhaps prince jerome antedated the readiness of his imperial cousin to condone the making of italy it is true that napoleon at the end of august accepted it as the only alternative to anarchy but it was by no means the only alternative prior to garibaldi's victory at milazzo and march through calabria would napoleon at the beginning of july have consented to throw over at cavour's request all of the proposals which he himself had just made for a reformed neapolitan kingdom allied to piedmont it may be doubted although the emperor's gloomy words to the neapolitan envoys at fontainebleau perhaps imply a weakening of his resistance to cavour but on july sixth brunet the french minister at naples declared strongly against annexation and at turin the french minister m de talleyrand was pressing cavour hard to grant the neapolitan alliance claiming first and foremost that victor emmanuel should at once write to garibaldi to bid him to make a truce talleyrand found that cavour sheltered himself behind england and put off his demands with fair words and excuses to gain time victor emmanuel was conveniently away hunting in his beloved alps and his return must be awaited meanwhile in the better world up there in the pine woods and beneath the moraines the descendant of twenty generations of hunting rulers of savoy unbosomed himself to his companions of the chase the men to whom he could talk gruffly and freely to ease his rugged nature of its weight of simple emotions he talked much about sicily wrote one of these after their return to the plains he said he envied garibaldi and would like to be able to lay about him like the nazar general victor emmanuel really loves garibaldi the affection for garibaldi which the italian king could only express to his confidence in the depths of the alpine forest was being proclaimed aloud in the streets by all classes in great britain in the uncertain diplomatic situation england's decided attitude became the governing factor if at the beginning of july when france asked for her support in forcing a truce on garibaldi in palermo england had supported the other powers in such a program of interference it is difficult to see how sicily could have been annexed to piedmont but england refused and without her concurrence napoleon who at this time highly valued her friendship was unwilling to proceed to definite action and again at the end of july as will be told in a later chapter she refused to participate in napoleon's scheme to prevent garibaldi from crossing the straits and thereby enabled the red shirts to invade the mainland this policy of lord john's was not that of intervention in italian affairs but of non-intervention with an implied veto on the intervention of others the action of great britain in this summer without which italy could not have been made was due partly to the steady pressure of public opinion press and parliament on the cabinet and partly to the personal attachment of the minister of foreign affairs to the cause of italian freedom 
lord john russell had been brought up in boyhood and youth among the friends of fox that small group of liberal aristocrats who no fair-weather friends of freedom had sacrificed their popularity and their chance of influence and power for forty years on behalf of the principles of civil and religious liberty russell had inherited their traditions had in early manhood led the great attack that re-established freedom in great britain in eighteen thirty two and now in old age was prepared to do all that in him lay to overturn on italian soil worse tyrannies than had ever been known in england in this task lord john was opposed by the court but he was supported by the public by the press by the petitions of great municipalities and by his two chief colleagues palmerston and gladstone both converts at different dates and for different reasons from those authoritarian principles in church and state to which he himself had sworn eternal hatred while he was still a boy the british minister of foreign affairs was therefore ready to take any step consonant with british interests that would assist italian freedom and fortunately he had for his advisers at naples and at turin respectively two men of marked ability who sympathized with these aims Elliot and Hudson conducted a private correspondence with Lord John behind their official dispatches, and so enabled the British minister to keep abreast of the rapid development of the Italian situation in 1859 and 1860. It was for this reason that British policy never fell seriously behind the ever-increasing requirements of Cavour before the middle of july eighteen sixty both hudson and elliot had become converts to the idea of italian unity and both of them began to write private letters to prepare lord john's mind to accept the annexation of the whole peninsula by victor emmanuel but their support of this program was due only to the garbaldian conquests union had not previously been favored even by hudson himself on may eighteenth while garibaldi with his thousand were still in the mountains overlooking palermo hudson had argued in a long private letter to russell that the fusion of north and south italy in one state was difficult because of the intervening papal territories and not desirable because of the moral corruption of the south he had recommended as a compromise the possession of the throne of naples and sicily by a cadet of the royal house of piedmont but the fall of palermo at the end of may converted him to the idea of complete italian unity meanwhile lord john had not taken up with any warmth his suggestion of placing a cadet of the house of piedmont on the throne of naples and the tidal wave of unity which the victory of palermo set in motion carried that idea to the frozen sea of diplomatic nostrums as its author cheerfully acknowledged therefore on july sixteenth hudson wrote to lord john again declaring himself this time cordially and entirely in favor of italian unity under victor emmanuel because now that the notion of a prince of the house of savoy had been set aside by the force of circumstances he saw very great danger to the balance of power in the mediterranean if france should in the midst of the neapolitan confusion find means to place a creature of her own on that throne on july twenty seventh he again wrote in favor of annexation as less prejudicial to british interests of which you remind me than the anarchy of sicily and naples and the discontent of north italy finally on july thirty first he wrote a long reasoned letter to lord john to prove that italian unity was in accordance with british interests in this important letter hudson uses two main arguments first that the annexation had now become the only possible form of stable government for south italy are the respectable classes of naples to be subjected to the inconvenience of being shot plundered burnt and violated because the foreign powers dislike unity secondly when the whole peninsula was united in one state it would be strong enough to be independent of france and would naturally gravitate to friendship with england and the german powers a good understanding between austria prussia italy and england argued hudson 
would rid europe of the nightmare of french domination which then oppressed her it is my duty he concluded under my instructions to support duality and i have done so but i should greatly fail in my duty if i did not point out to your lordship the difficulties i may say the impossibility which prevent its accomplishment these arguments in which as will be seen the fear of french predominance was the chief sufficed to persuade the british statesmen of eighteen sixty that their earnest desire to help italian freedom was compatible with the material interests of great britain and that it was not only their pleasure but their duty to bring about the union of the whole peninsula under victor emmanuel side by side with the love of italy the fear of france then dominated englishmen and not least among them lord john russell he was in constant anxiety at this period lest cavour should purchase from napoleon the right to annex the rest of italy by ceding the island of sardinia and the genoese riviera to france the rumour was in fact baseless but although cavour and farini hastened to deny it with the utmost solemnity russell could not feel easy remembering the protestations of innocence that had preceded the barter of nice and savoy hudson endeavoured to relieve his chief's fears pointing out that genoa was a vital part of italy whereas nice had been a mere outpost at the same time with admirable skill he turned lord john's remaining fears on this head into an argument that england herself should support the italian claims unconditionally and so outbid the french by doing the work for nothing i perceive he wrote on may thirty first replying to lord john's fears about the alleged cession of genoa that the more you hang back the more easy do you make the propagation of french notions in italy it is difficult to see where lord john had been guilty of hanging back in any case he was never seriously open to the charge again but made himself thenceforth a willing auxiliary to the plans of hudson and cavour end of chapter one chapter two of garibaldi and the making of italy by george macaulay trevelyan this librivox recording is in the public domain enthusiasm in north italy the expeditions in aid of garibaldi mazzini bertani and cavour o giornate del nostro riscato o dolente per sempre colui c'è del lunge del labro de altrui como un homo straniero leudra c'è un suoi figlie nerandoli un giorno dove dir sosperando io non c'era c'è la santa vitrice bandiera saluta che di non avra alessandro manzoni o days of our country's roaming unhappy for ever shall he be who shall like a stranger hear of it from afar from the lips of others who when he tells the tale to his children on a time must say sign i was not there who shall not have hailed on that day of days our holy conquering banner a new nation cannot be made solely by the skill of a great statesman playing on the mutual jealousies of foreign powers the making of nations requires the self-sacrifice of thousands of obscure men and women who care more for the idea of their country than for their own comfort or interest their own lives or the lives of those whom they love cavour with the help of england's attitude of non-intervention could at best only keep the ring while the revolutionary struck down the neapolitan kingdom it remained to be seen whether the volunteers would go out in sufficient numbers to enable garibaldi to defeat the one hundred thousand bourbon troops who even after the fall of palermo refused to embrace the national cause the italian revolution had produced martyrs by the hundred could it now produce effective soldiers by the thousand the active patriots came from among all classes of the town population and from the leaders of the rural districts 
but the common peasantry of the north though most of them had now been converted to the national cause did not cross the sea to join garibaldi a severe strain was therefore put on the cities of north italy not at that date as wealthy as they have since become to supply at a few weeks notice out of the civilian population a complete army of volunteers the strain was more severe because so large a portion of the patriotic youth of the peninsula had already enlisted in the regular army of piedmont which so long as garibaldi was on the warpath was urgently required for home defence against a possible attack from austria yet within three months of the capture of palermo more than twenty thousand volunteers were shipped off south from genoa and leghorn the great majority of these northerners proved in the battle of the volturno that they could fight bravely and it is reasonable to suppose that nine-tenths of them went to war mainly from patriotic motives for there was no compulsion to enlist except public opinion no reward except mental satisfaction the pay offered was insufficient to supply their daily needs on a campaign where the plunder even of food was punished by death and where the improvised commissariat was always insufficient and often non-existent when garibaldi at palermo heard complaints of the irregularity of the pay he said to bandy what do you want with pay when a patriot has eaten his bowl of soup and when the affairs of the country are going well what more can any one want however he agreed to fix a scale and thenceforward officers received two francs a day and privates one franc or less the intendant general calculated two francs per man as the average for pay and maintenance combined including both officers and privates in the estimate neither was there any prospect that at the end of the war the spoils would be divided among the actual victors for the south was to be liberated not conquered and furthermore the garibaldini well knew that they were fighting to win a kingdom for a royal government suspicious of them if not of their leader and fully equipped with place hunters of its own financially far more was given up than was gained by the garibaldino though exceptions could be named physically the campaign was no holiday in the mountains of sicily and calabria these town-bred youths of an unathletic community were exposed to the utmost hardships of hunger and thirst heat cold and rain and to the thousand petty miseries of campaigning in a half-barbarous country all of which as privileges of a patriot's life the old south american guerrilla expected his followers to enjoy as much as he did himself all this they endured and the tortures of wounds treated in ill-provided field hospitals with an uncomplaining courage which aroused the wonder of their british companions in arms the difficulty of raising at a moment's notice a purely volunteer army and of leading it to victory over regular troops is one on which modern military authorities lay ever-increasing stress in the light of these doctrines it will be seen that the improvised campaign narrated in this volume even when full allowance has been made for the inferior quality of the bourbon troops remains a remarkable feat it proves that fine elements of character were widely spread in the cities and market towns of north italy and were brought out and fused together by the patriotic ardour of that year when the best men of a race too intermittent in its activities and too uncertain in its emotions were wrought up to six months of steady heroism by the appeal of the great simple passions of liberty and country the work of raising and equipping these twenty thousand volunteers was carried out equally by the covarian and by more advanced parties their rivalry for the affections of the people and their quarrel for the right to direct the revolution had the effect of stirring each side to greater activity on garibaldi's behalf since the friends of mazzini and of cavour could not have sat side by side in one office there were three or more separate organizations engaged in the work first there was bertani's central committee in aid of garibaldi seated at genoa conducted in the interest of the advanced groups secondly the more moderate national society seated at turin 
of which cavour's agent la farina was now president in place of garibaldi resigned thirdly the million rifles fund with its armory at milan founded by garibaldi but conducted from first to last under the control of the government the million rifles fund did not like bertani's committee and the national society actually enlist and equip men but it supplied the national society with a great part of its arms and money and was itself secretly supplied to this end with large sums from the royal treasury which in this roundabout manner helped to finance garibaldi's operations in june and july one or both of the rival organizations cavour's national society and bertani's committee had local branches and agents collecting money and enlisting men in every chief town of free italy from turin to rimini from brescia to leghorn in the enslaved provinces there was more secrecy but scarcely less activity the conspirators of the papal states were in constant correspondence with mazzini and bertoni who urged them not to send their young men to sicily but to hold them in readiness for a rising which bertani pledged himself to assist with an invasion of volunteers from the north but from austrian venetia the liberation of which was not immediately contemplated several thousands of young men escaped over the lombard frontier by help of a committee that sat for the purpose at milan and sent them on by way of genoa to join garibaldi an english engineer named denton who was travelling on business through north italy that summer described the excitement he found in every town and village the patriotic newspapers read aloud at the street corner to satisfy a rapacity for news astonishing to an englishman garibaldi's name overheard every moment garibaldi's photograph seen in every size and shape from the shirt stud to the big poster on the town's walls the volunteers openly departing by the light of day in their red shirts and capes when mr denton crossed into austrian venetia he found the flame burning not the less intensely for being forced to smoulder he was able to see below the surface because every patriot thought it safe to open his heart to him when no stranger was by on no other security than the fact that he was an englishman one venetian merchant leaving his home because the austrian spies and police had at length rendered his life unbearable said to him that is my nephew and he is going to join the ranks of the future liberator of venetia he will make the fifth nephew i have serving garibaldi and out of sixteen young men i had in my counting-house ten have left me for sicily so it will be he said throughout venetia there will not be a young man of spirit left at home no class and no party and no district in north italy was behindhand in the offering of lives or of money rich and poor sent their private offerings from all over the country in sums which to our english standards are not immense but which represented the widow's might in many straitened italian households the cavourian principal bodies of great towns like milan voted large sums out of rates to the million rifles fund cremona alone a town well below thirty thousand inhabitants sent nearly a thousand volunteers and gave over one hundred and thirty thousand lira partly by subscription partly by loan which the municipality raised in order to aid garibaldi's expedition but bergamo brescia and pavia were the chief garibaldian cities next to genoa herself in pavia the cairoli exercised a supreme influence based upon nothing more material than the respect of their fellow-citizens for their integrity and their leadership in patriotic endeavor the father carlo cairoli professor of surgery had been made podesta of his native city in eighteen forty eight and had died soon after its reoccupation by the austrians leaving his five boys to the influence of his widow adelaide the mother of cairoli had first lost ernesto at garibaldi's battle of barisi in eighteen fifty nine in eighteen sixty benedetto and enrico had gone with a thousand and were both lying wounded in palermo 
when luigi aged twenty-two threw up his commission in the regular army and followed them to sicily in september he died of typhus the result of the hardships of the march through calabria during the days when he was contracting his fatal illness he wrote a long and cheerful letter to his mother and to his betrothed from the remote calabrian village spizzano albanese mana so the letter ended i must tell you one thing which i have tried to be silent about so as not to alarm your modesty but which i can no longer leave untold yesterday evening my hosts asked me my name you should have seen the effect which it had on them to hear that i was a cairoli or rather a son of the carioli mother of pavia and this is not the first time it has happened to me garibaldi's proclamation to the women of sicily in which adelaide's patriotic sacrifices were held up for their imitation was greedily read in all sicily and the neapolitan continent and so your name is already venerated by every good italian of the south good-bye mamma good-bye adriana luigi died a fortnight after writing this letter but benedetto and enrico recovered of their wounds seven years later enrico and giovanni the youngest of the five received their death wounds from the papal troops at villa glory while attempting at the head of a small band of men to force their way into rome benedetto the eldest and the mother adelaide alone survived the wars of liberation the story of the cairoli all bound together by the ties of the strongest affection all devoted wholly to their country's cause all free from any taint of self-interest of bombast or of violence was revered by garibaldi and his contemporaries and has become traditional with prosperity as the most perfect example of that family life which fostered the purest qualities of the italian risorgimento the papers of bertani's central committee in aid of garibaldi have been preserved the historian can turn over voluminous masses of accounts bills purchases of steamers lists of arms uniforms and stores acquired and dispatched besides many documents more poignantly human there are hundreds of letters for may june and july offering service or rather imploring to be allowed to serve under garibaldi in many cases the writer offers to throw up for life some well-paid civil or military post under government the italian idea of bliss in order to be able to serve garibaldi for six months frequently the aspirant states his age to be seventeen apparently as the ideal age for a soldier sometimes the letter speaks for a group of persons preparing to come sometimes it serves to introduce a would-be volunteer who brings it by hand we can imagine bertani his emaciated body propped up on the pillows of his sick-bed working night and day with the light of fever almost of madness in his eyes his hand shakes as he tears open one after another of these letters and dashes off a line of answer to each in an almost undecipherable scrawl racked by an incessant cough unable to speak articulately unable to swallow his food he had not in the middle of june the strength to leave or return to bed except by his friend's help when they told him he would die if he continued to work he replied what does it matter to their surprise he recovered as the summer drew on the misery of some who met with bertani's point-blank refusal to accept them as volunteers is depicted in their pious second appeals refusing to be denied meanwhile genoa was crammed full of volunteers who had been duly forwarded by their local committees or who had paid for their own journey thither on the chance of getting a passage to sicily all these complained bitterly if they were not shipped south by the very next steamer one important group of letters proves that bertani faithfully carried out garibaldi's instructions that officers of the regular army should be restrained from sending in their papers and men from deserting the ranks in order to join him garibaldi when he sailed for sicily had left behind him a proclamation exhorting italian soldiers to remain at their posts and bertani as we find had a formula ready drawn out to the same effect 
copies of which were stacked in his office when as often happened he received an application from some officer in the royal army desirous of joining garibaldi it was his custom to sign a copy of this formula and send it off to stop him he made some exceptions but this was his usual policy in spite of it many royal officers sergeants and corporals appeared in sicily not a few having been sent out by the cavourian agencies some had the tacit consent of victor emmanuel or of the military authorities who knew that garibaldi stood in need of drill masters but others risked and in many cases lost their careers without such a stiffening of regulars it is doubtful whether the volunteers could have conquered but if garibaldi and bertani had not done their best to keep the movement within limits the discipline and numbers of the royal army might have been dangerously weakened while mazzini was lying hidden in genoa secretly exerting through bertani and others an important influence on events the great exile who in the thirties and forties had raised the italian movement into a religion by which thousands lived and died had since eighteen forty eight remained behind in his old position while the national cause to which he had given the first vital impulse rallied under other leaders and moved forward to final victory he was out of touch with the new age even this year eighteen sixty which saw italy united in fulfilment of his dream dreamt thirty years ago seemed to him merely another chapter of national shame and weakness since the sacrifice of personal happiness was the soul of mancini's teaching and character there is artistic fitness in his lifelong disappointment and his old age though sad is far above our pity he would have been wiser as a statesman but less great as a prophet if he had reconciled himself to the monarchy and settled down to die content in the country which he had made a nation but as he wrote to bertani at this time after i have helped to make italy one under the king i shall go back to london and write to tell the italians that they are idiots he clung to his republicanism to his hatred for cavour's methods and of royal officialdom politically he erred but spiritually he thus found a means of telling himself the truth that the italians of the new monarchy were not the regenerated mankind whose immediate advent he had prophesied with shelley-like ardor in the great days of his youth i shall find no more joy in italy he wrote i shall have none even if to-morrow the unity were to be proclaimed from rome the country with its contempt for all ideals has killed the soul within me if he deceived himself it was never to gain soul's ease if it was delusion in him to believe that by calling their state a republic his countrymen could materially increase their own chance of being great and good yet there was spartan courage in his acknowledgment of the fact that the third italy was not the kingdom of god which he had set out to establish on earth he saw the kingdom of italy established instead and it pleased him not but if the reformation of human nature had failed the making of italy was a sufficiently remarkable feat as carlyle was driven to confess for all his scorn of mancini's doctrines it showed that the pre-scientific idealists of whom mancini and garibaldi were the survivors from an earlier age had a power over the springs of human action which the politics of materialism may despise or explain but can never imitate at the beginning of may mazzini had left london for genoa he came out intending to sail with garibaldi and the thousand but finding that they had left genoa two or three days before his arrival he determined not to follow i am tired he wrote of being misunderstood if i was to go to sicily now every one would say that i had gone to undermine garibaldi or god knows what besides as far as sicily is concerned it would be too late and for what we intend to try on the mainland i cannot hope to change garibaldi who loves me not mazzini's presence in his native city was a secret kept by a few friends he had to escape detection by the police for cavour would have been glad to deport or imprison him during the crisis 
he strolled about often by night and sometimes even by day through the deep narrow alleys of old genoa the scenes of his childhood and of his brooding student youth he had no disguise beyond a shaven chin and a low felt hat pulled well over his tell-tale forehead and eyes thus attired he amused himself by stopping cavour spies and asking them to lend him a light for his cigar or to tell him the way up to some familiar street by day he wrote notes to bertani by night he came to visit his sick-bed it was a delicate situation for bertani now being garibaldi's agent wondered how far he ought in that capacity to connect himself again with his old master his evident hesitation grieved mazzini who was already suffering from a political difference with aurelio safi his fellow exile in england once his fellow triumvir of the roman republic safi dearly as he loved mazzini did not feel justified in entrusting to him the expenditure of the money raised for garibaldi's expedition in great britain bertani however in spite of occasional misgivings fell once more under the spell of l'amico the friend as mazzini was called by the whole subterranean world of italian conspiracy indeed from the friend's first arrival in genoa in early may bertani entered with him into the great plan for invading the papal states it was the intention of bertani's committee and aid to garibaldi to send the volunteers whom they enlisted for his service not to join him at once in sicily but to meet him at naples going by the land route and liberating umbria and the marches from the pope on their way south the city and district of rome being garrisoned by french troops was to be avoided for the present but it was hoped that when garibaldi from the south and medici from the north had met in triumph at naples the enthusiasm for unity would overcome all obstacles and they would be able before the year was out to proclaim victor emmanuel king of italy from the capital this plan had not been entirely foreign to garibaldi's own intentions when he sailed for sicily with the thousand he had then assigned to medici the task of leading the next expedition instructing him to send reinforcements both to sicily and also to the papal marches and umbria where a rising was said garibaldi about to take place whether medici in person was to go with the reinforcements to sicily or with the invaders of the pope's territories was left undecided in garibaldi's letter such were the vague instructions which he left behind obviously requiring a good deal of interpretation bertani under the influence of mazzini decided to divert practically the whole of the reinforcements to the papal states neither of them military men they were both under the delusion that garibaldi could overrun sicily and cross the straits with his thousand alone aided by the islanders sicily is safe said mazzini let us think of the rest you do not know the genius of garibaldi and the indomitable determination of the sicilians to be rid of bourbon rule henceforth we must help sicily from central italy by way of the abruzzi garibaldi has within him a good body of officers who would suffice to drill and lead the sicilians to the centre every one umbria and the marches liberated we will reach garibaldi across the abruzzi the supposition that garibaldi could have advanced from palermo without strong reinforcements from north italy was perhaps the crudest of mistakes involved in this scheme and was moreover the only point where the scheme deviated from garibaldi's own instructions but it may be further doubted whether a few thousand volunteers under a chief other than garibaldi himself would have sufficed to liberate umbria and the marches mazzini told bertani that all would go well because the papal troops would join the liberators in the hour of battle but the pope's fighting regiments his newly levied austrian irish and french crusaders were about as likely to join the red shirts as the red shirts were to join them these papal troops were up a gallant through hopeless fight against the superior force of the piedmontese regular army in september 
and there is no reason to think that they would not have opposed a very serious resistance to medici's scanty volunteers in june even if victorious in the field how could an army of irregulars without siege guns take ancona but if the plan to liberate the marches and join garibaldi at naples was to succeed at all it must succeed completely and at once for not only the papal army but the foreign powers had to be considered austria who until eighteen fifty nine had herself garrisoned the marches for the pope and since the beginning of eighteen sixty been pouring into the port of ancona thousands of austrian subjects to be enlisted in the papal army would austria then have watched unmoved the capture of these districts by revolutionary bands and as to france even if medici had left rome untouched would napoleon have followed the red shirts to do to umbria in june what he allowed cavour to do in september on may seventh the day after garibaldi's departure medici still regarded the invasion of the papal states as his own probable destiny but when all these grave considerations the weakness of garibaldi's military position in sicily the strength of the new papal army and the old papal fortresses and the probable action of austria and france were laid before his cool judgment by cavour's agents la farina amari and melicini he was not long in deciding for sicily as early as may twelfth even before the news of garibaldi's landing at marsala had arrived medici had been won round to cavour and common sense and had declared that he would take his expedition by sea to join garibaldi the quarrel that divided mazzini and bertani's committee on the one side from cavour medici and the national society on the other arose on this question of destination of the volunteers not on the question of republic or monarchy on the latter point even mazzini had for the time being surrendered but on the former the quarrel was in full vigor even before the fall of palermo it first arose on the question whether medici should go to sicily or to the papal states and it was revived in the same form over the departure of every large consignment of volunteers that left genoa in june july and august if bertani's plan of invading the papal states had been carried out garibaldi would have been left locked up at palermo for want of men and italy would probably have met with a great disaster in the centre and yet bertani's policy though it would have been fatal if put into practice proved invaluable as a stimulus to cavour the constant threat of the advance party to send their own men into the papal states coupled with garibaldi's success in the south finally drove cavour to invade the papal states himself when the time was ripe mazzini and bertani wrong in detail were right in their own two general principles first that the pope and the king of naples ought to be attacked this year while the revolutionary enthusiasm created by garibaldi's success was at its height and secondly that they ought to be attacked from both north and south at once at present cavour was content to help garibaldi having won over medici to abandon the papal states and go directly to sicily in bertani's despite the government was bound to fit him out and send him with all possible speed medici's expedition and the expedition of cosenz a few weeks later were armed clothed and shipped at the expense of the Coverian national society and the million rifles fund these organizations had no offices in genoa the port of departure it was necessary for medici and cosenz to set up there a military office of their own as they did not wish to be dependent on bertani's committee dr bertani did however fit out the ambulance for their expeditions and both of them when they respectively sailed parted from him on speaking terms the bertani committee also supplied the military office of medici and cosenz with a good many of its best recruits in addition to the men whom the cavourians raised for themselves in milan and elsewhere 
but the steamers, the arms, and the money for the expeditions of June and July came almost entirely from the Covarian agencies. It was only in August that Bertani and his friends sent out the great expeditions which they themselves had paid for and equipped. In June and July, hundreds of thousands of lira were secretly supplied by the king's government to purchase the steamers and equip the men for Medici and Cosense. Over six thousand firearms were obtained for them by Cavour from the armory of the Million Rifles Fund at Milan, which had been closed to Garibaldi himself a month before by the inconvenient scruples of Massimo de Zeo, the governor of the city. Cavour now eased de Zeo's conscience by purchasing the weapons with the alleged intention of arming the National Guard, and then sent them to Medici at Genoa. In the course of the summer, de Zeo gradually discovered that he was being fooled. When in obedience to the ostensible orders of government, he tried to put difficulties in the way of recruiting volunteers in Milan. He found that all the neighboring governors gave him the cold shoulder. Finally, a private letter from a highly placed official to one of de Zeo's subordinates served to open the governor's eyes. It seems, said the letter, that at Milan you were not much in touch with the real intentions of the government. Finally, de Zeo retired, alleging the ground of ill health. To the end of his life he would never allow that Cavour's underhand methods had been right. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Garibaldi and the Making of Italy by George Macaulay Trevelyan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Garibaldi at Palermo. The reconstruction of his army. The advance through the island. Adio, mia belle, adio. La morte se ne va. Si non partisi anch'io, sarebbe una viltà. Farewell, farewell, my true love. The army's on the move, and if I stayed with you, love, a coward I should prove. The three steamers which were to carry Medici and his men to Sicily had been purchased from a French company, nominally on behalf of de Rohan, a Yankee devotee of the Italian cause. They had been hastily rechristened the Washington, Oregon, and Franklin, and the United States Consul at Genoa, accompanied by Garibaldi's Englishman, paired who was starting with the expedition, went on board the Washington and hauled upon it the stars and stripes. A little before dawn on June 10th, Medici sailed with the Washington and Oregon from a spot a few miles west of Genoa, where a midnight embarkation had taken place, and on the same day the Franklin sailed from the shore between Pisa and Leghorn, where she had taken on board the Tuscan volunteers. These two parts of Medici's expedition met safely at Calgary, the port in southern Sardinia, which became henceforth an important place of call for successive shiploads of Garibaldini. But two other vessels, the small Utile and the American clipper Charles and Jane, which were also expected at Calgary with another thousand men, were captured on the way by Neapolitan cruisers and taken into the harbor of Gaeta. Medici, after waiting for them for some time in vain, left Calgary with the Washington, Oregon, and Franklin, containing 2,500 men, 6,000 or 8,000 rifles and muskets, and an immense store of ammunition. This was the first aid dispatched to Garibaldi from the mainland. With the exception of 60 men and a stock of arms and powder, which the Utile, since captured by the Neapolitans, had run through to Palermo by way of Marsala, on an earlier and more fortunate voyage. Medici's three vessels left Calgary early on the afternoon of June 16th, shortly before nightfall of the following day, when they were nearing the Sicilian coast and entering the zone of greatest danger from the Neapolitan cruisers. They saw a Piedmontese war vessel steering towards them. When she came alongside, she turned out to be the Golnara, whose commander came aboard the Washington to speak with Medici. He had orders from his admiral, Persano, 
to conduct the expedition safely to castellamari the landing place agreed on between persano and garibaldi the commander of the gulnara also made in persano's name a strange request for the instant surrender of mazzini medici was able to assure him that although the republican alberto mario and his english wife jesse white mario were on board mazzini himself had not accompanied the expedition a few hours later they reached castellamare and began to disembark before midnight garibaldi came to meet them and they marched in high spirits to palermo arriving there on the nineteenth and the two following days just as the last of the neapolitan garrison took their departure under the terms of the capitulation the new era in garibaldi's enterprise had now fairly begun the demand made by the commander of the gulnara for the surrender of mazzini out at sea was the end of a curious story cavour who after the fall of palermo had adopted the policy of aiding garibaldi upon terms instructed admiral persano to lend him what covert help he could but at the same time sent out a confidential agent of his own to represent to the dictator of sicily the wishes of the government of turin cavour's choice for this purpose had fallen on the sicilian la farina president of the national society who like bertani had done much to bring cavour and garibaldi together in old days and like bertani seemed now to aim at undoing his own work he was already an object of dislike in garibaldian circles when cavour unwisely chose him for this delicate task those of cavour's friends who knew garibaldi foresaw inevitable disaster la farina arrived in palermo during the first week of june and began almost at once to quarrel with the new masters of the city he turned his reports to cavour into a series of bitter attacks on the dictator and his administration some just and some unjust but all calculated to alienate the two men on whose alliance the welfare of italy depended on june twelfth cavour misinformed by his spies at genoa as to mazzini's movements sent the following message to admiral persano we are assured that mazzini and mrs white jesse mario have embarked on board the washington that is taking volunteers to palermo send la farina to garibaldi to invite him in the king's name to arrest mazzini and to give him into your hands he must tell him that mazzini's presence in sicily would necessitate the recall of the squadron and ruin the national cause in europe you will send mazzini to genoa on board the carlo alberto should garibaldi refuse to have mazzini arrested you will immediately prepare to depart with the fleet and will send the othion to calgary to receive instructions this letter proves that there were limits to cavour's understanding of garibaldi though it was large compared with garibaldi's understanding of cavour it was an error to expect garibaldi to hand over to prison his former master and honored rival now in the decline of years and prosperity and a folly to enforce the demand by a threat to the liberator of palermo in his hour of triumph cavour had never had the chance of studying garibaldi and his friends at close quarters otherwise he would have known that garibaldi himself was above all things a gentleman and that mazzini was regarded by the whole world of exiles and advanced patriots even when they most differed from him with a reverence which to cavour was foolishness la farina flatly refused to carry out the mission saying that he had no influence with the dictator and compelled the admiral to take the message himself persano who was at this time popular with all parties was not ordered out of the room as la farina would probably have been but garibaldi replied that he would not arrest mazzini unless he began to intrigue against the monarchy of victor emmanuel persano fully realizing cavour's mistake in tactics determined instead of making preparations to leave palermo to effect the rest of mazzini before he landed in sicily that was why he commissioned the commander of the gulnara when he went to meet medici to make the arrest out at sea but since mazzini was all the while in genoa the incident ended in a fiasco 
the main object of la farina's mission to sicily was to secure the immediate annexation of the island to piedmont cavour was unwilling to allow garibaldi by prolonging his dictatorship to acquire a civil and military establishment of his own independent of the royal government it was necessary to send out arms and men to garibaldi but it was impossible not to dread some of the uses to which he might turn those arms and his own immense popularity surrounded as he was in great measure by the friends of mazzini and bertani by the marios by crispi by nicotera it was probable that while continuing loyal as ever to the monarchy he might grow less and less amenable to the advice of the king's ministers cavour was struggling to keep his feet in a flood of diplomatic troubles which garibaldi thought it unpatriotic even to consider and yet the dictator's independent actions were the prime factor in the diplomatic situation of which he ignored the very existence there were also grave political dangers of an internal character in a prolonged dictatorship cavour was endeavouring to build up the unity of italy on the only possible basis that of a constitutional monarchy and if the advanced parties were to get all the credit of the revolution in south italy and enjoy an infinite tenure of power in the provinces which they liberated it would be a bad beginning for the principle of authority in the new state as represented by the king's parliamentary cabinet at turin therefore cavour desired as soon as possible to dominate the revolution and like the falconer to lure his hawk back after it had struck the prey these motives and these principles of action were sound in themselves but there remains always the question of particular application if indeed the enemies of italy had already been struck down by garibaldi or if cavour had been prepared to strike them down himself in open war then no date would have been too early for annexation of sicily but the house of bourbon still reigned on the mainland and could be overturned by garibaldi alone when cavour attempted to obtain the annexation of sicily in june and early july he was acting on the mistaken belief that an annexationist revolution could be engineered by his own agents in naples he imagined that the rank and file of the neapolitan army was prepared to come over to the italian cause and that a civil and military pronunciamento would speedily bring the bourbon dynasty to an end by the act of the neapolitans themselves if such a revolution had been possible it would no doubt have been safer to dispense with garibaldi's further service as an independent chieftain and to bring him back to the place which he had occupied in the war of eighteen fifty nine as the leader of volunteers fighting in front of the royal armies of italy whenever they should next be led against pope or austrian but cavour had yet to learn by experience that neapolitans would effect no revolution for themselves and that as he was not himself prepared to declare war on francis the second garibaldi must be allowed to cross the straits of messina if italy was to be free if in june the dictator had yielded to the cry for immediate annexation which la farina stirred up among the sicilians the island would have passed officially into the hands of piedmont and before garibaldi had marched onward from palermo victor emmanuel would have found himself completely responsible to the powers for every act of every red shirt in sicily in that case garibaldi who even as it was came very near to being stopped at the straits of messina by the powers would almost certainly have been prevented from crossing to the mainland since cavour could no longer have pleaded inability to control his action then when the neapolitan revolution had misfired the great statesman would have discovered too late the flaw in his plans and the pope and the king of naples would have continued to govern central and southern italy all this was clearly foreseen at the time by not a few cavourians including michela amari the wise and learned historian of the sicilian vespers who was just returning from exile to his own palermo to work there for italian unity amari was certain that the dictator did right to refuse annexation in june because annexation would have confined him to the island 
but he was equally certain that he was wrong to refuse annexation when once he had crossed the straits for nearly a month la farina laid siege to garibaldi at his instigation petitions were sent up by sicilian ministers and municipalities and demonstrations were held in the streets of palermo which showed a genuine popular desire for immediate annexation the attitude of the islanders was neither that of cavour nor that of garibaldi they desired annexation at the earliest possible moment because they saw in it the best security against reconquest by the neapolitans and the quickest way to a settled government they cried italia una with no faint zeal when they saw their protectors the red shirts and hope for the bersaldry to follow as adverters of bourbon reconquest but they cared little whether the hated neapolitans were or were not brought into the union and only the more enlightened individuals among them strongly supported garibaldi's project of crossing the straits but while from these selfish motives they favored cavour's plan of immediate annexation on the other hand their devotion to garibaldi who had come to the rescue like a paladin of old was so powerful a compound of superstition with pure human gratitude and love that no difference of political opinion could wear it away as late as the middle of september when garibaldi was clearly wrong in delaying the annexation any longer he had only to come to show himself in palermo and although he was standing in the way of the popular desire all opposition was silenced in heartfelt shouts of welcome and applause when therefore in june la farina represented the island to cavour as being already on the point of a terrible explosion of popular wrath against the dictatorship he was writing nonsense such as only an angry man can write garibaldi said in effect to the people of palermo and to his sicilian ministers i know you desire to vote the annexation at once but i desire to free the rest of italy first i have freed you and in return i ask you to wait while i free your brothers fight first and vote afterwards they consented to wait less for the sake of their brothers than for the sake of the man who asked them this slight return for all that he and his thousand had done la farina in his letters to cavour not only represented the sicilians as more hostile to garibaldi than they really were but he also represented the island as falling into a state of anarchy whereas in fact the disturbance was merely such as war and revolution must necessarily bring in their train among a population accustomed to self-government bitter personal animosity to crispi garibaldi's factotum in the island goaded on la farina to these exaggerations the two sicilians were deadly rivals for the affections of their countrymen la farina was so far right that garibaldi was utterly unfitted to cope with any purely political or administrative situation or to bring order out of the chaos of revolution but the chaos was not of the kind which destroys society la farina was right in saying that annexation was desirable at the earliest date possible in the interests of administration in sicily and as amari pointed out the gendarmerie of north italy were the only force capable of restoring complete order in the island yet sicily continued under the garibaldian rule for nearly six months without any positive catastrophe nor when victor emmanuel's government took over the administration did the corvorians find it an easy task for ten years the island was in a continual state of unrest the hermit of caprera was the last man likely to succeed as administrator or politician beyond the life of the sailor the poet the farmer and the soldier in active service he understood nothing of the ways of men his friend and biographer has justly said finance police taxation law courts bureaucratic machinery were to him artificial and oppressive additions to the life of nature invented by the wickedness or craft of man if he could he would have swept them all away as he could not he resigned himself to submit to them but in his heart despised and abhorred them 
now for one holding these ideas it is not easy to govern states well or even to choose the best men to govern them and so it was with garibaldi one thing he saw with unerring vision during his dictatorship from his landing at marsala till his arrival in naples and that was that he must put off the annexation of the kingdom to the monarchy of victor manuel until the revolution which was to lay the foundation of italian unity had become an accomplished fact garibaldi endured la farina for a month and then his patience gave way he had always held high ideas of the dictatorial power in times of crisis when the freedom of the country was at stake he was determined to advance on naples and make italy and if cavour's agents strove to lock him up in sicily by arousing there a movement for premature annexation the man must take the consequences he decided to send him back to his master on july seventh la farina's house was surrounded by the police he was made prisoner taken on board the piedmontese flagship and handed over to admiral persano from whom la farina's captors had the impudence to demand a receipt for his person nor was this all a notice of his expulsion from the island was inserted in the official paper of sicily in terms of malignant insult la farina was spoken of as expelled with two other men gracelli and toti the three men thus deported said the official journal were in palermo conspiring against the existing order of things now griscelli and toti were two of the meanest of mankind who had narrowly escaped execution on a charge of plotting to assassinate the dictator and la farina had no more to do with them than he had with the beggars on the steps of the cathedral for the decision to deport la farina there was much to be said it restored political peace at palermo and cut short a controversy which could not safely be conducted in the face of the enemy who still had twenty thousand troops in the island but the manner of his deportation was most offensive and leaves a stain on the chivalrous character of garibaldi it is not known whether the details were planned by him or by some ill-natured follower but it is certain that he never punished or reproved the gross insult offered to the emissary of the royal government the expulsion of la farina from sicily and still more the manner of the expulsion embittered the quarrel of cavourian and garibaldian throughout the italian world but the nation as a whole with a political instinct inspired by the supreme nature of the crisis continued to regard cavour and garibaldi as partners in the great work the dictator had now cut the knot of sicilian politics and was free to advance across the straits if he had the military strength indirectly he had done cavour a service of which the latter was quick to take advantage the incident could be used as a proof to diplomatic europe that the royal government had no control over the dictator's actions cavour wrote hudson to lord john russell says that the government have no influence with garibaldi who has ordered la farina to quit sicily in spite of la farina and the vexed question of immediate annexation june and july were full of happy days for garibaldi for the sicilians and for the volunteers who came pouring in by every steamer from the north all classes of the population of palermo with priests and monks conspicuous among them trooped down to the harbour to work at dismantling the castel mari the fortress whence the bourbons had so long held palermo in awe the church in sicily lost none of its enthusiasm for garibaldi on nearer view the archbishop was friendly and even consented to bless the troops the nunneries of palermo where almost every noble family had a daughter shut up for life the enthusiasm for giuseppe and his young followers who had in several cases during the street fighting saved them from the brutality of the neapolitan soldiers was shown in many pretty and pathetic ways garibaldi writing to ruggiero settimo the veteran statesman of sicily's former revolutions described the feelings which he shared so fully with the people this brave people is free joy is written on every face the country echoes with the glad cries of the liberated garibaldi had good reason to be happy 
he was fulfilling by his own methods and with his own followers the dream of his life which had seemed foolishness to the wise the vision of all that he might some day do for italy had first risen before his mind's eye more than twenty years before as he rode over the pampas leading a few dozen partisans to nameless skirmishes in long-forgotten wars the vision had drawn near only to vanish again like a mirage on the walls of rome dim with fears of failure it had yet given him strength to endure the marshes of ravenna and in the trading vessels on the far-away pacific it had cheered his farm life at caprera with a steadier glow of hope and now all europe was watching this poet's daydream enact itself in the world of living men bixio and many other volunteers officers and privates wounded and whole lodged in the trinacria the famous hotel looking out upon the esplanade its host ragusa a worthy piedmontese announced that for thirty days he would dine any of the thousand for nothing but next year he told an english guest that there had not been a man of them but had insisted upon paying his bill the dictator and his aides-de-camp lived at the other end of town in the so-called observatory of the palace over porta nuova it had two balconies one looking eastward down the mile-long toledo to the sea the other westward across the concha de oro to the mountains above monreal its interior consisted of a modest hall of audience with the beds of the four officers on duty concealed behind screens in the four corners and two little bedrooms beyond for garibaldi and his secretary the manners and way of life of the dictator in the palace at palermo as afterwards in naples and caserta were in no way different from those on his caprera farm formality there was none important visitors were sent to him to have an audience whatever he was doing not infrequently they found him combing out his hair to which he still gave long and careful attention although the thick flowing locks which had adorned the defender of rome no longer fell over his shoulders on another occasion with more dispatch he evacuated his red shirt and gray flannels and retired into bed still discussing the business in hand with his astonished visitor the terrace roof connecting the observatory where the general lived with the main part of the palace was a rendezvous in the summer evenings for the principal garibaldini for the ladies of palermo and for the officers of the piedmontese and british navies eager questionings and endless stories about the battles and adventures which had led them thither so far were mingled with confident prophecies of the coming campaign all agreed that they would enter both rome and venice before the winter the perfumes rising from the gardens of the plain the sun setting behind the distant mountains where the thousand had suffered and fought the place the time the events produced a sort of delicious ecstasy which annihilated distances and transfigured facts nor was this a mere effect of the southern temperature for english officers shared those emotions those illusions those errors of enthusiasm among this happy crowd on the terrace appeared one evening like death at the feast a group of young men prematurely aged and bent looking about them with eyes that seemed to gaze without seeing they were the remaining eight followers of pisacani who had started with him three years before from genoa on his rash attempt to overthrow the bourbon power since their defeat and the death of their leader and companions they had lain in the dungeons of the island of favignana whence only six weeks ago they had seen through the prison bars the piemont and lombardo sail past with the thousand to marsala the revolution had now reached favignana and set them free and they had come straight to palermo to demand places in the forefront of garibaldi's battles the first person whom they met on the terrace was the long-bearded antonio mosto leader of the genoese carabineers as soon as he had recognized his friends beneath the changes that misery had wrought in them he granted them the privilege sought by many in vain of enlisting as privates in his little company that fought in the van of the army 
and bore the highest proportion of the losses they were taken into the observatory to see the general he was deeply moved this he said is a type of human life we whom fortune favored with victory lodge in royal places these brave fellows because conquered are buried in the vaults of favignana yet the cause the undertaking the audacity was the same the first honors are due to pisacani he led the way and these brave fellows were our pioneers their leader nicotera who had been pisacani's lieutenant was sent to organize the new expedition of volunteers preparing in tuscany where his incorrigible republicanism soon caused trouble the others marched with garibaldi and a few weeks later five out of the seven fell dead or wounded on the field of milazzo but the terrace and observatory were sometimes besieged by less disinterested visitors even before the capture of palermo was complete even before the bourbon troops had signed the capitulation no less than three thousand petitions for employment had been sent in each petitioner setting forth his own claims on the state in terms of fulsome panegyric if garibaldi had placed northerners in the governorships and magistries these duties might have been more effectively fulfilled but in so disposing of patronage he would have alienated the sicilians this must be remembered by those who criticize the undoubted maladministration under the dictatorship many of the better sort of sicilians especially the returning exiles retired into private life disdaining to advance their real claims on the state but the worst class of petitioners set upon him like yelping hounds he was utterly unfitted to choose among the pack the dictator says yes to everyone and leaves me to disentangle matters complained nievo the poet of the thousand now vice-intendant of the national forces in sicily every one makes court to me he wrote in disgust princes princesses dukes duchesses by the shovelfuls coveting salaries of twenty ducats a month on the civil side crispy made selection among his fellow islanders for better for worse garibaldi's only way of dealing with this foul levantine disease of state sycophancy was to apply the ineffectual remedy of his own example the dictator took ten francs a day for his civil list and did not add to it by any indirect means once when he burnt a hole in his clothes he was hard put to it for a change to alexandra dumas who had come over in his yacht to see historical romance in the living reality garibaldi said one day if i were rich i would do like you i would have a yacht dumas was much moved for he had just seen him sign a check for half a million francs of public money it was fortunate for garibaldi that north italy was so generous with the purse and that by one of his unusual pieces of luck he had captured from the neapolitan government an immense sum of ready money which had been called in for recoinage and lay in the mint at palermo for by the middle of july the sicilians had subscribed voluntarily no more than five thousand lira the british consul who had seen them win and lose their freedom in eighteen forty eight and eighteen forty nine observed the same characteristics once more passion wreaked on the statues of the bourbons and the stones of the castellamari flags shoutings bombastic processions but no foresight no fruitful fear of reconquest no general and public self-sacrifice since on this occasion they had north italy to protect them their sense of security was less ill-founded but garibaldi's edict of conscription remained a dead letter and he was soon induced by deputations from the upland communes to suspend it until the agricultural work of the year was over that is until the greek kalends most of the squadre or irregular bands of peasants went back to their homes before or after the capitulation of palermo but several thousands of sicilians volunteering for more regular service were formed into regiments and drilled by native by north italian and by english officers they proved far more efficient than the squadre 
and although the degrees of courage which they displayed in the coming campaign varied from time to time on the whole they did credit both in their own island and on the mainland to the officers who had in a few weeks knocked them into soldiers some of the upper class of the island behaved poorly refusing to serve unless they were at once given commissions although scores of the noble and wealthy families of north italy had sons doing the meanest duties of the camp and thinking a red shirt better wear than epaulets there were indeed many of the sicilian upper class who did their duty well but the island regiments consisted of the lower orders of the population to a greater degree than did the regiments from the north dune's english regiment in particular was largely recruited from the corner boys of palermo who under discipline and good influences behaved with marked courage in Milazzo fight many of these lads had passed a fortnight or three weeks in the garibaldi foundling hospital established and conducted on excellent military lines by alberto mario happy as they were in this institution they deserted from it fast to join dune's regiment because they were told that under milordo they would go sooner to the wars with garibaldi milordo himself was one of the most romantic figures in the garibaldian camp dune had a share of the mysterious power of nicholson or gordon to inspire confidence discipline and courage into untrained races he had commanded turkish levies for the british government in the crimea shortly before the capture of palermo he accepted at hudson's suggestion a dangerous mission from cavour and la farina to carry a political message through to garibaldi and to smuggle into sicily the cavourian agent Scelzi, disguised as his servant Scelzi and dune had landed in north sicily raised several hundred squadre of their own account skirmished with the bourbon troops and entered palermo at the head of their men a few days before the capitulation was signed dune then discarded his squadre and set to work to make a real regiment out of apparently unpromising material aided by windham an englishman formerly of the austrian army by a dozen civilians just come from great britain and ireland for love of garibaldi and some ex-sergeants of the piedmontese army he soon manufactured a force of six hundred young sicilians whom the dictator could have ill spared in the coming battle whatever his political errors garibaldi had a firm hold of the military situation and did not waste a day on june twentieth twenty-four hours after the departure of the last neapolitan troops and while medici's men were still arriving in palermo a column under tour started for the centre of the island with orders to march by way of caltanissetta to catania on the eastern sea the force when it left the capital numbered little more than five hundred men consisting chiefly of members of the original thousand together with a small company of foreign deserters from the bourbon army and a dozen sicilian gentlemen this brigade as it was called was the more formidable in report because of two obsolete cannon retrieved from the ignominious position of posts in the streets of palermo remounted and dragged across the island as artillery the foreign company had good enfield rifles but the majority of the force the remnant of the thousand still had their old bad muskets ammunition was procured on the way in the sulphur district of caltanissetta being the first column to leave palermo for the front tour's brigade created great interest it was accompanied by some of the best war correspondents in europe and by alexandra dumas with a female midshipman in tow the vain good-natured luxurious giant liked by some disliked by others and laughed at by all of his companions on the march left them halfway and returned to headquarters at palermo the expedition though romantic and picturesque was uneventful 
at Mary, the population which had shown fierce enthusiasm and sent its squadre for the attack on palermo when garibaldi passed that way three weeks before was found to be sullenly hostile because of the edict of conscription when they learnt that it was to be inoperative they recovered their cheerfulness and enjoyed the eloquence of garibaldi's friar father pantaleo which produced two volunteer recruits here tour fell dangerously ill and was forced to return to the continent for a few weeks to recover his health the command of the column devolved on his fellow hungarian eber who did not on that account give over his functions as times correspondent eber was a reserved and quiet gentleman known and respected in the english lake district where he had passed many years of exile and in the best london society he had neither tours military experience and vigor nor his popularity with the troops but he had an easy part to play and fell into no capital errors passing through the heart of the island by ena and the rock citadel of castro giovanni which commands the finest view in sicily eber and his men skirted etna on the south and entered catania unopposed on july fifteenth after misal mary they had been well received in most places with real enthusiasm and they had put down some incipient brigandage but they did not pick up many recruits in the course of their march from sea to sea on june twenty fifth less than a week after the departure of tours and eber's column bixio left the capital with another brigade of about twelve hundred men consisting partly of sicilians and partly of northerners under caldesi who had come out in medici's expedition passing through piana di greci where he enlisted sixty of the warlike albanians through corleone and by the temples of gergenti bixio reached the southern coast sailed along it from licata to terranova and marched thence straight across the country to catania where he joined eber's column in the latter half of july meanwhile as will be recounted in the next chapter medici with a far better organized better armed and better disciplined force was moving along the north coast towards Milazzo. this northern detachment could be most quickly supported by garibaldi himself with the reserves which he was busily forming in palermo the columns of eber in the centre and of bixio in the south were to a large extent stage armies not therefore the less effective in paralyzing the bourbon generals at messina garibaldi justly relied on the inactivity of those veteran warriors or else he would not have sent two weak columns to rome at large through the island and finally unite at catania not far from messina where lay fifteen to twenty thousand bourbon troops judged by the rules of ordinary war the division of the dictator's slender forces into three appears an absurd error but under the actual conditions he was justified in making the division because while the force with which he intended to strike home on the north coast was immensely the strongest and proved sufficient for its purpose the other two flying columns served to alarm the bourbon generals and to render them less willing to advance from messina and attack his real force in front of milazzo with the requisite vigor but the chief purpose of the columns of eber and bixio was not military but political they established the authority of the dictator in three quarters of the island they nipped in the bud the beginning of anarchy and brigandage they obtained several thousand recruits mostly after their arrival on the east coast and they set up before europe the claim of garibaldi to the real possession of the island but that claim had still to be made good in the battle of Milazzo. end of chapter three chapter four of garibaldi and the making of italy by george macaulay trevelyan this librivox recording is in the public domain the battle of milazzo who is the happy warrior who is he whom every man in arms should wish to be it is the generous spirit 
who when brought among the tasks of real life hath wrought upon the plan that pleased his childish thought whose high endeavors are an inward light that make the path before him always bright whose powers shed round him in the common strife or mild concerns of ordinary life a constant influence a peculiar grace but who if he be called upon to face some awful moment to which heaven has joined great issues good or bad for humankind is happy as a lover and attired with sudden brightness like a man inspired and through the heat of conflict keeps the law in calmness made and sees what he foresaw woodsworth by june nineteenth palermo and most of the other garrison towns in sicily had been completely evacuated but there still remained eighteen thousand effective bourbon troops in messina two thousand in syracuse over one thousand in milazzo and five hundred in augusta on the mainland there were some eighty thousand more of whom large numbers could be shipped to the island from naples in a few hours in these circumstances two rational courses were open to the royalists either a vigorous counter-attack might be made first on the columns which garibaldi was sending out from palermo and then upon that city itself before the three thousand north italian volunteers had grown to ten fifteen and twenty thousand or else the opposite course might be chosen a course less ambitious indeed but more consistent with the grant of the constitution and the new diplomatic attitude adopted towards france england and piedmont sicily might be written off as lost and the troops in it confined to garrison work within the sea fortress of messina syracuse milazzo and augusta these places if supplied and assisted by the fleet could not be taken by the means at garibaldi's disposal further fighting would thus be avoided in the island and a claim would thereby be established on the good offices of england and france the sea powers pleased at such moderation in the court of naples might not improbably use their fleets to stop garibaldi at the straits of messina with or without such aid the military defence of the new constitutional kingdom could be reorganized on the calabrian shore of the straits with the citadel of messina as hostage effectively held on the enemy's ground if logically executed either the offensive or the defensive plan had a good chance of success but since they were mutually inconsistent a clear choice had to be made between the two systems any compromise between them might easily lead to disaster the offensive system was favored by general clary in command at messina and by most of his subordinate officers by the king at naples and by those of his advisers who were still reactionary at heart but the new liberal minister and above all the new war minister general p n l wished to suspend operations in sicily and organize a diplomatic and military defense behind the straits the ministers had good reason to depreciate further hostilities for while a victory of garibaldi would overthrow the dynasty a defeat of garibaldi would overthrow the constitution and their own position depended on the maintenance of dynasty and constitution together while the ministers remained inactive and sought the ways of peace neither the king at naples nor the general at messina had the nerve to wage a vigorous offensive war in their despite but the reactionary party was not entirely without influence on events in june and july it had sufficient power in court and camp to sow distrust between the ministers and the crown and to initiate in sicily a feeble and partial offensive movement under colonel bosco of which garibaldi took advantage to escape the danger of an armistice to win the battle of milazzo and thereby to create the panic among the bourbon troops on the straits which enabled him to march almost unresisted to naples such in brief is the significance of the events narrated in this chapter general clary had distinguished himself on may thirty first in suppressing an attempt of some local squadre to occupy catania when immediately after his little victory he was ordered to abandon catania and retire to headquarters at messina he obeyed under protest as one of the very few generals who had shown any spirit during the operations in may 
Clary was in June promoted marshal and placed in command of the royal forces at Messina. A strong reactionary, he at once drew up schemes for the reconquest first of Catania and then of Palermo, and applied to Naples for approval. On June 25th, King Francis sent him orders to take the offensive in accordance with his own proposals. But the new marshal, on whose brave words the reactionaries had for some weeks been building their hopes, proved after all to be much of the same caliber as the other generals. For soon as he was ordered to advance, the tone of Clary's reports changed wonderfully. He began to write of the unfitness and unwillingness of his troops, of the necessity of remaining on the defensive of the probability that if he left Messina with a part of his force, Garibaldi would slip in behind his back, and as he slipped into Palermo behind the back of von Michel. But again, as soon as the ministry countermanded the advance and bade him remain on the defensive, Clary recovered his courage and complained bitterly that such orders dampened the spirits of his men. Meanwhile, King Francis was consulting his generals and ministers at Naples on a proposal to send strong reinforcements from the mainland to reconquer Sicily. In a council held on July 13th, the ministers opposed it, giving their voices in favor of armistice and diplomatic action, and their arguments were supported by Generals Nuzianti and Pianel, the two best soldiers in the service since Filangieri's retirement. The plan was therefore abandoned, and the next day Pianel, in a naval hour for his own reputation and peace of mind, was induced to become minister of war. An honest, cultivated, and high-minded man, true to the dynasty and to the constitution, he failed to see that the one could now be saved only at the expense of the other. He was fully persuaded that Sicily could not be reconquered. Perhaps he did not dare to ask himself whether he wished it to be reconquered. He maintained that the island had been lost because of the demoralized condition of the army, and that it would be his chief duty as war minister, while passively defending the straits, to revive the discipline and military spirit of the royal forces. A critic might have urged that the only way to revive their spirit would be to discard tricolor and constitution, and bid them march forward under the white flag of the Bourbons, with the king in their midst, as was afterwards done with some success at Capua, a few months too late. No troops could feel enthusiasm for the Constitution, and at the same time fight loyally against the man who was the cause of the Constitution's existence. But whatever Pianel's plan was worth, it never had a fair trial for on July 14th, Marshal Clary sent Colonel Bosco with 3,000 picked troops along the north coast from Messina, with orders to occupy the open country between Milazzo and Barcelona. This half-hearted measure, taken out of the knowledge of Pianel, had all the faults and none of the merits of the defensive plan decreed by the ministers, and of the offensive desired by the king. Bosco was the fighting man of the army, and the news that he had been sent into the open field with a force of his own was regarded by everyone as a bid for the reconquest of Sicily. Yet the actual orders given by Clary to the colonel on the day before he left Messina reflect the divided counsels of the royalist camp. In this document, Bosco was reminded that the ministry has forbidden any fresh attack to be made. He must therefore leave it to the enemy to begin the fighting but when attacked himself, he has the right to make a counter-attack and dislodge the Garibaldini from their positions. The object of the expedition is defined as being to guard the threatened garrison of Milazzo from a blockade, though in fact this end could have been far more simply effected by the use of the fleet. For this purpose, Clary advises Bosco to occupy Archie and certain other places some miles out of Milazzo. He is not to proceed farther westward than Barcelona, even if victorious, but is to await orders there. These instructions, which might be interpreted in many different ways, when thus placed in the hands of a spirited officer, were certain to lead to a pitched battle for when Bosco left Messina. Medici, in command of 2,000 Garibaldini, had already for a week made Barcelona his headquarters, 
and had been scouting with his friends on the mountains that tower above the plain of Milazzo. Giacomo Medici, who had held the Vacello for four weeks against the French army on the Janiculum, was the friendly rival of Bixio for the first place among Garibaldi's lieutenants. To him the general had entrusted the leadership of the most important of the three columns now advancing through the island on Messina, that one which was to keep the north coast and be supported in case of need by Garibaldi himself and the reserves from Palermo. Medici left the capital with 1,800 of the well-armed volunteers whom he had brought from North Italy, Simonetta's Lombards and Malachini's Tuscans. The general's orders were that he should occupy Castorial, a strong position in the mountains above Barcelona, and there await orders. But when he found the coast towns enthusiastic in the national cause, when he was joined by several hundred local volunteers and bands from eastern Sicily, he felt unwilling to retire into the mountains on Bosco's approach, leaving his hosts at Barcelona to the Bourbon vengeance. Such a retreat would inflict a wound on the growing prestige of the Garibaldian armies, which stood to them in the place of cavalry, artillery, and big battalions. In order, therefore, to protect Barcelona, Medici moved his headquarters to Meri, and there awaited the enemy's attack, drawn up behind the broad fumara, or turret bed of white stones, that passes in front of the village on its way from the neighboring mountain gorge to the sea. On July 15th, Bosco and his 3,000 approached by the high road from Messina to within a short distance of the Fiumara, where Medici's men lay eagerly awaiting them. The royalists, however, wheeled off sharply to the right and marched across the plain to Milazzo. It is possible that Bosco declined battle on account of his instructions from Clary not to initiate hostilities. On his arrival in the town, beneath the precipice on which the medieval fortress is perched, the inhabitants fled for refuge into the thick olive groves that cover the hills of the peninsula beyond, where they remained hidden during the events of the following week. Bosco and his army occupied the deserted town and put themselves into communication with the garrison on the castled rock overhead. Medici, encouraged by Bosco's refusal of battle, sent out detachments across the Fiumara of Mary to occupy Coriolo and Archie hamlets sheltered among the olives of the last foothills that overlooked the plain of Milazzo. Now one part of Bosco's instructions had been to occupy Archie, and therefore, in spite of that other part of his orders which forbade him to be the first to attack, he felt justified in recapturing Archie now that a Garibaldian outpost had occupied it, and thereby cut off his connection with Messina. He had passed through the village on the 15th on his way to Milazzo, but had neglected to leave any guard behind, and so, early in the morning of July 17th, he sent back across the plain four companies with cavalry and artillery, under Major Maring, with orders to retake Archie. The hamlet and surrounding hills were defended by three hundred Lombards under Simonetta and about seventy Sicilians. Maring skirmished for some time, used his cavalry well, captured a score of prisoners, and then unaccountably returned to Milazzo. Bosco placed him under arrest, and sent out in the afternoon six companies under Lieutenant Colonel Mara, who assailed Coriolo, and brought their artillery into action. Medici sent up two men from Mary, including Malanchini's Tuscans, and fierce fighting took place in the streets of Coriolo, and along the Fiumara, above which it stands. The street was taken by the Bourbon troops and retaken at the point of Bayonet, Mara's men tried to turn to Medici's flank by penetrating up into the mountains toward Santa Lucia, but they were headed off near San Filippo. At the end of an arduous day, Coriolo remained in Medici's hands and Archie in those of the royalists. But at midnight, Bosco, who had come out when the fighting was over to review the situation, ordered a retreat to the town. He had been persuaded that Medici had 7,000 men, 
whereas in reality he had scarcely more than two thousand all told although bosco's deserved reputation for courage saved him from wholly losing the confidence of his men his conduct on this day had been neither spirited nor wise he should have come earlier to direct the action himself and he should not have sent out such small detachments if he seriously intended to occupy the slopes of the mountains and so debar the further advance of the garibaldini along the north coast he had allowed medici to outmaneuver him to drive him down off the hills to get between him and messina and to lock him into the plain of Milazzo with his back to the sea the garibaldini were elated at their success and rejoiced over an intercepted letter of bosco's to clary written in the usual querulous style of neapolitan dispatches marine basically betrayed me i have him under lock and key i can't do more i'm left to do everything 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 the officers are so many nullities but if he were reinforced from messina either by sea or by land he boasted that he would enter palermo on medici's horse those of his dispatches which reached messina being signalled by semaphore were conceived in the same tone of complaint against his subordinates and demanded fresh men and fresh officers although in fact he had in the cacciatori the best regiments of the army the feeling of the fifteen thousand officers and men left idle in messina was that they ought at once to be led to the rescue of the gallant bosco who was far more popular than clary but the marshal who had already quarrelled with his subordinates at messina as well as with bosco himself sent him not the reinforcements which he demanded but a captain fonseca to make excuses and to explain that there were not enough horses carts or ships to carry an army by sea or by land to milazzo clary's inactivity was in part due to the telegrams which he received from the minister of war ordering him to remain on the defensive and denouncing bosco in the strongest language for having resumed hostilities but although medici had drawn a cordon around milazzo it was a very thin line and if bosco discovered that he was being contained not by seven thousand but by two thousand men he might attack once more in the telegram reporting to the dictator his success of july seventeenth medici begged for reinforcements nor had he long to wait some troops were already on the way on the eighteenth their march to Meri, dunes regiment of six hundred sicilians with its english officers and cosenz with the first detachment of the excellent troops whom he had just brought to palermo from genoa the dictator on receiving medici's telegram in the small hours of the morning of the eighteenth made one of those sudden resolves quick as the flash of a sword that with him always marked the end of a long period of suspense breaking through all his engagements in palermo and not even announcing his departure he went on board an old scottish cattle steamer called the city of aberdeen that had brought volunteers from genoa a few days before and happened to still be at the harbor at four in the morning he made arrangements for her use with her scottish crew and captain who were passionately devoted to his cause and person he instantly put on board the carabineers of the thousand and those of his aides-de-camp which he could muster at a moment's notice just as they were about to weigh anchor there happened to enter the port the steamer amazon from genoa bearing corte and his volunteers captured a month before in the charles and jane and now released from their captivity at gaeta by the constitutional ministers of king francis as part of the policy of friendship with piedmont they'd been sent back to genoa but had instantly sailed again for sicily in another ship on account of this adventure they were henceforth known as the gaeta battalion garibaldi ordered them not to land but to come on board the city of aberdeen the transfer of men arms and ammunition was effected in half an hour and about eight in the morning the cattle steamer left palermo with the whole expedition on board she was accompanied by the piedmontese war vessel carlo alberto under orders from persano to see them safely landed they disembarked at petit before dawn on july nineteenth leaving his men to march after him 
the general drove at a gallop towards Barcelona and Mary. At Barcelona, the principal church was employed as a hospital for Medici's wounded. As Garibaldi passed through the town, the noise of his reception in the street penetrated into the quiet of that gloomy hall, where a gigantic crucifix looked down upon the sufferers. In an instant they were struggling off their couches and crawling to the door on hands and knees. As they lay crowded on the steps of the church, he waved his gentle salutations and thanks to them, and passed on towards Mary. One young Lombard, who had been shot in the lungs, crawled to his bed again, fell back on it, and died. When Palermo discovered that the dictator had gone, the streets were filled with angry and inquiring crowds. His departure was a complete surprise. The Palermitans felt only half safe in his absence, and many of his old followers and friends were aggrieved because he had left them behind in the hurry of his departure. Such was the eagerness to follow him that in a few hours nearly all the North Italians in the Sicilian capital had thrown up the civil or military posts which kept them from the front. In many of these cases substitutes were found among the wounded, who were unwilling to remain in hospital at such a time. Those who could set out post-haste for Milazzo, and quiet was restored. There was little doing at Marie on July 19th. Medici and Cosenz were away scouting, and their men were eating their dinners in the filthy houses of the village, or beside the white stones of the Fumara, glowing in the midday heat, when an open carriage was noticed coming along the high road from Barcelona. As it drew near, they saw whom it contained. In an instant, all the camp was in an uproar. The uneaten dinners were left smoking, and the volunteers rushed to seize him as he stepped from the carriage. It was his official birthday, being celebrated at that hour in Palermo, with flags and speeches, but he had come to spend it among friends in the field. Confidence and joy were in his looks, and were reflected in the faces of the soldiers who pressed round him. They now knew that on the morrow they would fight and conquer. He did not linger in Mary, but took horse to find his old companions in arms, Medici and Cosenz, and to spend the rest of the day riding with them over the mountains of Santa Lucia, surveying through his spyglass the plain below, where Bosco was in the act of taking up a new and formidable position to cover the approaches to Milazzo. The plain of Milazzo is enclosed to the north and west by the two sea beaches that converge on the town and castle at the neck of the peninsula. To the south and east the plain is bounded by the white fumari of Mary, and of Corriolo, and by the low hills covered with olives that lie between the mountains and the plains. The ground on which the battle was fought, confined within a radius of a mile and a half from the southern gate of the town, was perfectly flat and almost on level with the neighboring beach. On this seaward plain stood farms, mills, and small hamlets, scattered about in a manner foreign to the interior of the island, where the whole population was housed at nightfall in hill towns of several thousand inhabitants each. These isolated houses strengthened the royalist position on the plain. The ground was occupied by cornfields and vineyards, or near the sea by breaks of cranes, seven feet high, used by the peasants for training their vines. The vineyards and cane breaks were enclosed by thick hedges of cactus, or by high white walls, which had been loopholed by the Bourbon troops. These were formidable barriers against an army of irregulars without artillery. The only way by which Garbaldi's men could pierce the enemy's lines without scaling the loopholed walls and hewing through the cactus edges was to charge along the two beaches, and along the various roads converging on Milazzo. But the roads and the beach on either side of the town were remarkably straight, and were swept by the cannon of the royalists. Against their eight excellently preserved pieces, the Garibaldini had nothing to oppose except two useless carronades, dragged about by hand, which were brought into action only to be withdrawn after a few minutes. The one road that was not straight enough to be swept by the Bourbon artillery was a sunk lane that wound through the vineyards. 
hollowed out by a watercourse that finally entered the side of the San Polino Road as a culvert, and issued into the sea under the main road, beneath a little bridge five hundred yards from the town gate. This bridge was chosen by Bosco to be the scene of the final stand outside the town, in case his more advanced positions were forced, and here two of the cannon were placed. Two more stood a mile from the front near the angle of the high road to Messina. Beyond this angle, the Bourbon left wing occupied the mills near the seashore, thus forming an advance post which could enfilade Garibaldi's advance against their center near San Polino. Their right was supported by the other four guns, which were placed at Casaza on the western beach. These formidable positions in front of the castle were held, according to Bosco's own report, by twenty-five hundred excellent Neapolitan cacciatori, the flower of the army, aided by the eight guns and a squadron of cavalry. In the castle on the rock overhead was the garrison, about one thousand infantry of the line and over forty cannon of different sorts, some of which were able to fire with effect towards the close of the day. In the peninsula behind the castle, Bosco had stationed another four hundred cacciatori to prevent a landing from taking place in his rear. The total of all arms defending these positions was reckoned by the Neapolitan staff at four thousand six hundred and thirty-six men and officers. Against this series of concentric lines of defense, culminating in the precipice and castle, Garibaldi was leading a force perhaps slightly larger in numbers than that of Bosco, but altogether inferior, if judged by the normal military standards. He had no cavalry, and until late in the day, no artillery. The infantry consisted of North Italian and Sicilian volunteers, hastily raised and regimented in so-called battalions of three hundred to nine hundred each many of which, like Cortes' new-landed Gaeta battalion, had handled firearms only during the last forty-eight hours, and did not know the elements of drill, while even Medici's and Dunes' men, who had had a few weeks' drill, did not know how to use the sights of their Enfield rifles. But in most of the battalions there was a large proportion of veterans of forty-eight and fifty-nine, of sergeants who had deserted, collusively or otherwise from the regular army and of officers of old experiences and in some cases of remarkable talent in revolutionary war above all the whole force was inspired by the ardor for their cause and for their leader which did much to take the place of discipline and made them ready to endure the very heavy losses without which even the first positions could not possibly have been stormed Shortly after the dawn on July 20th, the Garibaldini moved down to attack off the hills of the Olivarella and Corriello. In the center, San Pietro was occupied without opposition. On the east, Simonetta and his Lombards began their attack on the enemy's advanced posts at the mills, while on the other flank, Malincini and his Tuscans, marching through San Marco and San Marina, developed the attack on Cazaza and along the western beach. The day began with a disaster. Malincini carelessly led his men up to the mouth of the Bourbon rifles and batteries, which opened on them with terrible effect, and fairly drove them off the field. Garibaldi, who was watching the first stages of the fight from the roof of a wine store on the edge of the plain, sent Cosenz with fresh troops to rally the fugitives and to take over the command of the left wing. Nevertheless, the royalists, supported by cavalry and artillery operating on the broad beach, advanced and drove back the Garibaldian left and left center for nearly a mile. Although Malincini and many of his Tuscans returned to the fight, it was all that Cosenz could do to hold the Zerilli farm and the western approaches to San Pietro. The general himself, rightly confiding in the calmness, authority, and military talent of Cosenz, had not gone to rally the defeated left wing, but had bent all his personal energies to effect an advance along the other shore, at the head of the right wing under Medici. If he could penetrate by way of the mills, and the angle of the road as far as the bridge, 
he would be able to threaten the rear of the victorious advance of the royalists on the west which was in fact a dangerous move on their part at so early a stage in the battle garibaldi's method of sending troops into action on this day was to stand well exposed to the fire at some spot by which the next detachment would have to enter the battle and to speak almost in a whisper some word of encouragement to the young soldiers of whom many were then hearing the bullets for the first time in their lives in a small army of volunteers depending more on individual courage than on discipline the general's exercise of his strange powers of fascination considerably increased the chances of victory as one section of dune sicilians with their english officers and cadets filed by him into action up the ride of a crane break he kept repeating in a low voice avante coraggio uomini when the veteran company of gionese carabineers destined to lose nearly half their number before nightfall were brought about ten in the morning to the place where they were to enter the battle they found the general there before them standing almost alone in the middle of the road a conspicuous mark at which the enemy were directing their fire the first success of the day was the capture of the mills by the northerners of simonetta's and of specie's battalions it caused a severe struggle for bosco was there in person encouraging his men and he had skilfully placed two guns near the angle one on the high road the other in the mill lane the latter after doing great execution was captured through the devotion of a volunteer named alessandro pizzoli who leaving his comrades in ambush behind a wall flanking the mill lane himself sprang down a few yards in front of the cannon's mouth in order to draw its fire he was blown limb from limb and the next moment his comrades leapt down after him and captured the piece thus the royalists were slowly pushed back on the east flank from one vineyard and farm to another but the few positions gained by the red shirts seemed to many but little compensation for the long train of wounded continually passing to the rear for the suffocating heat the thirst the hunger and as the day wore on the sheer fatigue those who had no stomach for eight hours of such work went off with the wounded and forgot to return the better sort of men getting together in groups often irrespective of their proper battalions followed any officer with a turn for leadership whom the chance of battle brought their way scarcely ever seen the enemy through the cane breaks and behind the loopholed walls but always exposed to his shots firing only at close quarters making headway by rushes and rallies by dashes down the sunk lane here leaping over a wall and there tearing through a cactus hedge into the flank or rear of the enemy they carried on the battle which had now become a mere test of individual prowess and more and more as the day went on the general himself appeared now here now there heading charges which behind him never failed of success one of our countrymen a lad of seventeen who had left his home a few weeks before for love of garibaldi found himself with a few of his comrades from dunes and a number of men from other battalions standing at the end of a cane break through which the royalists were firing at them from behind a wall the bullets were crashing through the tall canes which snapped under the shower the men were falling fast the position was untenable suddenly the englishman was aware of garibaldi's galloping up to them leaping off his horse and without a word or look dashing up the narrow ride between the canes straight at a small opening in the wall lined by the enemy's rifles he did not once look round to see if his men were following for he knew that none who saw him would linger the bourbon stood to it to the last and the bayonet was used before the wall was cleared by a series of such charges bosco's cacciatori were pushed back well after midday to their last position outside the town there was a bridge over the culvert where stood the two reserve guns commanding the straight roads that converged on that spot close by on the shore was a large factory for pickling tuna fish here the crisis of the battle took place the general sent missouri to fetch up a detachment of dunes sicilians which had not yet lost its identity in the melee 
with these and some north italians under pilati bronzetti he passed through a garden climbed a wall and dropped down upon the two guns one was captured the other limbered up and escaped to Midlazzo. bosco ordered a handful of cavalry who were standing near the town gate to rescue the lost piece a score of them made a spirited charge over the bridge and dune's men scrambled out of the road to let them pass if bosco had followed up the charge with a body of fresh infantry he might have won the battle but his last reserves on this side of the castle had been used by colonel mara to support the advance of his right centre as the cavalry rode back from running the gauntlet through the garibaldian lines dune's sicilians emptied half a dozen saddles firing from behind the cactus hedge that lined the road but two men who had not taken refuge behind the hedge when the cavalry first charged by were still standing alone in the roadway on the line of their retreat of these two one was garibaldi the other was his aide-de-camp missouri a handsome young lombard of noted gallantry both were on foot and the horsemen unable to avenge their fallen comrades on any one else swarmed round eager to cut them down missouri shot the horse of the bourbon captain who rose in the stirrups as it fell and slashed at the dictator garibaldi parried the blow and laying his hand on the bridle of the kneeling animal struck the captain in the neck with his saber and killed him on the spot missouri with his revolver shot two more of the cavalry and the half dozen who were still left alive galloped back through the gates of the town the garibaldini now having occupied the bridge had turned bosco's left flank and were threatening his rear the rash advance of his right wing would have to be turned into a hasty retreat if the red shirts could maintain their newly won position that was indeed no easy task for the cannon of the fortress firing over the roofs of the town played full upon the bridge while the cacciatori below fired on it at close quarters from the town gate and from the houses along the side of the port garibaldi's men fell fast one of his best and most popular lieutenants migliavaca was killed and corte was wounded an attempt to bring the two carronades the only artillery of the force into action on the bridge proved that they were perfectly useless and in a few minutes the general ordered them to be withdrawn seeing that an immediate advance on the town was impossible he put most of the men for rest and shelter into the tuny factory and some wood stores nearby while others kept up a fire against the walls of Milazzo from the bridge and neighboring gardens and from behind the fishing boats on the beach in particular paired garibaldi's englishman whose long beard and fine head reminded his comrades of king lear kept his company of thirty men at the bridge suffering severe losses and demonstrating that colt's five-chambered revolving rifle with which they were armed leaked fire at the breach woefully scorching the hand that used it and had therefore no future in the history of modern armaments during two hours in the early afternoon the affair continued in this state the garibaldini losing men but holding the position they had taken and resting after the fatigues of the morning's attack having thus established his men on the bridge garibaldi left them under medici's command and rode off to deal with bosco's victorious right wing which was still pressing cosenz near the zirilli farm and san pietro for this purpose he made his way down with a few staff officers to the western beach found a small boat and rode out to the turkery a paddle steamer of four hundred horsepower carrying ten guns which had arrived on the scene that very afternoon from patti this vessel formerly the veloce of the bourbon service had recently deserted him at palermo and now composed his whole fighting navy over and above his transports and such help in convoy work as was afforded him by the piedmontese warships his aides-de-camp watching from the shore soon saw him swarm up the mast of the turkery to view the field taking her close in shore under fire from the guns of the castle he proceeded to bombard the enemy's cavalry on the western beach the victorious right wing of the royalists feeling the fire of the turkery from the west and learning that their rear had been turned on the east at length hastened to retreat 
this incident calls to mind the obvious truth that if the neapolitans had sent a part of the fleet to protect milazzo their fire would have rendered it impossible for garibaldi to occupy or even to attack the town cosenz and his men thus relieved by the retreat of their assailants followed up and joining with medici on the bridge stretched a line across the neck of the peninsula and invested the walls of milazzo next after garibaldi cosenz had borne the burden of the day he came of a french neapolitan family whose military and patriotic traditions dated from the days of the parthenopean republic of marengo and of marat but his friends said that enrico cosenz seemed rather to belong to some northern race for his manners were imperturbable in their calm he was modest and retiring to almost a fault he had been well called garibaldi's good angel in politics and war this thin quiet man in spectacles had restored the courage of malachini's routed troops and held them to their post all day now in the late afternoon he was standing close under the walls of milazzo in the hottest fire from the fortress wiping his spectacles with the deliberation of mr pickwick while a breathless aide-de-camp from garibaldi waiting for his reply to a message wished that he would either make up his mind more quickly or continue his meditations in a more secluded spot bosco still might have held out in the town with some likelihood of success by his own account he had lost not more than one hundred and fifty men a fifth part of the loss confessed by the victors but his troops were overcome with exhaustion and discouragement at the end of their brave but unsuccessful fight of eight hours under an almost tropical sun and the fear of garibaldi which bosco alone of the bourbon officers had for a while conjured away returned upon them like a fate he therefore marched his cacciatori up to the castle to join the garrison there leaving only a few soldiers to keep up a fire from the town walls when about four o'clock the garibaldini began to make their way up into milazzo creeping in first along the port side where the walls no longer existed they found to their surprise that the streets were empty even when they advanced to the upper part of the town no enemy was there although marksmen in the fortress overhead opened fire upon them and wounded cosenz before sunset the whole city was occupied and the entrances of the streets were barricaded against the castle garibaldi chose for his headquarters the steps of a small church beside the sea there he sat giving his orders propped up against his south american saddle which he always took off his horse with his own hands for a few hours at midnight he slept as he liked best to sleep with his head upon that soldier's pillow which had served him when youth and love were still his in lands where man needed only sword and saddle for the free rover's life upon the uplands End of chapter 4chapter five part one of garibaldi and the making of italy by george macaulay trevelyan this librivox recording is in the public domain surrender of milazzo castle the check at the straits diplomats and politicians garibaldi a una grande puissance morale il exerce un immense prestige non solamente in italia ma surat in europe si domaine j'entrai en lutte avec garibaldi elle est probable que j'usais pour moi la majorité des vecs de vec diplomates mais l'opinion publique européenne sera contre moi et l'opinion publique aurait rien car garibaldi a rendu la italie les plus grands services que un homme puis lui render il donna à l'italien confiance en eux même il prouva à l'europe que les italiens savants se battre et mourir sur le champ de bataille pour reconquérir une patrie cela ne pêche pas qu'elle ne soit ennement désirable que la révolution de naples se accomplisse sans lui cabor to an intimate friend august ninth eighteen sixty the castle of milazzo which garibaldi had yet to take 
rose between the two seas on a granite precipice more than three hundred feet high founded by the saracens improved by the normans and angevin it had been finely enlarged and beautified by the emperor charles v a place of importance throughout the middle ages it had in the war of the vespers been occupied by the sicilians and french in turn in sixteen seventy five it had successfully sustained a regular siege and in the wars of the early eighteenth century and again in the struggle with napoleon it had been occupied by the british and their allies the english cavalry barracks of fifty years back could be seen on the shore below when bosco held it against garibaldi it was as it still is today a spacious and pleasant place unlike some of the featureless castle prisons of the neapolitan mainland of which the very style of architecture seems to symbolize cruelty and crime below the fine medieval keep lay grass plateaus a quarter of a mile broad and long enclosed by the outer works of charles v hence the defenders could view the calabrian coast the lapari islands and the eternal smoke of stromboli the gulf of Milazzo, where duilius with his grappling irons destroyed the fleets of carthage and made rome mistress even of the sea the plain where garibaldi had just triumphed in conflict man against man the bare mountain ridges stretching away towards the hidden messina and near at hand a profusion of cactus fig trees and shrubs clinging to the precipices of the castle rock in the silent midday heat the stronghold gives the impression not of decay but of long unbroken peace its defences if antiquated were in good repair and could only be breached by a siege cannon which garibaldi did not possess to defend such a place against irregular troops would have been an easy and even pleasant task if bosco had taken care to lay in provisions while his communications were still open but there was little food and that bad the water stank and the dirty habits of more than four thousand soldiers who would not even take the trouble to bury the corpses of man or beast soon rendered the whole of that large area unsanitary the royalists had fought well in battle but defeat had destroyed their discipline and when they were put on half rations they muttered threats about opening the gate at the first sound of mutiny the fighting colonel himself lost his nerve and began signalling to messina the tale of his distress in messages on the semaphore which garibaldi and his officers read with delight he enlarged on the state of the provisions and water he complained that the enemy had in the last twenty-four hours shot one man dead on the ramparts besides wounding eight men and three mules he declared that a breach for a storming party could be made in a few days the latter proposition was undeniable as a piece of abstract military theory for the windmill hill whence the garibaldini were sniping was only five hundred yards away and was on a level with the lower parts of the castle but the practical inference was nil because the assailants had no breaching cannon and the fortress was defended by forty pieces the morale of the troops so ended bosco's tale of woe is destroyed and so he might have added was that of their commander who could no longer distinguish between real danger of starvation and imaginary dangers of storm and battery on july twenty first marshal clay held a council of war at messina his subordinates hated him and one another and the prevailing sentiment at the council was each man's desire to throw upon his neighbor the responsibility for disasters present and to come the sense of the council of war appears to have been that they were bound in honor to march at once to relieve bosco but that there were not enough horses and carts for the transport service and that a column of garibaldini advancing northwards from catania would step into messina if any part of its garrison of fifteen thousand were rashly sent to milazzo this fear was somewhat out of place since eber's column at catania as yet barely numbered one thousand men and only two or three hundred had been sent as far north as taormina but this trivial reconnaissance as clary's own dispatches show seriously affected his decision not to move to the help of bosco once indeed on july twenty second clary ordered three regiments to embark and signalled to bosco that they had already sailed to his relief 
but in a few hours he countermanded the movement either from fear of the garibaldini at taormina or else in obedience to orders from the war minister pinel when the first news reached naples that bosco's force was shut up in milazzo pinel much as he wished to suspend all hostilities felt that he must extricate the rash colonel before resuming the defensive he therefore ordered a large expedition to be put on board the fleet in the bay of naples to sail to the relief of milazzo but the fleet more liberal in political sentiment than the army refused to take the troops on board and the mutiny was encouraged by the admiral count de aquila the king's uncle the case was brought up for discussion before the ministers into whose willing ears de aquila poured such effective arguments against the resumption of hostilities in sicily that they decided to send instead of a relieving fleet and army empty transports to fetch away bosco and his men following the transports they dispatched a large part of the fleet with a colonel anzani on board whose instructions from pinel were to negotiate the capitulation both of milazzo and of the garrison of messina but clary as soon as he was assured that the ministry did not require him to relieve milazzo again assumed the part of a grieved hero and refused to evacuate messina on any account on july twenty third the approach of the neapolitan war vessels to the port of milazzo caused some anxiety among the volunteers if the town were bombarded from the sea it would be necessary for them to retire and to lose the fruits of the victory which they had so dearly bought garibaldi as usual showed a bold face and fitted up a battery on the mole with cannon landed off the tucuri the newcomers however proved to be intent on more charitable thoughts colonel lanzani and the dictator soon signed a treaty of capitulation by which the troops in the castle were to march out with their arms and half the battery mules the cannon and ammunition of the castle the rest of the mules and all the horses were to be left behind for the conquerors bosco had boasted that he would enter palermo on medici's horse so garibaldi had determined that medici should enter messina on bosco's horse as shortly afterwards took place on the morning of july twenty fifth when the bourbon troops were to march out of the castle the piedmontese fleet appeared in the offing admiral persano seeing neapolitan warships lying off milazzo ordered his decks to be cleared for action presumably intending to save garibaldi from bombardment even at the cost of a rupture with naples when he found how peacefully matters had been settled he contented himself with embracing the dictator and congratulating him in the name of victor emmanuel on his fresh victory for the common cause the bourbon troops filed down to the point of embarkation with the honors of war between two lines of ragged volunteers although they had full opportunity to desert they were loudly invited to fraternize and to join the army of true italians few except among the artillery answered the appeal at the tail of the column walked bosco guarded as a prisoner fuming and pulling at his moustache he was hissed by the townspeople who were beginning to return to their houses from their hiding-places in the peninsula it was an unpleasant scene and moved the garibaldini to sympathize for bosco in spite of his hectoring manner which did not desert him in this dramatic exit from before the footlights of history it soon became known why garibaldi had caused bosco to be placed under arrest during the embarkation when paired with a few of his fellow countrymen and others went to take possession of the abandoned castle they found the mules which had been surrendered under the capitulation lying about dead on the turf and many of the guns spiked they luckily detected before they had trodden upon it a train of gunpowder hidden under straw thickly strewn with detonators and running under the door of a magazine which was intended to blow the citadel and its new occupants sky high when garibaldi accompanied by admiral persano and the marios came up to the castle they found bosco's horses abandoned and frightened running round and round the grass plateau of the outer enclosure the dictator took his lasso and amused himself and his companions by a display of the skill which he had acquired in south america more than twenty years before alberto mario and his english wife jessie had arrived from palermo in pursuit of the army 
they found a number of truants from their garibaldi foundling hospital enlisted in dune's ranks half a dozen of them badly wounded although they had run away from the institute they had not run away from the rifles of the cacciatori one little wounded sicilian apologized to mario stroking his hand as he said are you angry with us signor commandante so many of our brigade are wounded and killed milordo the colonel says that after the battle of malazzo no one can say again that the sicilians never fight another boy of twelve suffered amputation sitting in the lap of jesse mario who said that she cried more than he did these young scamps off the streets of palermo were not the only class who behaved admirably in the hospital throughout the campaign in the ill-equipped ambulances without chloroform or proper dressings the silent endurance of pain by italians of sensitive and cultivated natures aroused the admiration of british military men the terrible and partly unnecessary sufferings to which the patriots were exposed by the absence of proper provision never moved them to indignation or even to complaint they would bear anything for italy and for the general in Milazzo, where lay half the men wounded in the recent battle there was no straw to fill the bed ticks which the marios had brought from palermo at barcelona which took in the remaining three hundred the inhabitants were more active and things went better both here and later on at naples and caserta that excellent creature of the lord jessie white mario as one of her patients called her did her best to be the florence nightingale of the campaign though she had no staff of trained nurses fanatical in her republicanism lacking in toleration and in charm of manner she had the spartan virtues of her creed and a power of complete self-sacrifice which she had learnt perhaps from her friend and master mazzini she was equally the friend of garibaldi who knew well how much he owed to jesse and how many of his best followers were saved by her ceaseless exertions superficially at least there was little in common between this lady of fixed and fiery faith and the comfortable citizens of her native land but they were too ready to praise her when they heard how she had attended the wretched pallets of hundreds of wounded italians who blessed her in their pain and her country for her sake desiring to take advantage of the enthusiasm for his cause prevailing in england garibaldi while still quartered in the castle of Milazzo, consulted his british companions in arms who had borne themselves so well in the battle as to the possibility of raising more of their compatriots to come out and join him on the neapolitan mainland the idea was suggested to him by hugh forbes a gentleman who wearing a white top hat had shared the perils of his retreat from rome to the adriatic in eighteen forty nine in the interval between the two italian revolutions forbes had been in the united states where he had had some peculiar dealings with old john brown previous to the virginia raid he now appeared at Milazzo. garibaldi fell in love with forbes proposal that a british legion should be raised but refused to give him the command and left him behind as governor of Milazzo castle the scheme aroused little enthusiasm among those who would have been best qualified to carry it out mr dalmage who was a british officer on leave from malta refused to touch it and dune himself who had quarrelled with his countrymen when he left the queen's service angrily declared that he did not want any more of them out there he prophesied that a whole regiment raised at a few days notice among a civilian population and shipped to a strange land would contain good elements but that for discipline reasons it would be more trouble than it was worth during the short period that the war was likely to last but garibaldi though he knew that the british legion would not come in time to be of much assistance in the neapolitan kingdom looked forward to a campaign in the papal states and to the capture of rome he therefore sent to england as an agent for the raising of the legion a certain styles who had behaved well in the battle of Milazzo, but turned out no better than he should be and soon fell out with the disinterested committee who took up the project in london it was now evident that there would be no further fighting in sicily since marshal clay and his fifteen thousand at messina had not moved to the relief of Milazzo they certainly would not take the field on their own account now that it had fallen 
Garibaldi's way lay open down to the shore of the straits. Medici, duly mounted on Bosco's horse, led the vanguard into the streets of Messina, and on July 28th he signed a treaty with Clary, by which the citadel was to be held by the royalist garrison and the town by the Garibaldini. Hostilities between them were to be suspended by sea as by land, so that the citadel, which completely dominated the entrance of the harbor, might not fire a shot at the dictator's vessels, even when they sailed out under the muzzles of the king's cannon to invade his Calabrian provinces. Such a treaty, exhorted without bloodshed from fifteen thousand men in an impregnable fortress, was a great advantage for the inferior forces of the volunteers, who would have had much difficulty in entering the streets of Messina if Clary had resisted their approach on the mountain ridges above the town and in the forts designed for its protection nor could they have remained in messina if the citadel had been free to open fire the terms of this treaty are a measure of the panic struck into the heart of the royalist troops by the defeat of bosco and a measure also of the ardor with which the neapolitan ministers desired to avoid further fighting in the island the greater part of the garrison were now withdrawn from the citadel of messina to the mainland during the anxious month that followed the battle of Milazzo, the politics of Europe turned on the question whether Garibaldi could succeed in crossing the straits. Would the naval powers interfere to prevent him? And even if they did not, could he cross in the face of the Neapolitan army and fleet? The diplomatic part of the question was destined to be settled in a few days by the secret activities of Cavour. He was now fully determined to acquire the Neapolitan kingdom for Victor Emmanuel, if possible without, but if necessary, with further aid from Garibaldi. On July 14th he had still believed that he would be able, before Garibaldi could leave Sicily, to engineer a revolution in Naples by means of the agents whom he had sent there. At the critical moment the Piedmontese fleet was to appear in the bay. Sanguine of Success he had written to Admiral Persano, We must at all costs, on the one hand, prevent Garibaldi from crossing the straits, and on the other, excite a revolution in Naples. If this were to succeed, the government of Victor Emmanuel would at once be proclaimed there. In that case, you would immediately sail with your whole squadron for Naples. The plan presupposed some active disloyalty in the army and some power of initiative in the inhabitants of naples neither were forthcoming a week after he had written this letter to persano cavour had become so far doubtful of his ability to provoke an internal revolution that he decided to clear the way for garibaldi's passage of the straits his earnest wish to forestall the dictator at naples no longer blinded him to the fact that the advance of the red shirts might prove after all the only means of disposing of the house of bourbon he continued indeed until after the middle of august to work and hope for a wholesale desertion of the neapolitan army to the national cause which would remove the need for garibaldi to cross the straits and would place all authority at both ends of the peninsula in the hands of the ministry at turin but meanwhile not allowing himself to be duped by these golden hopes cavour entered into a conspiracy with victor emmanuel to open garibaldi's way before him in spite of the threats of european diplomacy to which it was necessary all the while to appear subservient the king and his minister while publicly requesting the dictator to halt, secretly urged him to advance. And while not daring to dispute, through regular diplomatic channels, the proposition that he ought to be stopped at the Straits, they dissolved by a hint to England the concert of naval powers that was being formed for that purpose. These two pieces of secret service, Count Leta's mission to Garibaldi and Sir James Lakita's mission to Lord John Russell, have only recently been established as certain historical facts. Their importance in the history of the crisis that made Italy is very great. At four o'clock on the evening of July 22nd, Count Lita Modigianani came by appointment to the palace at Turin to receive from the king's hands a written message which he was to take to Garibaldi. Victor Manuel first gave him a letter requesting the dictator not to cross the straits, 
the ostensible royal message published to the world to allay the threatenings of France. But here, said the king to Count Lita, is a second note which you will at once administer to Garibaldi to neutralize the effect of the first. So saying, Victor Emmanuel handed over a letter containing the following words in his own handwriting. Now, having written as King Victor Emmanuel, suggest to you to reply in this sense, which I know is what you feel. Reply that you are full of devotion and reverence for your king, that you would like to obey his counsels, but that your duty to Italy forbids you to promise not to help the Neapolitans when they appeal to you to free them from a government which true men and good Italians cannot trust, that you cannot therefore obey the wishes of the king, but must reserve full freedom of action. With these two missives in his pocket, Count Lita left the royal presence. The same day he saw Cavour and Farini, who chafed him on the Garibaldian part he was about to play. He sailed to Palermo and thence to Milazzo, where he arrived on the morning of July 27th, just in time to catch Garibaldi, before he started to overtake Medici and the vanguard at Messina. As soon as they were closeted together, the king's messenger produced the two letters in their order. At the second, delivered by Lita, with sly excuses for the first, Garibaldi burst out laughing. He rose at once and went into his bedroom, where Sertori and Tricci and others were talking so loudly that he was forced to say, "'Gentlemen, I have got to write a letter. Please don't make so much noise.' So saying, he sat down and wrote his answer to the king, which thrilled the heart of Italy in the ensuing weeks. "'Sire,' he wrote, your majesty knows the high esteem and love i bear you but the present state of things in italy does not allow me to obey you as i should have wished called by the peoples i refrained as long as i could but if now in spite of all the calls that reach me i were longer to delay i should fail my duty and imperil the sacred cause of italy allow me then sire this time to disobey you as soon as i shall have fulfilled what i have undertaken by freeing the peoples from a hated yoke, I will lay down my sword at your feet and obey you for the rest of my life. Lita hastened back to Turin, the public bearer of his famous reply, but the world knew nothing of the other document which he safely carried back, the king's original draft, of which the dictator's answer was but a paraphrase adorned with a few Garbaldian touches. That most compromising of documents has just come to light after a discreet interval of fifty years. It was easy thus, while saving appearances, to make sure that Garibaldi would obey the law of his being and go forward as fast and as far as he was able. But to prevent the maritime powers from stopping him at the straits was a harder task. For the moment, little was to be feared from Austria, alienated as she was from the government of naples by the nature of its appeal to england france and piedmont the diplomatic representatives of naples did not hesitate to allege that if the western powers would force a six months truce upon garibaldi their country would be able to hold the elections to her new parliament and would lend her regular army as soon as it was required for the inevitable war against austria in venice though such promises were only the result of abject fear and were unlikely to be fulfilled they caused irritation if not alarm at vienna and postponed the season of austrian intervention napoleon on the other hand at that moment desired to preserve the bourbon dynasty on the mainland as a constitutional state under french direction far more ardently than he desired a month later to preserve the pope's adriatic dominions he was therefore most anxious to stop Garibaldi at the Straits, but he was no less anxious to preserve good relations with England. Both these objects could be achieved by a naval combination of France and England to hold the Straits of Messina against the passage of Garibaldini, and this was proposed by the French ministers to Palmerston and Russell. Lord John, in his English simplicity, supposed that victor emmanuel and cavour meant what they said when they declared against garibaldi's invasion of calabria and no doubt felt that he could best serve italy by acting in accordance with the publicly expressed wishes of cavour 
the british ministers therefore were not indisposed to listen to the arguments of napoleon when he proposed that england and france should send the two greatest fleets in the world to protect the calabrian coast against the red shirts details as to the number of ships to be employed were actually arranged at naples between king francis ministers brenet and the french admiral the final consent of the british cabinet had yet to be received but if palmerston and russell fathered the scheme it would meet with no resistance from their colleagues who except gladstone were less enthusiastic than they in the italian cause it was a moment full of danger but cavour was warned just in time of the blow which the extreme subtleness of his policy was preparing for him in the house of his friends the warning came it is said through an indiscretion of one of his worst enemies the story goes that the french empress in conversation with nigra the piedmontese representative of paris let drop a hint of the negotiations with england that nigra extracted the whole truth from her by pretending to sympathize with the project and sent the news on to turin cavour greatly alarmed went straight to the british legation and asked hudson point-blank how to prevent russell from being made an unconscious agent in the ruin of italy's best hopes hudson happily inspired advised cavour to send sir james lakita the intimate friend of the russell family to explain the real situation to lord john giacomo lakita a gentleman of apulia and a lawyer of naples had in eighteen fifty been mr gladstone's political mentor during his famous visit driven into exile for this he became naturalized in england and was knighted as sir james lakita for public services rendered to his adopted country in july eighteen sixty he was engaged in examining the candidates for our indian civil service on the twenty-third the rain of an english summer's day gave him a severe cold and to further his distress as he noted in his diary he heard that a special neapolitan envoy la marquis de greccia had arrived in london and had been closeted with lord john on the next day tuesday july twenty fourth he spent another chilly morning examining the young men viva voce came home exceedingly ill and took to his bed he was called up by an unexpected visit from Emmanuel de Azeglio, the Piedmontese minister in England, who, in obedience to Cavour's message, came to request La Quieta to go at once to Lord John and put him on his guard against an application he would receive for intervention to force an armistice on Sicily. In spite of his illness, La Quieta dressed again and disregarded the protests of his family dragged himself into the streets to obey the orders of cavour and as it chanced to bring about the making of italy arriving at the russells town house he rang the bell the servant who appeared knew him well as a friend of the family the conversation that followed was to this effect is lord john at home not at home sir james is he out or only busy he's engaged most particular sir james with the french ambassador i have turned away the turkish ambassador and i have strict orders to let in no one except the minister for naples there's no time to lose thought laquita and then inquired is lady john at home then she is in bed sir james ill then laquita took out a card and wrote upon it for the love you bear the memory of your father see me this instant and sent up this strange message to the lady of the house in a few minutes he was by her bedside he persuaded her to send down to her husband the simple message come up at once thinking to find his wife suddenly taken worse lord john left persini the french ambassador sitting there rushed upstairs opened the door of the bedroom and found himself face to face with laquita it was no time for apologies or explanations in a flood of impassioned words the apulian poured forth his soul to his english friend was eighteen forty eight to be repeated then sicily had revolted then england and france had helped to prevent the sicilians from invading naples and then sicily had been reconquered if garibaldi crossed now italy would be made if he was stopped division reaction and disaster would ensue as before 
did lord john wish to be for ever loved or for ever hated by liberal europe a violent paroxysm of coughing shortened his eloquence but he had said enough to show lord john what cavour wanted england to do go to bed he said to laquita and don't be so sure that i'm going to sign that treaty yet russell's mind was well prepared for these ideas for during the summer his wife had received letters from her neapolitan friend poerio urging that the bourbon must be dethroned and italy made now or never and for a fortnight past hudson and Elliot themselves new converts had been preaching the doctrine of complete italian unity in their private letters to the foreign minister going downstairs lord john presumably put off persini with what excuse he could for two hours later he sent round a messenger to laquita to tell him to be of good cheer and at the cabinet held on the afternoon of july twenty fifth it was decided to reject the french proposal with regard to coercing garibaldi persini was amazed at the volteface of the british ministers for as he himself tells us he had obtained lord palmerston's promise to join in stopping garibaldi on july twenty sixth lord john wrote to our ambassador at paris a dispatch suitable for publication no reader of which would ever guess that the majestic current of british foreign policy had just been deflected from its course by one of the civil service examiners i informed m de persini writes russell that her majesty's government were of the opinion that no case had been made out for the departure on their part from their general principle of non-intervention her majesty's government had only come to this conclusion within the last forty-eight hours that the force of garibaldi was not in itself sufficient to overthrow the neapolitan monarchy if the navy army and people of naples were attached to the king garibaldi would be defeated if on the contrary they were disposed to welcome garibaldi our interference would be an intervention in the internal affairs of the neapolitan kingdom this was sound doctrine to come to the point if france chose to interfere alone we should merely disapprove her course and protest against it in our opinion the neapolitans ought to be masters either to reject or to receive garibaldi napoleon was not prepared to take a course against which england would protest and the project of foreign intervention fell dead garibaldi had no longer anything to fear from the french and british fleets but he still had before him a military operation of immense difficulty to cross the straits of messina through the midst of the neapolitan fleet and to land on the calabrian coast in the face of the neapolitan army the modern odysseus stood on the sandy cape of charybdis and gazing across at sia's now castled rock bethought him of his many devices other heroes had striven in vain to become masters of this event half a century before the generals of the great napoleon including marat himself had been baffled by this same strip of sea two miles wide at the narrowest point which had guarded sicily from the french as safely as twenty-one miles of northern ocean had guarded from them a more favored island End of chapter five part one Chapter Five, Part Two of Garibaldi and the Making of Italy, by George Macaulay Trevelyan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Surrender of Milazzo Castle, the lighthouse which gives its name of Ferro to the Cape of Caribdis, and an old fort and battery by its side, stand at the end of the spit of sand where the north and east sides of the Triangle of Sicily unite on the sand dunes behind the lighthouse the greater part of the garibaldian army was bivouacked during the first three weeks of august the depth of the water round the cape which enables the tuny fishers to row their boats within a few yards of the pebbly shore made it an excellent place for a great embarkation two salt-water lakes near at hand gave safe harborage to the larger transports and to rafts which were being constructed to take across horses and cannon while the flotilla of small boats which garibaldi collected from messina and the neighboring fishing villages were drawn up along the beach of the sea 
the mean houses of faro village afforded useful shelter it was on these sands that the british had been encamped fifty years before and the remains of their trenches could still be seen garibaldi had three new earthwork batteries erected where he mounted some indifferent cannon taken off his only warship the torquery and from the castle of Milazzo. with these and the three small cannon in the fort beside the lighthouse he made pretense to command the sicilian side of the narrow waters on the roasting sand between the lighthouse and the lakes the volunteers lay encamped day after day amid scenes of nature and of man very different from the rainy streets of london and the dim rooms of chesham place where their fate had just been decided the crowded quarters soon became insanitary the food and water were insufficient on the open sands the sea mist soaked them by night and the sun scorched them by day and there was little to relieve body or soul except constant bathing in the sea drilling and guessing how the general meant to carry them across among garibaldi's own retinue the gaiety of the days in palermo palace and the lazzo castle had given place to a more serious mood their chief was silent for hours together passing about between messina and the faro sometimes mounting the lighthouse to watch the coming and going of the bourbon ships sometimes vanishing no one knew whither concealing even from medici the plans that engrossed him all day long but keeping his telescope ever directed on the calabrian shore the eyes and thoughts of all men were fixed on the coast opposite so near and yet so far the ground whence one could march to naples to rome to venice the toe of italy has for its bone the enormous granite mass of aspromonte the rugged mountain of which the plateaus and spurs clothed in forests of oak pine and chestnut and cut by deep canyons each paved with a dry fumara of stones washed white by flood run down to the shores upon which the garibaldini were so covetously gazing where the last steep precipices of aspromonte overhang the mediterranean the road crawls beneath them along the narrow strip of shore joining the crowded villages of vagnara favazzini celia and canitello along the road the red shirts could watch the enemy's columns moving to and fro the narrowest point of the straits was commanded from the calabrian side by two small forts of torri cavallo and antifumara built on the hillside about a hundred yards above the road and the sea if garibaldi could capture one of these forts his guns would command the narrowest part of the straits from side to side for he would then have batteries on both shores the neapolitan fleet would therefore be compelled to stand out of the narrows and he could pass his army across from the faro to the captured fort it was on this basis that he planned his first attempt on the night of august third a forlorn hope of two hundred men picked out to capture the fort of altifumara embarked in rowboats at the faro garibaldi himself always to the fore in any maritime operation arranged and guided the flotilla to mid-channel he then returned to the sicilian shore where the rest of the army was embarking in steamers and fishing boats ready to cross at dawn if a signal from the opposite shore announced the success of the enterprise meanwhile the two hundred under cover of a cloudy night rode through the middle of the neapolitan cruisers and landed not far from the desired place their leader Mussolino, a calabrian had visited his native soil in disguise a few days before and had arranged as he believed that the gates of the fort should be opened from the inside but the alarm was given their night attack was repulsed and they had no course left but to escape into the mountains of the interior at first they ascended the fumara that debouches beside the fort guided through the night by the glint of its white stones later on they climbed the mountain walls in complete darkness dragging each other up the steepest places by the muzzles of their guns during the next ten days these two hundred men were the only invaders on neapolitan soil they wandered about the upper plains of aspromonte at a height of over three thousand feet above the sea suffering from intense cold by night and august sun by day 
sometimes starving in the mountain desert sometimes falling in with trains of mules bearing ample provisions sent up for them from the liberal committee of reggio owing to the fact that the new intendant of reggio appointed dan liborio romano was a constitutionalist in tacit sympathy with the invaders this rebel committee acted with singular publicity in spite of the presence of the royal troops in town the oldest royalist militia the Gardi urban had just been disarmed by an order of don liborio from naples and the new national guard liberals to a man had been armed in their stead the civil and local authorities therefore no longer gave any support to the regular army camped in their midst the pitiful numbers of the invading force in aspromonte were increased by small bands of calabrian peasants hardy mountaineers in goatskin sandals knee breeches shirt sleeves and brimless sugar loaf hats ornamented with streamers of black velvet the romantic calabrian costume which the opera house and the picture gallery of that era had made as familiar to cultured europe as the kilt of sir walter scott's highlanders their leader was plutino a local magnate jealous of the fame which his fellow calabrian musolino had acquired in the province as leader of this expedition both musolino and plutino were feudal chiefs and political leaders rather than expert military men and the command of the expedition was made over by consent to Missouri, the lombard who had saved garibaldi's life at milazzo under his spirited leadership these few hundred men kept the neapolitan army perpetually on the que vive every night they lighted a blaze of bonfires along the heights to show their friends on the sicilian shore that the insurrection was alive in calabria once they came right down to the coast captured bagnera and held it until driven out by several thousand troops the calabrians behaved well in this first skirmish in the mountain hamlets like solano and pedavalli the invaders learnt something of calabrian local politics the blood feuds which under the form of liberal and bourbon faction fights had devastated the villages in forty eight since that year the course of events had so far alienated or discouraged the royalist party that missouri's men were almost everywhere assisted and were nowhere opposed by the calabrians themselves this was the more remarkable seeing that the country was still occupied by the neapolitan troops and that for the ten days preceding garibaldi's crossing missouri was being hunted like a partridge in the mountains on august fifteenth general ruiz with two battalions was sent up after him from the coast and pursued him in vain through the forest gorges of which the fantastic magnificence had more than once attracted landscape painters like sir arthur strutt and edward lear to brave very real dangers of brigandage the garibaldini escaped over the upper plains of aspromonte many miles across where only a few huts and sheepfolds broke the monotony of the desert and where the only point visible on the horizon was etna's purple cone it was impossible wrote alberto mario as he tramped behind missouri through such scenes even in the hazardous project which absorbed us not to be at times subdued by a mighty awe after this first failure garibaldi was only the more anxious to cross the straits the call of the peoples for his presence among them of which he had spoken in his letter to victor emmanuel was growing daily more insistent half calabria in anticipation of his coming was already in open revolt the liberty of the press the sympathies of the new constitutional magistracy and police made rebellion easy in any town or village not actually occupied by the regular troops and the lower clergy in contrast to the bishops often took the popular side in the toe of italy the presence of sixteen thousand troops prevented the insurrection from breaking out along the thickly populated coastline and confined the movement to the wanderings of missouri's bands in the heights of aspromonte but the province of cosenza in upper calabria fell more or less into the hands of revolutionary committees in the first days of august and the basilicata followed suit on august eighteenth the movement in calabria had been stirred up by the great local proprietors 
the plutino family stocco of the thousand and pace of medici's expedition whom garibaldi had sent on to their old homes to prepare the way for him in the basilicata a like part was played by mignona also commissioned by garibaldi the leaders of the insurrection in the provinces south of the capital showed both sense and courage and succeeded in overawing the troops in their midst such as the formidable garrison of cosenza who remained passive spectators of the rebellion if the northern provinces had been equally liberal and the inhabitants of naples equally bold cavour would have got his revolution without need of further help from garibaldi as the moment for invading the mainland drew near the recently enlisted sicilian bands considering their part in the affair completed began to desert in hundreds from messina and the ferro many of them had fought well for the deliverance of their own island but few shared the enthusiasm of their northern liberators for the idea of italian unity in so far as it meant protection by piedmont against the return of the detested neapolitans italian unity was good but in so far as it meant friendly dealings with the neapolitans it was not now that their own island was safe they returned to their homes only dunes regiment of six hundred and a sicilian brigade of eight hundred cacciatori di etna led by real enthusiasts like la massa corral and la porta of whom the last two were good soldiers shared the fortunes of the army until the end of the volturno campaign if the dictator had any doubts as to the real wishes of the court of turin they were removed by another secret message which reached him at the faro through the hands of victor emmanuel's aide-de-camp trecci the regular medium of royal communication with garibaldi the king's positive orders to the dictator were to occupy naples and thence to invade the pope's territory of umbria and the marches it's not easy to judge whether or not cavour was a party to this message on the one hand it was a habit of victor emmanuel to carry on a policy of his own through secret agents acting behind the back of his ministers and certainly cavour was on principle opposed to a red-shirt invasion of the papal states he wished to keep the liberation of the marches and umbria as a royal prerogative and not to allow it to become a new source of strength to the advanced parties who he feared would then dictate terms to the monarchy and attack the city of rome at the risk of war with france on the other hand the king's message though in apparent contradiction to cavour's policy was perhaps one of the subtlest moves in the minister's game in order to interpret the royal words of encouragement to garibaldi dictated on august fifth it is necessary to understand that cavour had already four days earlier determined in his own mind to invade the papal states from the north with the regular army of piedmont on august first he had written to nigra in paris and to emmanuel de azeglio in london disclosing to them this secret the key to all his subsequent policy and ultra confidential letters which were to be destroyed as soon as read the grounds on which he adopted this decision the greatest and boldest of his whole life will be discussed in a future chapter the policy did not take effect until september and till then was not foreseen by the world at large it is therefore enough at this stage to point out that by august first cavour had secretly determined to invade the papal states himself he had therefore the less objection to the further advance of garibaldi because now he knew that the king would be able at once to assist and to control the red shirts by meeting them with the regular army either at naples or on the southern border of the papal states he was not yet prepared to disclose this plan to garibaldi but he was perhaps not sorry that the king should keep the dictator in good humor by talking about a garibaldian invasion of the papal states from naples which would now never really take place since the royal troops would forestall him in the pope's territories it was the more necessary to tell garibaldi that he might invade the papal states from naples because cavour was at this moment putting his veto on mancini's plan to invade the papal states direct from genoa with bertani's private army bertani's committee in aid of garibaldi 
had not yet sent out to him any large body of men throughout june and july the expeditions dispatched to sicily had been organized chiefly by the moderates and by the supporters of cavour although bertani had been levying and equipping volunteers ever since garibaldi sailed in may he had hitherto held them in reserve for a blow at the papal states garibaldi had all along favored such a design while at the same time demanding reinforcements for himself in sicily on july thirtieth he wrote from the faro to bertani as to the operations in the papal and neapolitan territories push them on with all possible vigor the time had now come to strike the blow in the first days of august bertani had at his disposal eight thousand nine hundred and forty volunteers who unlike the men of the earlier expeditions were ready armed uniformed and organized for immediate service in the field six thousand of them were at genoa but some were at florence under nicotera and a few more in the romagna the detachments at florence and in the romagna were to invade umbria and the marches respectively while the main body were to sail from genoa land in the papal territories at a point north of civita vicia and march by way of viterbo to join nicotera and the others in the east rome and civita vicia the only places occupied by french garrisons were to be spared for the present there were grave objections to this plan first the moricieri's newly levied army of papal crusaders being superior in numbers and not wholly inferior in enthusiasm to bertani's volunteers could not be destroyed with the rapidity which was essential if french and austrian interference was to be forestalled nine thousand italian volunteers under the command of pianciani whom mazzini and bertani had chosen for his politics rather than for his military capacity would not be worth half the number under garibaldi further garibaldi was beginning to find as august advanced and the sicilians dispersed to their homes that he could not cross the straits in the face of the neapolitan armies on the calabrian shore until he received strong reinforcements from the north on august eleventh he was expecting shortly to be joined at the straits by volunteers whom bertani had organized at genoa but pianciani was preparing to lead them off to a wholly different part of the italian peninsula under the delusion that garibaldi would have six thousand sicilian soldiers to take with him across the straits in addition to his northern followers cavour however prevented this fatal mistake from being made he could not allow revolutionary armies organized by mancini and bertani to start from genoa direct for the papal states an invasion made under such conditions must inevitably provoke french interference he therefore sent to genoa his principal colleague farini to negotiate with bertani about the destination of pianciani's force safi ex triumvir of rome was present at the interview farini told bertani that the king's government intended itself to invade the papal states before many days he said our own bugles will be sounding in any case the time was not quite ripe and therefore the government must insist that pianciani and his volunteers should sail first to the golfo del Giaranchi in sardinia and thence to sicily where they would necessarily become subject to garibaldi's orders after touching at sicily they might go to whatever part their leaders wished not excluding the papal states provided that they did not re-enter piedmontese territory as a base from which to attack the pope this compromise was agreed upon by farini for the government and by bertani for the volunteers the clear intention of the authorities to use force rather than permit the invasion of the papal states direct from the port of genoa had compelled bertani to temporize but he had no real thought of fulfilling his part of the bargain by sending pianciani's men to sicily the government had promised to let his volunteers sail for the golfo degli aranci stealing away from the camp beside the straits so secretly that no one knew whither he had gone nor why but all felt that great events were in the air 
and that when they next saw him there would be an end to this wearisome delay it is hard to know what were garibaldi's intentions on board the washington as it carried him and bertani on their hazardous voyage to sardinia through the midst of the neapolitan cruisers bertani was under the erroneous belief that the general would consent to lead the volunteers straight from the golfo degli aranci to the papal states but until the moment of bertani's arrival at the faro garibaldi had intended to use the greater number of them to assist his passage of the straits of messina and he himself tells us that he rejected bertani's proposal to go to the papal states and was considering instead whether he might not attempt a direct coup de main on naples but the vigilance of the piedmontese government had settled the matter beforehand when at dawn of august fourteenth the washington bearing garibaldi and bertani steamed into the golfo degli aranci only one part of the fleet that had transported the volunteers from genoa was to be found in the bay the rest had already been compelled by podmontese warships to go on to sicily in accordance with the agreement which bertani had made with the government and was now plotting to evade he was wild with fury when he saw that he had been frustrated garibaldi on the other hand fell back without any serious loss of temper on the plan which he had entertained three days before of using pianciani's men to force the passage of the straits of messina since he had chanced to come so near to his island home of caprera he went to pass a few hours there in repose with the poignant affection and delight of a boy at home on his day's exeat in the middle of term the dictator wandered amid the sweet-smelling shrubs and the chaos of granite rocks called his favorite cows up to him by name and fed them from his hand then he took ship again for palermo where all pianciani's expedition was soon assembled six thousand strong even at palermo bertani again implored him to lead the men to the papal states but his mind was now once more intent on the problem of the straits of messina pianciani therefore resigned his commission and went home but bertani remained at the seat of war hoping to use his influence upon garibaldi in opposition to the more moderate counsels of the soldiers medici tour vixio and cosenz who were all well aware of the necessity of avoiding a breach with cavour there still remained some two thousand volunteers in tuscany under nicotera who had not been specifically mentioned in the terms of the agreement between bertani and farini at genoa garibaldi though requiring pianciani's men in order to effect the passage of the straits was still willing that nicotera should invade the pope's territory by land and wrote him to that effect but cavour instructed ricasoli as governor of tuscany not to permit any such movement after an embittered quarrel in which ricasoli and nicotera behaved each with small consideration for the other the governor had his way and the last of the volunteers were forcibly shipped to sicily thus the whole army which bertani had prepared against the pope more than eight thousand in number finally swelled garibaldi's force in the south and was of indispensable service to him in his occupation and subsequent defence of naples they were almost the last volunteers who joined him from north italy for cavour alarmed by the constant threat of the advanced parties to invade the papal territory and now fully determined to invade it himself prohibited on august thirteenth the further levy or dispatch of volunteers under any pretext and this time to the surprise of diplomatic europe actually enforced his proclamation there were no more departures in mass from genoa though some hundreds of private individuals went south with government passports in all garibaldi had about twenty thousand northerners under him in the course of the year and at the straits he already had at that time of his crossing much the greater part of this total besides sicilians he was a match even in numbers for the troops in the toe of italy provided his transports could escape the enemy's fleet but by all ordinary calculation that was impossible end of chapter five part two
Chapter Six of Garibaldi and the Making of Italy by George Macaulay Trevelyan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Crossing of the Straits. Ci volte, signore, e sono un vecchio soldato, e perciò mi attendeva che Garibaldi a ta casa di fronte ed invince me capitato alla spalle. What do you expect, gentlemen? I am an old soldier and so of course i expected garibaldi to attack me in front and he came from behind instead general galotti's explanation of his defeat overheard by arriva benny lu coraggio inu donu di dio ed io nu laju courage is a gift of god and i have it not saying attributed to a neapolitan soldier by the garibaldini between the working of one great action and the next Nino Bixio was heard of chiefly through his deeds of insane violence. After the taking of Palermo, the second of the thousand had distinguished himself in the Sicilian capital by his quarrel with a brother in arms, the self sacrificing Agnetta, whom he struck in the face for an imaginary insult. Since Garibaldi would allow no duel on campaign, they did not fight it out until late the following year in Switzerland bixio came tardily and unwillingly on to the field of honor because he of all men had scruples against dueling agnetta shot him in the hand crippling it for the rest of his life whereupon bixio said i'm punished in the hand that gave the offense he subsequently earned agnetta's gratitude by services of real friendship bixio was not present at the battle of Milazzo for he was leading his command through the south of the island when at the end of july all the garibaldian columns met near the straits he was sent by the dictator to suppress a predatory and murderous anarchist rising under the western slopes of etna there at randazzo and on nelson's old estate of bronte his summary methods and manners soon terrified the wrongdoers into submission at the cost of only a few actual executions Bixio's own soldiers were always complaining of him. He's mad. He's intolerable. Very well. Under whom do you wish to serve, then? What? Eh? Oh, under Bixio, of course. At Bronte one morning some volunteers recently arrived from North Italy, and not accustomed to his ways, were late in turning out of bed. He went into the houses after them with a horsewhip. The older troops, who had marched under him and learnt to love him, with difficulty saved his life from the fury of the new men who had come out to fight under garibaldi not to be whipped in like hounds but now an action was in hand on which his rage to be up and doing for his country could be spent to better purpose the dictator had been away in sardinia and palermo for nearly six days and no one at the straits knew when or whether he would return the suspense on both shores was terrible on the morning of august eighteenth he suddenly reappeared in the faro camp gave his orders left for messina and an hour afterwards was seen driving through its streets in a three-horse carriage along the southern road his movements were still as mysterious as ever for he was again travelling away from the scene of active operations at the faro but in fact the camp and flotilla beneath the lighthouse were to serve during the next twenty-four hours only as a decoy to fix the attention of the enemy's ships and regiments on the narrow waters of Sheila and Caribidus, while the rest of the crossing took place at the border part of the Straits, thirty miles to the south. On the afternoon of August 18th, Garibaldi's carriage reached the hamlet of Giardini, which stretches along the beach between the wall of mountains and the sea, at the southern foot of Tormina Rock. Here Bixio's men from Bronte and Catania had been secretly collected during the last two days. Here the Torino and the Franklin had safely arrived, after steaming around the whole island from the Faro, in order to avoid the Neapolitan cruisers in the Straits. The captain of the Torino, a man of peace, who objected to the use of his transport vessel for an enterprise so hazardous as an attack on the Calabrian coast, had been silenced and placed under arrest by Bixio. The troops, 3,360 in number, were already on board the two streamers when Garibaldi drove up. 
When all was ready, it was found that the Franklin had sprung a leak. The hole could not be found, and Bixio proposed that they should start with the Torino alone. But when Garibaldi took the matter in hand, the hole was soon found and stopped. To judge by the space which he allots to his operation in his memoirs, the dictator recalled it with more interest than all his historic achievements during the next fortnight. That he should cause fifteen thousand soldiers of tyranny to lay down their arms seemed to him no more than an inevitable fate, now that Italy's hour had struck. But to find and cock a hole in a ship which had baffled the other seamen was an action of which a man had good right to be proud. At nightfall the two vessels steamed out from below the rock of Torremina. The distance to Melito, the point chosen for the landing in Calabria, is thirty miles, and if at any point in the crossing the unarmed transports had fallen in with a Neapolitan warship they could have been sunk to the bottom. But the enemy were all away at the Narrows, watching the camp and flotilla at the Faro. The night voyage was unbroken by anything more terrifying than the voice of Bixio from the Torino, continually shouting through his megaphone to the silent Garibaldi in the Franklin. When dawn revealed Etna's cone and the long ranges of subject Sicilian mountains at her feet, the Calabrian coast lay close ahead. Again, as at Marsala, Bixio ran his vessel aground on the shallows, but the men of both the steamers were taken off in the ship's boats and landed on the desolate beach called Porto Salvo, a mile from Melito village. There were no houses near, but an old chapel with a cupola rose amid the cactuses and aloes at the edge of the sea sand. The flat country behind, though it bore olive groves and scraps of cultivation, was arid for the most part, stripped and scarred each winter by the torrents from Aspromonte. The mountains themselves here stand back a mile or two from the coast. But the Garibaldini, as they landed, saw the pillar rock of Pendendatilo raising its five grotesque fingers against the dawn. Garibaldi spent the whole morning on the 19th in a vain attempt to salvage the Torino. He was waiting also for Missouri's men to come down from the mountains near San Lorenzo, whither he had sent them a message to announce his landing. In the afternoon, Neapolitan war vessels appeared from the direction of Messina, destroyed the grounded and derelict Torino, and fired, not without some effect, into the red shirts on shore. The Franklin had returned safely to Sicily. Towards evening the vanguard of Missouri's men appeared on the neighboring mountains, and the night of August 19th and 20th was spent in bivouac not far from Melito. For thirty-six hours many of the troops had neither food nor drink, some of them who were inland bred dug holes in the seashore and lapped the water that oozed up in desperate hope that neptune would lose his salt by filtering through the sand on august nineteenth the telegraphs and semaphores in the neapolitan kingdom had been wagging all day with ominous rumors from the south and before midnight the ministers at naples knew that there had been a landing in force a dozen miles beyond reggio there were now some sixteen thousand royalist troops in lower calabria general vial their commander-in-chief had his headquarters in monteleone too far removed from the scene of operations his regiments were scattered along fifty miles of road between monteleone and reggio his lieutenants melendez and briganti were guarding the supposed points of danger opposite the faro but at the moment of Garibaldi's landing there were no troops south of Reggio, and in Reggio itself only some one thousand men, chiefly of the fourteenth line. When forty-eight hours later Garibaldi fell upon the city, the numbers of its garrison had not been increased by a single man. The news of the landing at Melito ought to have caused an instantaneous move in that direction, on the part of each of the columns scattered along the coast road, but neither Vial, Melendez, nor Briganti stirred until it was too late to save Reggio, in spite of a stream of indignant telegrams from Pianel at Naples. The war minister had been anxious to avoid fighting in Sicily, and had, perhaps, not sent enough troops to guard the straits. 
but his telegrams show that he did his best to make the generals fight Garibaldi when once he had landed. When old General Galotti, in command at Reggio, was the most complete dotard of them all, when informed of the landing at Melito, he said that Garibaldi had taken to the mountains, and that Reggio could not be attacked from that side, but only in front from the sea. Therefore he made no preparations to defend the city. He forbade the energetic Colonel Dusme to take up a good position near the castle, and compelled him instead to bivouac in the middle of the cathedral square, a mere trap for those who occupied it, unless the entrances to the city were strongly guarded. These, however, were confided to the National Guard of liberal bourgeoisie, whose loyalty was more than doubtful. Galotti himself remained in the castle with the garrison. The castle of Reggio is a tall, grim building, flanked by round towers somewhat similar in strength and appearance to the Bastille of old Paris, though on a smaller scale. But unlike the Bastille, it does not rise clear above all possible assailants, for Reggio is built on the side of a hill, and since the castle is only halfway up the hill, its battlements can be commanded by sharpshooters at the top of the town. On the 20th, the invaders marched from Melito, passing over the top of the sandstone cliff of Capo dell'Armi, Luca Petra, whose white rock had been a famous sea mark to the sailors of the ancient world. The general walked with his saber over his shoulder, talking and singing with the men. All were hungry but in high spirits. Near Reggio they rested again, and at midnight advanced to the attack. Garibaldi, with Missouri's men, entered the upper town by way of the hills, through Spirito Santo. Bixio, with the main column, kept the high road through Spare, and came in by the principal streets below the castle. His men stumbled upon outposts at the entrance of the city. Chivala! Garibaldi! Avanti! It was the National Guard standing aside to let them pass. They hurried on through the sleeping streets. In the middle of the town they came upon other sentries. Chevala! Garibaldi! Bang! They had come upon the loyal troops at last. A fierce struggle raged in the great cathedral square until morning. Colonel Dusme and his son, not yet of age, fell gallantly fighting in front of the royalists. Bixio's horses received nineteen wounds, and their rider two in the arm, to which he paid no attention till Garibaldi sent him to bed the next night, saying, I suppose the balls that reach you are made of puff paste. The odds were all against the fourteenth line, and Garibaldi's column was pouring in upon their rear from the upper town. As day broke, the red shirts possessed themselves of all Reggio except the castle, which was provisioned for a month and could easily be defended against its present assailants. Later in the same day, August 21st, Briganti approached Reggio from Villa San Giovanni with about 2,000 men. Garibaldi led his troops out into the country just beyond the northern suburbs and took up a position to cover the town. After the exchange of a few shots in a feeble reconnaissance, Briganti fell back, leaving Reggio to its fate. Garibaldi afterwards wrote that if the attack had been pressed, the royalists might have very possibly, with the help of the garrison in the castle, have recovered the town, and in that case his own position would have been desperate. Indeed the troops in the castle had clamored to be let out to attack him in the rear, and join hands with the relieving force. But Galotti had refused to allow a sally, Hitherto the royalist garrison in Reggio, with the exception of Galotti himself, had behaved well, but after Briganti's retreat they felt themselves deserted and began to lose courage. When sharpshooters placed by Garibaldi on the upper part of the town commenced picking off the men on the battlements, panic set in, and the castle, which might have held out for weeks, was surrendered within twenty-four hours. The taking of Reggio had cost the victors about 150 in killed and wounded. On the same day, another important event took place to the north of the Straits. Garibaldi had left Cosenz in command at the Faro, with instructions that he was to carry his troops across the water, at the moment when the dictator himself attacked Reggio. 
there was a good chance that cosense would be able to cross in safety because the neapolitan war vessels had now too late left the narrow waters and gone south to attend to garibaldi after his landing at melito before sunrise on august twenty first to the sound of the distant firing from reggio the flotilla of rowboats put out from faro carrying between one thousand and fifteen hundred volunteers they struggled successfully against the currents of Caribidus, made a wide detour to avoid the cannon-balls from the fort of Sheila, and landed the same morning on the strip of flat shore beneath the wall of wooded mountains at Favazina. The Neapolitan warships, hastily summoned back from Reggio, sank and captured a large number of boats as the fishermen were taking them back empty to the faro a few minutes after cosense and his men had landed at favazina they were attacked while crossing the coast road by neapolitan troops from Sheila on one side and bagnara on the other the enemy were repulsed chiefly by the genoese carabineers the pick of garibaldi's original thousand and the whole force proceeded straight up the sides of aspromonte by precipitous attacks through the brushwood at noontide the greater part had reached the hamlet of solano two thousand feet above the sea overcome by heat thirst and fatigue they took their siesta in the houses believing that all the royalists forces were far below them on the level of the shore from the precipice edge of solano they looked back down the gulf of an enormous ravine below but the village itself closely overshadowed by other heights covered with chestnut woods and in these a few hundred neapolitan troops were lying concealed they were a detachment of ruiz's men who had not yet gone down off aspromonte from their vain pursuit of missouri's column though inferior in numbers to cosense the royalists seized their advantage surprised the sentinels and burst into the village the garibaldini had an hour's hard fighting before they could drive them out two little companies of french and english volunteers distinguished themselves in the scuffle under the leadership of de flote and of goodall de flote was killed in the street at the head of his men he was a french republican exile who had played a part in paris in forty eight and narrowly escaped cayenne after napoleon the third's coup d'etat he had been loved by all his companions in arms english italians and french and garibaldi when he heard of his death mourned for him as a true soldier of liberty they buried him where he fell high up among the granite gorges and the chestnut woods far from his fierce gay city and the boulevard lights after repulsing this attack cosense's column mounted another fifteen hundred feet to forestali on the higher plains of aspromonte there they received a message from the dictator bidding them march westward and join him above villa san giovanni their sufferings on the plateaus of aspromonte were severe starved and sun-baked all day at night they were soaked with the dew and chilled with the intense cold of the mountain so that goodall and other useful soldiers were put out of action the movements of garibaldi and cosense are a model of combined action from two separate bases each had enabled the other to succeed by distracting the attention of the enemy's naval and military force and now they were about to join hands at a spot above and in rear of the enemy's main line of defence on august twenty second the morning after the fall of reggio the dictator and bixio moved northward to attack the forts and regiments commanding the narrowest part of the straits again bixio kept the coast road and garibaldi the hills on the evening of that day the dictator joined forces with cosense above piale and villa san giovanni after this junction he had with him about five thousand men and was for a while superior to the enemy both in numbers and position down below between him and the sea lie rather more than three thousand troops under general melendez and briganti the greater part of this force was in villa san giovanni on the coast road under the command of briganti but melendez with twelve hundred men occupied piale village a mile up the hillside garibaldi was above them both at campo calabrese 
where Marat had pitched his tents when he threatened Sicily with invasion. These seaward heights now occupied by the red shirts bore no resemblance to the wooded and precipitous mountains below which Cosense had landed. It is a tumbled-down land of broken mud banks on which vineyards, fruit gardens, cactuses, and houses maintain an ever precarious existence. The landscape on this part of the Calabrian shore is more weird than beautiful, but the view thence of the Straits, of Sicily and of Etna, Mongibello, the fair mountain as the Calabrians call it, filled the Garibaldini with delight as they waited for the surrender of their foes. An artillery duel between the Neapolitan ships and the batteries at the Faro was watched by both armies as from the seats of a theatre, of which the lower circles were occupied by the royalists. On the 22nd, Melendez and Briganti might still have retreated to Sheila, for it was only during the following night that the dictator cut off their retreat by pushing his advanced guard down to the coast at Canitello but they let the hour slip by in the vain expectation of reinforcements from the north. Besides the men whom they had with them, there were more than ten thousand royalist troops in lower Calabria, and they naturally supposed that Vial would lead these to their rescue. But the commander-in-chief had no advantage except in point of age over his daughtered lieutenants. A pleasure-loving and idle young man, raised by personal influences at court to a command for which he had no qualifications, they all had too much of the heartless flippancy of the Neapolitan to be serious over even the gravest situation. He continued to linger and amuse himself at Monteleone, saying that he would give Joe a ducking if he tried to cross the straits. When he heard that Joe had crossed and was taking Reggio, he still lingered with the greater part of the troops under his command fifty miles from the scene of action. At length, driven to the front by furious telegrams from Pianel, the war minister, he sailed from Pizzo on the morning of August 22nd, taking with him one of his best battalions. He landed alone at Villa San Giovanni, interviewed Briganti and Melendez, and ordered them to hold out while he set this battalion ashore at Sheila and led it to their rescue. He then returned to Sheila, but as a sea had risen, which made the landing of troops momentarily difficult, he hailed the excuse to sail back with the battalion to Pizzo and Monteleone, leaving his lieutenants to their fate without even warning them that he had changed his plan and run away. Meanwhile, Melendez and Briganti were expecting aid not only from Vial, but from General Ruiz, who had at length descended from Aspromonte to the coast road, and was hurrying along it to their rescue. Like Vial, Ruiz came on alone in front of his column to take stock of the situation. He visited Melendez and Briganti up at Piale, and then went down to the main road again to bring up his column from Alta Fumara but on his way back through Villa San Giovanni he could not fail to observe that Briganti's men were in a state of complete demoralization. Red shirts were going about among them with impunity in cafes and at street corners, exhorting them not to prolong a useless and fratricidal contest, and it was only too evident that the men were listening. There was little of active disloyalty or of political liberalism among the rank and file but they had in august small motive or encouragement to fight they were at once terrified and fascinated by the name of garibaldi and after the taking of reggio regarded him as unconquerable during the last two months ever since the grant of the constitution they had been forced to march under the tricolored flag the flag as it seemed to them of their enemies they witnessed in every street down which they passed the enthusiasm of the populace for the revolution and the open disloyalty of the new civic authorities who proclaimed long live the king as a seditious cry their own officers were visibly shaking with fear muttering their doubts to each other or preoccupied with private thoughts of which the character was only too evident their general briganti was known to be in favor of negotiation the enemy it appeared was to be regarded as more than half a friend 
since no one prevented his emissaries from entering their lines to talk sedition in the open street of villa san giovanni as ruiz rode through the town noting what he saw he judged that briganti and his troops did not mean to fight and that he had best save his own men from sharing in their surrender a few miles further north at altifumara he met his column hastening up ordered it to turn right about and before nightfall on the twenty second had led it back to bagnara like vial ruiz was pursued by indignant telegrams from the war minister at naples to the effect that melendez and briganti were preparing to die at their posts while he basely deserted them but he knew better and rather than face garibaldi again he resigned his command his successor morisani on the morning of the twenty third began to march back once more to the relief of san giovanni but was met and turned back for good and all by a messenger from melendez himself who declared that it was now too late in this fashion melendez and briganti lured by false hopes that vial and ruiz were marching to their relief had let slip the opportunity to escape out of their untenable positions on august twenty second at daybreak on the twenty third they saw that retreat was no longer possible during the night garibaldi had drawn the net around them by sending down detachments from camp calabrese to canitello they were completely surrounded with a semicircle of sea on one side and a semicircle of red shirts on the other as the sun rose the garibaldini began to descend upon them from the hills the neapolitan rifles and cannon opened fire but the advancing host made no reply the slow ordered noiseless approach of their enemies affected the nerves of the royalists as garibaldi had intended that it should they opened negotiations a garibaldian parlementaire with the white flag in his hand was shot dead but general briganti himself came out to apologize he explained to the dictator that he would have been a liberal himself but he had two sons in the neapolitan army and so felt gratitude to the bourbons otherwise he said i would join you he asked to surrender with the honors of war garibaldi gave him and melendez till three o'clock to surrender unconditionally and allowed them to send out a messenger who as already related stopped the further advance of morisani to the rescue meanwhile the garibaldian army halted on the hillside and watched the confusion growing hour by hour among their enemies below when the appointed time had run out the advance was resumed as the red shirts drew the circle close upon them the royalists threw away their arms and knapsacks and fled in a mob along the northern road they were turned back by a volley and crowded together like driven sheep in the centre of their position garibaldi rode almost alone into their midst soldiers he said you as well as my companions are the sons of italy remember that you are at liberty whoever wishes to remain with us may address himself to general cosense your countryman who is charged to enlist you but whoever wishes may go home at these words they rushed at him with cries of joy and much to his disgust began kissing his hands arms and feet three thousand five hundred men four field pieces and the fort of punto di pezzo with its artillery were the prize of this bloodless victory very few of the men chose to enlist under cosens but as they scattered to their homes they spread the news that garibaldi's custom was to send off his prisoners free and this knowledge greatly increased the readiness of the troops under vial and ruiz to follow the example set at villa san giovanni that example proved contagious along the whole road to naples the next day august twenty fourth the fort of altifumara which had resisted missouri's attack a fortnight before the neighboring fort of torre cavallo and the more formidable castle on the rock of Shila, armed with twenty-two cannon all opened their gates to the outriders of the invading army among whom garibaldi himself was one of the foremost as soon as the batteries of these forts had compelled the neapolitan navy to sail out of the straits medici's regiments at messina were brought safely across to the mainland 
the race to naples had now fairly begun it was led by garibaldi and his staff many hours ahead of the van of their army accompanied by jesse and alberto mario and by some english gentlemen who liked fatigue and had the luck and money to hire horses that could keep the pace there were more than ten thousand of the enemy close ahead but no one feared that they would resist when overtaken basilicata and upper calabria were already rising in arms the dictator and his companion set out to ride unchallenged along the great trunk road that stretches for two hundred and fifty miles through mountains and forests and fever-stricken plains from the foot of aspromonte to the foot of vesuvius End of chapter six Chapter Seven, Part One of Garibaldi and the Making of Italy, by George Macaulay Trevelyan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The March Through Calabria. Oh, how comely it is, and how reviving, to the spirits of just men long oppressed, when God into the hands of their deliverer puts invincible might to quell the mighty of the earth, the oppressor the brute and boisterous force of violent men hardy and industrious to support tyrannic power but raging to pursue the righteous and all such as honour truth he all their ammunition and feats of war defeats with plain heroic magnitude of mind the celestial vigour armed their armories and magazines contemns renders them useless while with winged expedition swift as the lightning glance he executes his errand on the wicked who surprised lose their defence distracted and amazed milton the calabrian liberals were not altogether unworthy of such a deliverer the garibaldini who had seen little to admire in the inhabitants of eastern sicily in spite of all the facile enthusiasm at messina declared that when they had crossed the straits they soon found themselves among a staid manly and athletic population travellers who to-day visit those remote but magnificent regions notice with relief that the corruption of naples has not infected the whole south of the peninsula the calabrians of those days were not unaccustomed to war for sixty years past they had from time to time conducted guerrilla campaigns for and against the bourbons some towns had always been on the side of reaction like piso whose fishermen had arrested murat along with their nets on the beach and handed him over to his death while others like monteleone on the hill above had no less constantly been liberal in the period of those french and english wars the prevailing sentiment in calabria had been reactionary or at least anti-french but since waterloo forty years of obscurantist inquisition into every household by spies and police officers had left the restored bourbons but few zealous adherents and had made every man of spirit and in intelligence their active enemy in 1848 the calabrian peasants had upheld the national cause with a valor that distinguished them among the populations of southern italy in the reaction that followed the leaders of the movement doctors professors and landed proprietors had gone into prison and into exile their day was now come francesco stocco of the thousand the principal landlord of the catanzaro district reappeared among his own people with a wound which he had received at calatafimi yet unhealed in eighteen sixty feudal devotion was still strong in calabria and helped much to make the rising effective even in exile stocco had been regarded as the real leader of the country like a highland chief living across the water after seventeen forty five and now he was among his people once more they answered to his call as to that of a tribal king who interpreted the will of garibaldi the racial deity unfortunately stocco was a simple and disinterested man and used his authority well on august twenty sixth the citizens of catanzaro proclaimed the dictator's government while the town was still occupied by the bourbon garrison 
when it marched out next day towards nicastro it was surrounded and disarmed by the people of that region two days before the arrival of the garibaldian vanguard meanwhile the mountain shepherds of aspromonte and the farmers of the fruit-bearing hills that overlook the fever-stricken plains of maida gathered to a head under francesco stocco they pitched their camp several thousand strong on the plateau of campo lungo above the bridge of angitola and prepared there to cut off the retreat of vial and his twelve thousand men vial still laid at monteleone while stocco thus blocked his road to the north and garibaldi advanced upon him from the south pianel had at length ordered him to retreat on the capital but the only path left open was by sea and he had only one steamer lying off piso he used it to effect his own escape to naples taking on board with him a thousand of his men the rest he bequeathed to general geo with instructions that they should march back by land a thousand more disbanded leaving geo with ten thousand the last royalists in lower calabria from the semaphore station on the heights of monteleone the grass-grown site of an ancient greek city geo could watch through his telescope the bivouac of stocco's calabrians on the table-land of campo lungo close above the high road by which alone he could hope to retreat seeing himself thus cut off he sent a flag of truce to the dictator and begged for a free passage to naples with the honors of war on august twenty sixth geo's messenger found garibaldi at necoterra a town perched on the sea cliff some miles off the great trunk road along which the armies were moving the dictator had made his way thither with two or three companions alone in order to superintend the disembarkation of medici's troops from messina taking a short cut from gioja he and his friends had left their horses and walked seven miles through deep sand and marshes of the plain wading through rivers above the knee he thus arrived in time to welcome medici's men as they landed on the beach below nicotera thence he sent back gio's officer to monteleone with a demand for the unconditional surrender of the ten thousand at dawn on the twenty seventh the dictator posted over the hills to monteleone by way of mileto where he rejoined the vanguard of his army coming up from rosarno by the great trunk road Milieto, situated halfway up the long rise out of the plain to the heights of Monteleone, was famed for the numbers of its clergy and its brigands. The wealthy bishop had fled, but the priests and people welcomed Garibaldi and his men. In the middle of the main street was to be seen a dried pool of blood and the charred remains of some large animal. On that spot, two days before, the bourbon troops had detected their general briganti attempting to ride through milato in civilian disguise it was he who had so recently surrendered at villa san giovanni they fell upon him with cries of trattadori and emptied their rifles into his body which they stripped and mutilated in beastly fashion while others killed and burned his horse all this took place in the open street of milato beneath the eyes of the regimental officers who drank shame to the dregs looking on at the murder with pale cheeks and ineffectual murmurs of remonstrance some of the soldiers boasted that they had killed a general because he was a liberal and a traitor others because he was a royalist others because they wanted his boots horrified but encouraged by this evidence of the utter demoralization of his enemies garibaldi after a siesta in a garden at mileto drove on to monteleone the same day hoping to receive the surrender of these wretched men on the afternoon of the twenty seventh his carriage mounted to the edge of the green and prosperous tableland of monteleone whence the moral and material squalor of the towns down below seems to have been banished by decree of nature ever since the ancient greeks founded their city of hipponium upon this pleasant sward the garibaldini like other travellers before and since were enchanted by the panorama of the mediterranean stromboli sicily and nearer at hand the long outline of aspromonte by the city with its hospitable inhabitants 
its free and cheerful life, its unexpected treasure of sanctuary and architecture. Garibaldi himself, first to arrive, was given a welcome that is remembered in Monteleone as the greatest event in its civic life. For sixty years its inhabitants had been true to the cause of freedom, and for more than forty of those years had been subject to cruel oppression. For weeks past their town had been the enemy's headquarters. The day before they had narrowly escaped massacre at the hands of the soldiery, who had murdered Briganti and they had been saved only by the wisdom and energy of the Marquis Gagliardi, the patriot leader of the town. But now Garibaldi was among them, standing in a balcony with arms crossed and head bowed, looking long and in silence at the crowd below. Unworded things and old seemed passing between him and them by some mysterious sympathy of race. At length he spoke, when a people replies as you have done to the call of freedom, then freedom is its due. The destinies of Italy are secure, and no power on earth can alter them. But it was the silence, and not the words, that dwelt most in the memory of some present. There was, however, one cause for disappointment. Gio's ten thousand, who had marched out of the town shortly before Garibaldi's arrival, were allowed by Stocco to march past him unchallenged. It appears that Sir Tori had sent Stocco a message which he intercepted to mean that the Neapolitan troops had joined the national cause and were to be treated as brothers in arms. They were therefore allowed to file across the long bridge of Angitola and below the wooded precipice of Campo Lungo under the eyes of Stocco's army, who stood at ease and cheered them as they passed but Gio's men were, in fact, still bearing arms against Garibaldi, and he had declared for nothing short of their unconditional surrender. The mistake, whether due to Sertori or to Stocco, called for instant remedy. If Gio's men recovered their morale, or fell in with Caldarelli's troops in Upper Calabria, they might yet occupy one of the thousand strong mountain positions that barred the road to Naples, and seriously delay the dictator's advance. In any case, he did not want ten thousand more added to the royalist troops collecting for the defense of the capital. He therefore left Monteleone on the 28th at a hand gallop to ride down the fugitive army. He was partly accompanied and partly pursued by the mounted portion of his staff and by some English ladies and gentlemen in a carriage. There were as yet no cavalry, so the rest of his men, with Stokoe's bands well to the fore, were to come on behind as fast as their legs would carry them. The country through which the race now ran, with its ever-changing views of mountain, plain, and sea, was rich in memories of the last sixty years of feud between revolution and reaction. First, they left behind them Piso, hanging on a cliff over the beach, with its squalid little castle where Marat had been shot, an eagle trapped in a filthy cage and torn to pieces by vermin. At the bridge of La Grazia they passed a battlefield of forty-eight. Then the road wound among low, fruit-laden hills, skirting the Campania of Maida. On that seaward plain, half covered with brushwood, and cut by sandy streams and white fumari, the British infantry set ashore by our fleet in July 1806, had, in half an hour of volley firing, proved the superiority of the line formation over the French column, which had carried all before it since the Revolutionary Wars began. The Grand Mountains, looking down on the battlefield, from north and east, had been the scene of the Calabrian rising against the French that followed on the British victory, when the methods of the reactionary bands so horrified our officers that many of them were glad to be driven back to Sicily, and swore never again to let loose such devilry on the mainland. Following up the valley of the Amato, Garibaldi turned into the heart of these mountains, where far other political sentiments now prevailed among the peasants, and under his influence those blood feuds of Bourbon and Jacobin, those marchings of foreign armies on the soil, belonged to an era that was passing away as the flag of Italy and Victor Emmanuel brought the hope of an ordered freedom. Garibaldi and the best mounted officers in his staff were acting militarily as their own scouts, 
politically as their own heralds the first comers of all their army they were enthusiastically welcomed by the peasants who saw with special delight that the dictator was wearing the conical hat of calabria he and his friends had no baggage and no change of clothes each had one travel-stained red shirt which was sometimes washed at the midday siesta and put on again to dry as they rode forward under the scorching sun in this guise the small group of horsemen climbed up the steep ascent out of the amato valley to the ancient town of tirillo that hangs on the edge of the mountain wall two thousand feet above the tyrrhenian and ionian seas besides this simultaneous view of the two parts of the mediterranean the riders admired the gorgeous calabrian costumes of the women which then as now were seen at their best in the neighborhood of tirillo thence the trunk road runs northwards for a two days journey to cosenza at an average height of over two thousand feet through an endless succession of oak and chestnut forests above the flanks of deep wooded gorges down which even in august and september the clear water went leaping and gurgling to the sea in these altitudes garibaldi overtook gio's army on the evening of august twenty ninth five miles beyond tirillo he suddenly came in sight of the tail of the enemy's column winding round the flank of the mountain a few hundred yards in front since he had only a half a dozen companions with him he turned aside for the night into the neighboring village of san pietro after sending to bid stoco's calabrians to come up with all possible speed while the staff was at supper an earthquake shook the village and all rushed out into the street except only garibaldi who remained seated as if he had felt nothing at dawn he started again to seize his prey while the rising sun flooded the peaks and valleys with light he followed the road along the crest of a wooded ridge which opened out after six miles into the high cultivated tableland of soveria at the farther end of this plateau close beneath still higher mountains to the north lay the village of soveria manelli in its long street and on the flat cornland round garibaldi bivouacked the whole of gio's army of ten thousand men packed like sheep in a fold without rear guard or advanced guard without sentinels placed or outposts occupying the surrounding heights the men were disconsolately cooking some stolen lambs the officers were doing nothing there was no sign that they intended to proceed with their march gio had in fact abandoned the idea of further retreat because he had learned that the pass of agrifolio five miles up to the north was blocked against him by the men of upper calabria these bands from cosenza and castrovillari led by their feudal chiefs pace and morelli had already on august twenty seventh compelled three thousand troops under general caldarelli at cosenza to enter upon an agreement to retreat with arms in their hands to naples the rebels had next proceeded to occupy agrifolio pass fearing that if gio crossed the watershed and marched down into the district of cosenza with ten thousand fresh troops from the south caldarelli would throw over his agreement and unite with the newcomers to strike another blow for the royal cause on the summit of this forest pass more than three thousand feet above the sea were encamped the calabrian mountaineers in their theatrical costume armed with shotguns axes pikes and scythes among them superintending the defences of the pass rode the white-haired altamari with the medal of santa helena and the cross of the legion of honor upon his breast he had known colder work than these august days and nights among the oak woods for he had marched to moscow and back he had been one of the half million combatants in the armageddon on the plains of leipzig he had led his fellow calabrians in eighteen twenty and in eighteen forty eight and now his eyes were to see the coming of garibaldi under his direction trenches were dug and trees felled across the road up which gio would have to march but gio was being informed that caldarelli had come to terms and that the summit of agrifolio pass was thus fortified against his own retreat 
determined to proceed no farther but supinely to await the arrival of garibaldi at soveria there throughout the morning of august thirtieth band after band of stokel's calabrians came in from Torelio and the south exhausted with their forced march but eager to be led into action as fast as each arrived on the plateau garibaldi led them up to san tomaso village and the other hills to east and north of soveria down below the bourbon troops still sat cooking their lambs watching garibaldi's encircling movement with the fixed indifference of despair in the course of the morning mario paired and the ex-priest bianchi from the camp at agrifoglio severally entered the village and demanded the surrender of gio's army they were received with courtesy by the general and by some of the troops while others were with difficulty restrained from shooting them soon after midday garibaldi found himself at the head of two thousand of stokoe's calabrians and a few of cosent's red shirts ranged in a circle round the village below he gave the word to advance and the garibaldini silently and slowly moved down upon gio's ten thousand as they had done upon briganti's smaller force at villa san giovanni a week before there was no resistance and no formal capitulation it was understood that the men were free to go each his own way and that the officers were to be supplied with journey money they spontaneously gave up their ten thousand rifles and twelve cannon and without more ado disbanded each to his own home or to a life of brigandage several thousand of the rifles were distributed among the calabrian bands of stocco pace and morelli many of whom thus armed came on to naples and took part in the volturno campaign the captured horses enabled garibaldi for the first time since he had crossed the straits to mount a hundred cavalry hitherto his hungarian hussars had trudged all the way trailing their large spurs and sabres through the dust but when the enemy's horses were made over to them at soveria the gallant gentlemen sprang into the saddles with a clarity of a cavalier race reared on the Maiger plains to horsemanship and war they seemed to the onlookers to be suddenly transfigured from tired tramps into knights of old romance galloping off joyfully into the forest in search of dragons and giants and some glorious way to die in the midst of these scenes of confusion and triumph in the squalid street of soveria a messenger arrived from naples and handed a letter to garibaldi it was from alexander dumas who had recently gone to the capital in his yacht he wrote that he had obtained an interview with liborio romano now the principal minister of the king and by far the most influential person in naples liborio wrote dumas is at your disposition together with at least two of his fellow ministers at the first attempt at reaction on the king's part at this first attempt which will set him free from his oath of fidelity liborio romano offers to leave naples with two of his colleagues to present himself to you to proclaim the disposition of the king and to recognize you as dictator garibaldi sped the messenger back to naples to tell liborio that the neapolitans ought to be prepared to rise at any moment in case it should prove necessary but that they were if possible to postpone the decisive event until he himself was at the gates he set out to follow the messenger as fast as horses could carry him again leaving his army days behind upon the road two fears drew him on to the capital at his topmost speed the fear that anarchy massacre or civil war would break out before his arrival and the fear that cavour and victor emmanuel would seize the reins of power in naples and so bring to an end his dictatorship and with it his chance of invading the papal states meanwhile the other detachments of his army scattered along the road between scilla and tyriolo were toiling after the vanguard by forced marches it was the hottest period of the year cooled by occasional thunderstorms there was no proper commissariat and the food of the country was scarce especially for the rear guard who followed where gio's ten thousand and their own main body had already swept the villages clean fruit was in season 
and in some places on the route abundant but few of garibaldi's followers could like their leader be satisfied with a bunch of grapes a cigar and the thought of italy as a substitute for a day's rations everything was paid for at a good price and grape thieves were liable to be shot once at least the corpse of a red shirt laid out between the vineyards and the road warned the passing columns that the general's discipline was still as severe as his hour of triumph as it had been eleven years before during the disastrous retreat from rome when i remember the plundering propensities of my own countrymen wrote an english gentleman who had beheld this wayside portent i shudder to think what may be the consequences should many join the army his fears were well grounded for two months later five members of the british legion were condemned to be shot for plundering on the north bank of the volturno where they had been left on the usual garbaldian short rations an intolerable torture to the hungrier saxon race but their sentence was commuted for imprisonment End of chapter seven part one
Chapter Fifteen of Garibaldi and the Making of Italy by George Macaulay Trevelyan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Return to Caprera. Simplici in anti is simply in parole. Ci della patria cavalier si sense. Donna tutta alla patria in nulla vole. Marradi. Prapsody Garibaldina. Simply in act and word, his country's knight. He gives his country all and nothing takes. That part of the enemy's force which had been in the neighborhood of the two national armies at the moment of their junction on October 26th retired in the afternoon towards Gaeta and effaced themselves behind the line of Garigiano. On the morning of the 27th, Victor Manuel rode from Tiano to Calvi in search of Garibaldi. Finding that he had returned to the south bank of the Volturno, the king pushed on alone with his staff in the same direction, crossed the rickety little bridge, and entered the Garibaldian lines at San Angelo. The volunteers came swarming out to welcome the unexpected visitor, with cries of devotion and enthusiasm, which showed how far a very little attention from the world would have gone to win the hearts of the main body of Garibaldini. Unfortunately, this surprise visit was the last effort which His Majesty was permitted to make by way of showing personal gratitude to the rank and file of the volunteers. Since Garibaldi was absent, not knowing of the king's visit, Medici did the honors of the occasion, helped by Nino Bixio's lieutenants. Bixio himself was in hospital at Naples. At the crossing of the Volturno two days before, whence he was to have accompanied the dictator to meet the king, Nino had headed a hue and cry after a priest suspected of acting as a spy, and riding furiously after the man to arrest him, had let his horse slip in a narrow lane, and fractured his leg against the wall. He lay, however, quite happy in the hospital at Naples, for his wife came out from Genoa to nurse him, and since the volunteer's part in the fighting was over, he was able to turn his mind to the docile family affections which shared dominion in his heart, with the rage for his country's service. Victor Emmanuel, after having fraternized with Medici's men, had ridden close up to the walls of Capua at the greatest risk of being cut off by the enemy's outposts, recrossed the Volturno, and returned to Tiano. His army was there divided into two, one part going towards the line of the Garigiano and Gaeta, and the other under General della Rocca coming south to besiege Capua. Della Rocca had to negotiate a delicate situation with Garibaldi. Although the red shirts were no longer to be allowed to take part in the serious operations of the campaign, yet on October 28th their services were still required for yet a few days longer to help guard the lines for the royal siege batteries. Garibaldi, fearing that his men might be annoyed at receiving orders from della rocca if they considered that a slight was being put upon themselves or their chief not wholly placed in the whole of his army at the absolute disposal of the piedmontese general but was at pains to devise a plan whereby della rocca's orders were conveyed to the red shirts through sidori as though they still came from garibaldi himself he strictly enjoined his staff to prevent the men from knowing that the orders did not in reality emanate from him. Shaking his supplanter warmly by the hand, he wished him luck and rode off to Caserta. Two days later, della Rocca, who had been deeply touched by Garibaldi's generous conduct, hearing that he was ill at Caserta, went there to pay him a visit. He found him in a little room over the guardhouse of the palace, exactly above a large store of gunpowder. I begged him, writes Del Roca, to move immediately, and smiling he promised to do so. Propped up with pillows, he was wrapped in a military cloak, a little cap on his head, and a silk handkerchief knotted around his neck. As I entered, he held out his hand, and seemed quite touched when I told him I had only come to ask how he was. He was still more pleased when I told him how well I got on with his generals Cosenz and Sertori notable personages and most excellent men, and how I regretted the enforced absence of Bixio. Mine were no idle compliments. I meant what I said, and I saw that Garibaldi was pleased that I appreciated his friends. Meanwhile, della Rocca's batteries were being scientifically erected by the engineers of the regular army, in front of the Garibaldian lines. On November 1st, at four in the afternoon, all was ready 
and a red flag run upon the summit of Monte Tifata gave the signal for the bombardment. The enemy replied, and the duel lasted on through the night. Some of the houses in the town were set on fire, and the Capuans, many of whom secretly hated the falling dynasty, protested to the general of the garrison the necessity for instant surrender. At dawn of November 2nd, the officers of the terrace of St. Angelo Church eagerly turned their telescopes towards Capua and saw the white flag hoisted on its walls. The garrison of ten thousand men became prisoners of war, and the fortress that had set a limit to Garibaldi's career at length surrendered to the Italian army. While Della Rocca was taking Capua, Fonti and Cialdini were drawing the net around Gaeta. On October 29th, a reconnaissance against the enemy's strong position on the hills behind the mouth of Cargliano was pushed too far, partly by the carelessness of the generals, partly by the unwillingness of the Bersaglieri to obey the orders to retreat. The action cost the Italian army over fifty men and showed that their opponents could still fight. But a day or two later, when the Italian fleet opened fire on their flank and rear, the Bourbon forces abandoned the position on the Gergiano and fell back towards the great fortress. On November 2nd, the day of the fall of Capua, a successful action at Mola de Gaeta on the coast was placed by the Italian army in a situation to besiege Gaeta in form. During the first ten days of November, some 17,000 Neapolitan soldiers, closely pursued by Victor Manuel's troops, escaped over the frontier into Papal territory at Terracina, and were disarmed and interned among the Alban hills by the Papal authorities and the French garrisons of Rome. The remainder of the Bourbon army that had not already disbanded or surrendered was now shut up in the citadel at Messina, in one or two small forts in Sicily and the Abruzzi, or with the ex-king and queen in Gaeta. The siege of Gaeta was protracted all the winter, because Napoleon III kept the French fleet in those waters with orders to prevent the Italian fleet from bombarding the fortress. The siege operations had therefore to be conducted entirely from the land side and were not brought to a successful issue until February 1861. The long siege enabled Maria Sophia, Francis II's young Bavarian queen, to display to Europe from the battlements of the bombarded fortress a heroine's courage which illuminated with sunset glow the last vision of the inglorious dynasty which had known no rays at noontide. Napoleon's action in stopping the war at sea while allowing it to be carried to its conclusion on land had no permanent effect save to irritate Italians and to efface from their minds all claims of gratitude for his recent compliance with regard to Umbria and the marches. It is difficult, at first sight, to assign a reason for interference at once so feeble and so exasperating. The emperor's biographer, unable as ever to understand his sympathy with Italian freedom, supposes that he wished to clear his personal honor by this tangible protest against Victor Manuel's piratical attack on the kingdom of Naples. Such may be the feelings of a French clerical in the face of the liberation of Italy, but it is difficult to suppose that they were those of Napoleon III, only two months after he had given his consent to Cavour's invasion of the Papal marches. The secret agreement which he had made at Chambury was that the North Italian army should invade and traverse the Papal territories, so as to arrive at Naples in time to stop Garibaldi and absorb the revolution. In making this arrangement, Napoleon did not imagine that Victor Emmanuel had undertaken to put down Garibaldi merely in order to restore Francis II to the throne. The emperor did not like the annexation of South Italy by Piedmont, but he had agreed to it as the least of many possible evils. Therefore his motive in sending the French fleet to Gaeta was probably not so much genuine indignation at the conduct of the King of Italy as the perception that he must appear to be angry for the sake of the French clericals whose loyalty, so essential to his throne, he had strained almost to the breaking point. On the 8th of October, Cavour had written to Farini, the minister in attendance on Victor Emmanuel. If Garibaldi's army acclaims the king, it must be treated well, if we have to contend against the requirements and pedantries of the regular army. 
do not give in reasons of state of the first importance demand firmness woe to us if we show ourselves ungrateful to those who have shed their blood for italy europe would condemn us in the country there would be a great reaction in favor of the garibaldini i have had a warm argument with fonti on this point he spoke of military requirements i replied that this was not spain and that here the army had to obey it was a great misfortune that cavour was unable to secure the fulfillment in spirit as well as in letter of his wise and benevolent intentions victor emmanuel who had hitherto been more enthusiastic for garibaldi than cavour himself fell at this critical moment under the influence of fonti and the military pendants garibaldi and his troops had welcomed the king and his army and had taken the place assigned them in the rear in a manner which no one had been able to criticize and which had elicited the gratitude and praise of della rocca the general most concerned there was therefore not the smallest provocation for the official insult to which the whole body of garibaldini were subjected on november sixth on that day they had been instructed that the king would come to review them at caserta the dictator was to present his generals and his favorite officers to their sovereign and the red shirts were to march past such a day might well have been a turning point in the life of the newborn nation old feuds instead of taking on fresh and more virulent forms would have been smoothed or healed the garibaldini assembled at caserta with feelings of loyalty and pride they were drawn up in front of the bourbon palace in their picturesque regiments good bad and indifferent sicilian and calabrian northerner and tuscan they waited till after the appointed hour and then learnt that the king had determined not to come no apology or explanation was sent or has ever since been offered further to point the moral victor manuel did not even write an order of the day thanking the men who had won for him the crown of the two sicilies still less would fonti the commander-in-chief put his name to such a document it was signed by della rocca the man who suffered most from the consequences of this ungracious conduct was the man who had vainly striven to avert the folly it was against cavour that garibaldi turned his wrath his personal devotion to victor manuel stood the shock he persuaded himself that these acts of petty meanness had been specially ordered by the minister at turin though in fact they had been suggested either directly by fonti or indirectly by the atmosphere of jealousy natural to a regular army in the presence of volunteers this jealousy common to every professional service in the world and aggravated at naples by the fact that these volunteers had really won their laurels cavour was unable to control from his cabinet in turin next spring in the first session of the first parliament of united italy garibaldi's pent-up wrath boiled over in a misdirected and malicious attack on the statesman who had been his guardian angel throughout the years of wonders garibaldi was sometimes unjust but he seldom missed an occasion to be generous and on the very afternoon of the thwarted review he had a magnificent opportunity general cialdini arrived at caserta commissioned to obtain his promise to enter naples on the following day in the same carriage with the king it was very desirable that the dictator should appear at victor emmanuel's side for if it became known that he had absented himself with a grievance it was doubtful what sort of reception the royal party would obtain there would indeed have been a fair case for him to refuse to enter naples with the king who had failed his appointment at the review but he liked cialdini well and after some demur and a good deal of strong language against fonti and cavour he finally consented to go on november seventh the first king of italy entered his southern capital with garibaldi sitting beside him in the carriage they were both out of temper and it rained in torrents but the neapolitans were again in a state of frantic enthusiasm which the rain could not damp although it ruined the triumphal arches and caused the rows of pasteboard allegorical figures to double up as if they had been shot if the king had been permitted to use common courtesy to the garibaldian army in the matter of the review and had shown more imaginative sympathy with men perhaps over insensitive 
little complaint could justly have been made of the treatment accorded to their material interests. In this matter, Victor Manuel was firm to see the right thing done, saying, I cannot show less generosity than Garibaldi. It had been Cavour's original intention to divide the Garibaldini into three sections, the first and far the largest to be disbanded at once with a gratuity for each man, the second to constitute a separate volunteer division of the army under the title of Cacciatori della Alpi, the third to consist of a small number of officers to be given commissions in the regular army. But this plan was not carried out. It was decided not to constitute a permanent force of volunteers attached to the army, partly for fear of professional quarrels and political complications that might arise out of the existence of such a force and partly because nearly all the genuine volunteers who had done the fighting were anxious to return at once to their families and to their work in life. The privates, therefore, were sent back each to his home with a gratuity. The Hungarians alone, who had no homes to which they could return, were taken into the royal service and were engaged for many years in the inglorious but dangerous task of tracking down the reactionary brigands of Molisi and Abruzzi. There remained the questions of the officers. Since Cavour's scheme of a permanent volunteer force had been abandoned, it was felt to be only just that a very large number of Garibaldi's officers should be given posts in the regular army. A military commission, on which Sir Tori, Medici, and Cosenz had seats, chose out the officers most fit to be admitted into the king's service. It was a difficult task for there were six or seven thousand so-called officers of all sorts, drawing Garibaldi's pay in Sicily, and on the mainland in the first days of November, about one officer to every seven privates. Half or more of these must have been absolutely unworthy of permanent commissions. In the course of the next two years, 1,584 of the best men were picked out and admitted as officers to the regular army. Medici, Bixio, Cosenz, and nine others were made generals. These arrangements were regarded with intense indignation by Garibaldi and his intimates at Caprera, who had expected that the volunteers would be kept in being as a permanent force, to form a nucleus for the national levee en masse in the coming war for Venice and Rome. But the settlement cannot, in a fair view of all the circumstances, be called either impolitic or unjust, although there were many individual cases of harsh treatment of men who had deserved well of their country. Although Victor Manuel was now in full possession of Naples, the half-formed kingdom of Italy was still in grave danger. On October 22nd, Cavour had felt the certainty that Austria will attack us. Every day that passed in safety added to the chances of peace and to the meager possibilities of resistance in case of war. But the emperors of Austria and Russia, and the king of Prussia, had met in conference at Warsaw, an ill-omened gathering of the murderers on the tomb of their victim, and Europe looked on to see whether they would decide to slay Italy as they had slain Poland. At this crisis the Italian position was strengthened by the pronouncement of the British foreign minister in favor of the right of the Italians to settle their own affairs. Lord John's famous dispatch was his own spontaneous act, a personal proclamation of the principles of Charles James Fox, the gospel by which Russell's life had been inspired and guided. England, who had so often supported these principles, and often opposed them, was in one of her generous moods, and applauded to the echo of her champion's defiance of a despotic Europe. The first sentence plunges in medius res. It appears that the late proceedings of the King of Sardinia have been strongly disapproved by several of the principal courts of Europe. After telling some home truths about the character of the papal and Neapolitan governments, Lord John announces that Her Majesty's government must admit that the Italians are the best judges of their own interests. It is difficult, he proceeds, to believe, after the astonishing events that we have seen, that the Pope and the King of the Two Sicilies possess the love of their people. Therefore, Her Majesty's government can see no sufficient ground for the severe censure with which Austria, France, Prussia, and Russia have visited the acts of the King of Sardinia. 
Her Majesty's government will turn their eyes rather to the gratifying prospect of a people building up the edifice of their liberties and consolidating the work of their independence. This dispatch, written on October 27th and made public in the early days of November, was greeted with ecstasies of joy by the Italian people. Cavour, who had recently been somewhat annoyed by Lord John's insistent warning that Italy must not go to war to liberate Venice, declared that he had now more than made amends. Lord John's dispatch has sometimes been depreciated as a mere blowing of trumpets over the fait accompli of knighted Italy, but such was not the view of the men who best understood Italy's needs. Hudson wrote to Russell that when Cavour first read it, he shouted, rubbed his hands, jumped up and down again, and began to think, and when he looked up, tears were standing in his eyes. Behind your dispatch he saw the Italy of his dreams, the Italy of his hopes, the Italy of his policy. Cavour himself wrote to thank Russell in the strongest language for the immense service he had rendered Italy, and his trusted agent, Villa Marina, said the dispatch was worth an army of one hundred thousand men. The feeling of Cavour's countrymen for Lord John Russell was one of the chief instruments of their liberation, was shown in many different ways during the remainder of his life. Once, in 1869, when he and his family were staying in a villa at San Remo, they found the ceiling of the principal room frescoed with portraits of four national heroes. The four turned out to be Mazzini, Garibaldi, Cavour, and to their surprise and delight, Lord John himself. Neither had the house been specially prepared for the reception. It has, of recent years, been somewhat the fashion to blame Lord John Russell for his failures, but never to praise him for his triumphs. Fashions in history come and go, more often the reflex of tendencies in the present than the result of new knowledge of the past. It is probable that very few British statesmen in the course of their lives did as much to reinvigorate and secure the institutions of our country as was done by Russell in 1830 to 1832, or won for her as much well-deserved gratitude and such enduring friendship abroad as was secured by his action in 1859 and 1860. On the Italian question, England secured peace with true honor, and has ever since, either in point of interest or of conscience, had reason to repent of her work. On the day of their entrance into Naples, and on the following day, Victor Manuel and Garibaldi held private colloquies. The outgoing director asked to be continued in power for another year as the king's lieutenant, and to have the grade of all his officers recognized. Such requests showed how utterly incapable Garibaldi was of understanding the difficulties of administrative and military reorganization that confronted the new state. On November 8th, the throne room in the palace was the scene of an imposing ceremony. The official presentation of the result of the plebiscite and the investure of Victor Manuel with the kingship of Sicily and Naples. The new monarch was seated on his throne. Garibaldi and his friends stood in one group the courtiers and army officers in another, and a small cordiality was shown between them. But the act of annexation was duly signed by all parties, and Garibaldi, formally resigning the dictatorship, left the room a private citizen once more. His first act in that capacity was to publish a letter calling on all Italians to rally round Victor Manuel, and to be prepared to follow him next spring, a million strong, against Rome or Venice. By the side of the Re Galatuomo, he wrote, every quarrel should disappear, every rancor be dissipated. Garibaldi's public utterances during this period of strained relations were as loyal as if every demand he made had been conceded by the king. Before nightfall, he sent Missouri to tell the British admiral that he would leave for Caprera early the next morning. November 9th, and would come aboard the Hannibal to pay farewell visit before he quitted the bay. He spent the night in the Hotel d'Angleterra in the Chiaja, talking with Missouri, Mario, Canzio, Zazio, and others of his intimate friends. As during all these last days, he was in a melancholy and gentle mood, moving his followers to tears when he spoke of their parting on the morrow. In spite of the brave words of the proclamation in which he thanked his soldiers and called on them to be ready against the next spring, 
all felt in their hearts the presentment that their day of glory was at an end. And so these men, who had seized occasion by the forelock, and had performed at the appointed moment the miracle never to be repeated, sat up all night in the hotel, and talked sadly of what they had done, and left undone. Next morning before dawn, they went down together to the port. The city was still asleep, and there was no one to witness the departure, which had been kept secret from everyone except the British Admiral. They took a boat, rowed over to the Hannibal, and came up the side of the great three-decker, between the darkness and the first twilight. Admiral Mundy, still in his cot, was told that Garibaldi was in the cabin, and turned out with all haste to receive the strange man whom he had learnt to admire and love, while still keeping the open eye of common sense on his single-minded fanaticism. During a long talk in the cabin, Garibaldi invited Mundy to be his guest at his cottage at Caprera, and spoke much of the beautiful harbor between the island and the main, where Nelson had once anchored for the protection of his fleet. As they passed up from the cabin to the quarter-deck, Garibaldi saw the admiral's visiting book lying on the small table upon which, six months before, at Palermo, he and the Bourbon generals had signed the armistice, the source of such mighty consequences. He sat down and wrote in the book in French, G. Garibaldi owes to Admiral Mundi the most lively gratitude, which will last all his life, on account of sincere proofs of friendship with which he has been loaded in all kinds of circumstances. As he went down the ship's side, many of the officers and crew of the Hannibal were deeply moved, and the expressions which some of them afterwards used about the look of intense love upon his face testify to the unique effect of his presence upon men trained in no sentimental school of thought or character. From the Hannibal he wrote to the Washington, the streamer that was to take him home. On her deck he parted from Cancio, Missouri, Mario, and his other friends, who returned to the quay. His last words to them were, to meet again at Rome. Only his son, Minotti, and one or two persons of less importance sailed with him to the island. He returned thither as poor a man as he had left it in the spring. In the last two days, Victor Manuel had offered him an estate for Minotti, the title of king's aide-de-camp for his younger son, a dowry for his daughter, a royal castle and a steamer for himself, but he had refused them all. His secretary, Basso, had borrowed a few hundred francs of paper money from a friend for necessary expenses. He himself had stowed on board the Washington a bag of seed corn for his farm. With these spoils, the steamer, almost unobserved, left port at break of day. He was soon back at his old daily occupation of man's primitive struggle with nature, at which, but for the call of a great epic and a great cause, he would so readily have spent his whole life. Again, the dawn and the twilight on the Straits of Bonifacio saw him at work among the granite boulders, industriously putting seed into the scrapings of earth which he called his fields, sheltering a few sad vines from the sweeping winds of the Straits, calling up his cows by name from their pasturage among the wild, odorous brushwood, and seeking the strayed goats on the precipice top. Under these conditions the melancholy of his last days on the mainland soon left him, when, a few weeks later, a visitor came on business from Genoa, he found Garibaldi robust in health, and radiant with a calm and serene joy. For when once he had been left alone again with his mother earth, between rock and sea and sky, no disappointment could prevent him from feeling in his heart the truth, that he had done a mighty labor, and taken his share in a task which the years would soon complete, and the long generations ratify, the making of Italy. End of chapter 15